Great. Um, okay, so let me introduce everybody to everybody else first of all. So uh, we're here at the University of San Francisco learning machine learning, or you might be at home watching this on video. So hey, everybody wave. Here is the University of San Francisco graduate students. Thank you everybody. And <laughs> wave back from the future and from home to all the students here. Um, if, uh, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please stop uh, and instead go to course.fast.ai and watch it from there instead. Uh, there's nothing wrong with YouTube, but um, I can't edit these videos after I've created them. Uh, so I need to be able to like give you updated information about like what environments to use, how the technology changes, and so you need to go here. Right? So you can also um, watch the lessons from here. Uh, here's lots of lessons uh, and so forth, right? So um, that's tip number one for the video. Tip number two for the video is because I can't edit them, uh, all I can do is add these things called cards. And cards are little things that are, appear in the top corner, the top right hand corner of the screen. Uh, so by the time this video comes out, I'm going to put a little card there right now for you to click on and try that out. Uh, unfortunately, they're not easy to notice, so keep an eye out for that because that's going to be important updates to the video. All right, so welcome. We're going to be learning about machine learning today. Um, and so for everybody in the class here, you all have uh, Amazon Web Services set up, so you might want to go ahead and launch your AWS instance now. Um, uh, or go ahead and create launch your Jupyter Notebook on your own computer. Uh, if you uh, don't have Jupyter Notebook set up, um, then uh, what I recommend is you go to Cressel.com, www.cressel.com, uh, sign in there, or sign up, um, and you can then turn off Enable GPU and click Start Jupyter, and you'll have a Jupyter Notebook instantly. Uh, that costs you some money. It's uh, three cents an hour. Okay, so if you don't mind spending three cents an hour to learn machine learning, here's a good way. So I'm going to go ahead and say start Jupiter. Uh, and so whatever technique you use, um, there you go. One of the things that you'll find uh, on on the website is links to lots of information about the costs and benefits and approaches to setting up lots of different environments for Jupyter Notebook, um, both for deep learning and for regular machine learning. Um, so check them out because there's lots of options. Um, so if I then go open a Jupyter, in, open Jupyter in a new tab, um, uh, here I am uh, in Cressel or uh, on AWS uh, or your own computer. Uh, we use um, the Anaconda Python distribution for basically everything. Uh, you can install that uh, yourself. Uh, and again, there's lots of information on the website about how to set that up. <coughs> um, we're also assuming that uh, either you're using Cressel or um, there's something else which I really like called paperspace.com, um, which is another place you can fire up a Jupyter Notebook pretty much instantly. Um, both of these have um, already have all of the fast AI stuff pre-installed for you. So as soon as you open up Cressel or Paperspace, assuming you chose the Paperspace fast AI um, template, you'll see that there's a fast AI folder. Okay. If you are using your own computer or AWS, um, you'll need to go to our GitHub repo, fastai, fastai, uh, and clone it. Okay. And then you'll need to do a conda env update to install the libraries. Um, and again, that's all information we've got on the website, and we've got some previous workshop videos to help you through all of those steps. So for this class, I'm assuming that you have a Jupyter Notebook running. Okay. Um, so here we are in the in the Jupyter Notebook, um, and uh, if I click on FastAI, that's what you get if you get clone or if you're on Cressel, um, you can see our repo here. Uh, all of our um, lessons are inside the courses folder, and the machine learning part one is in the ML1 folder. If you're ever looking at my screen and wondering where are you, look up here and you'll see it tells you the path, Fast AI Courses ML1. And today we're going to be looking at Lesson 1, 
random forests. So here is lesson one RF. So there's a couple of different ways you can do this, um, both uh, here uh, in person or on the video. You can either um, attempt to follow along as you watch, or you can just watch and then follow along later with the video. Um, it's up to you. Um, I would maybe have a loose recommendation to say um, to watch now and follow along with the video later, just because uh, it's quite hard to multitask, and if you're working on something, you might miss a key piece of information, which you're welcome to ask about, okay? But uh, if you follow along with the video afterwards, then you can pause, stop, experiment, um, and so forth. But anyway, uh, you can choose either way. Um, I'm going to um, go view, toggle header, view, toggle toolbar, and then full screen it, uh, so to get a bit more space. <coughs> Um, so uh, the basic approach we're going to be teaching here, taking here is to um, get straight into code, start building models, um, uh, not to look at theory. Um, we're going to get to all the theory, okay? But at at the point where you deeply understand what it's for, and at the point that you're able to be an effective practitioner. Um, uh, so my hope is that you're going to spend your time focusing on um, experimenting. So if you take these notebooks and try different variations of what I show you, uh, try it with your own data sets, um, the more coding you can do, um, the better, the more you'll learn. Okay, don't, in, you know, my suggestion, or at least all of my students have told me, the ones who have gone away and spent time studying books of theory rather than coding, found that they learnt less machine learning, and that they often tell me they wish they'd spent more time coding. Um, the stuff that we're showing in this course, a lot of it's never been shown before. This is not a summary of other people's research. This is more a summary of 25 years of work that I've been doing in machine learning. Um, so a lot of this is, is going to be shown for the first time. And so that's kind of cool, because if you want to write a blog post about something that you learn here, you might be building something that a lot of people find super useful, right? So um, uh, there's a great opportunity to practice your technical writing, and here's some examples of good technical writing, okay? By, by showing people stuff which you've, it's not like, hey, I just learnt this thing, I bet you all know it. Often it'll be, I just learnt this thing and I'm going to tell you about it and other people haven't seen it. Uh, in fact, this is the first course ever that's been um, built on top of the fast AI library, so even just stuff in the library is going to be new to like everybody. Um, okay, so when we use a Jupyter Notebook or anything else in Python, we have to um, import the, the libraries that we're going to use. Um, something that's quite convenient is if you use these uh, two auto-reload commands at the top of your notebook, you can go in and edit the source code of the modules, and your notebook will automatically update with those new modules. You won't have to like restart anything, so that's super handy. Um, then uh, to show your plots inside the notebook, you'll want matplot inline. So these three lines appear at the top of all of my notebooks. <clears throat> you'll notice when I import the libraries that for anybody here who is an experienced Python programmer, I am doing something that would be widely considered very inappropriate. I'm importing star. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, in software engineering, we're taught to like specifically figure out what we need and import those things. Um, the more experienced you are as a Python programmer, the more extremely offensive practices you're going to see me use. For example, I don't follow what's called PEP8, which is the normal style method, uh, style uh, of code used in Python. Um, so I'm going to mention a couple of the things. First is, um, go along with it for a while, don't judge me just yet, right? There's reasons that I do these things. Um, and if it really bothers you, then feel free to, to change it, right? But the basic idea is data science is not software engineering, right? There's a lot of overlap, you know, we're using the same languages, uh, and in the end these things will, may become software engineering projects. But what we're doing right now is we're prototyping models. And prototyping models has a very different set of best practices that are taught basically nowhere, right? They're not really even really written down. 
Um, but the key is to be able to do things very interactively and very iteratively, right? So for example, from library import star means you don't have to figure out ahead of time what you're going to need from that library. It's it's all there, okay? Also, because we're in this wonderful interactive Jupyter environment, it lets us um, understand uh, what's in the libraries really well. So for example, uh, later on um, I'm using a function called display, right? So an obvious question is like, well, what is display? So you can just type the name of a function and press shift enter. Remember, shift enter is is to run a cell, and it will tell you where it's from, right? So anytime you see a function you're not familiar with, you can find out where it's from. And then if you want to find out what it does, put a question mark at the start. Okay. And here you have the documentation. And then, particularly helpful for the FastAI library, so the FastAI library I try to make as many functions as possible be like no more than about five lines of code, it's designed to be really easy to read, right? If you put a second question mark at the start, it shows you the source code of the function. Right, so all the documentation plus the source code. So you can see, like nothing has to be mysterious. And we're going to be using uh, the other library we'll use a lot is Scikit-Learn, um, which is uh, kind of implements a lot of machine learning stuff in Python. Um, the Scikit-Learn um, source code is often pretty readable, and so very often, if I want to really understand something, I'll just go question mark question mark and the name of the Scikit-Learn function I'm typing, and I'll just go ahead and read the source code. Um, as I say, the FastAI library in particular is designed to have source code that's very easy to read, and we're going to be reading it a lot. Okay. Um, all right. So today we're going to be working on a Kaggle competition called Blue Book for Bulldozers. So the first thing we need is to get that data. So if you go Kaggle Bulldozers, then you can find it. So Kaggle competitions allow you to download a real-world data set that somebody, a real problem that somebody's trying to solve, and solve it according to a specification that that actual person with that actual problem decided would be actually helpful to them. Right? So these are pretty authentic experiences for applied machine learning. Now of course you're missing all the bit that went before, which was why did this company, this startup, decide that predicting the auction sale price of bulldozers was important. Where did they get the data from? How did they clean the data? And so forth. Okay, and that's all important stuff as well, um, but the focus of this course is really on what happens next, which is like how do you actually build the model. One of the great things about you working on Kaggle competitions, whether they be running now or whether they be old ones, is that you can submit your to the leaderboard, even old closed competitions, you can submit to the leaderboard and find out how would you have gone, right? And there's really no other way in the world of knowing whether you're competent at this kind of data in this kind of model than doing that, right? Because otherwise, if your accuracy is really bad, is it because this is just very hard, like it's just not possible, then the the the, the data is so noisy you can't do better, or is it actually that it's uh, an easy data set and you've made a mistake. And like, when you uh, finish this course and apply this to your own projects, this is going to be something you're going to find very hard, and there isn't a simple solution to it, which is you're now using something that hasn't been on Kaggle, it's your own data set, do you have a good enough answer or not? Okay, So we'll talk about that more during the course, um, and in the end we just have to know that we have good, effective techniques for reliably building baseline models. Um, uh, otherwise, yeah, there's really no way to know. There's no way other than creating a Kaggle competition um, or getting you know a hundred top data scientists to work at your problem to really know what's possible. So Kaggle competitions are fantastic for for learning. Um, and as I've said many times, I've learned more from from competing in Kaggle competitions than everything else I've done in my life. Um, so to compete in a Kaggle competition, um, you need the data. Right? This one's a, an old competition, so it's not running now, but we can still 
access everything. Um, so we first of all want to understand what the goal is, um, and I suggest that you read this later, but basically we're going to try and predict the sale price of heavy equipment. And one of the nice things about this competition is that if you're like me, you probably don't know very much about heavy, heavy industrial equipment auctions. Right? I actually know more than I used to because my toddler loves building equipment, so we actually like watch YouTube videos about front-end loaders and forklifts. Um, but you know, two months ago, I was uh, uh, you know a, a real layman. Um, so one of the nice things is that machine learning should help us understand a data set, not just make predictions about it. So by picking an area which we're not familiar with, it's a good test of whether we can build an understanding. Right? Um, because otherwise what can happen is that your intuition about the data can make it very difficult for you to be open-minded enough to see what does the data really say. It's easy enough to download the computer, sorry, to download the data to your computer. You just have to click on the data set, so here is train.zip, and click download. Right? Um, and so you can go ahead and do that if you're running on your own computer right now. If you're running on AWS, uh, it's a little bit harder, right? Because uh, unless you're familiar with text mode browsers like Elinx or Lynx, it's quite tricky to get the data set to Kaggle. So a couple of options. Um, one is you could download it to your computer and then SCP it to AWS. So SCP works just like SSH, but it copies data rather than logging in. I'll show you a trick though that I really like, and it relies on using Firefox. Um, for some reason, Chrome doesn't work correctly with Kaggle for this. Um, so if I go on Firefox to the website, eventually, and what we're going to do is we're going to use um, something called the JavaScript console. Uh, so uh, every web browser comes with a set of tools for web developers um, to, to help them see what's going on. And you can hit um, do it through here. Developer. Ah, control shift I. Okay, so you can hit control shift I to bring up uh, this this web developer tools. And one of the tabs is network. Okay. And so then if I click on train.zip and I click on download, okay, and I'm not even going to download, I'm just going to say cancel, but you'll see down here it's shown me all of the network connections that were just initiated. right? And so here's one which is downloading a zip file from storage.googleapis.com, blah blah blah. That's probably what I want. Right? That looks good. So what you can do is you can right click on that and say copy, copy as curl. So curl is a Unix command like wget that downloads stuff. Right? So if I go copy as curl, that's going to create a command that has all of my cookies, headers, everything in it necessary to download this authenticated data set. So if I now go into my server, right? And if I paste that, you can see a really, really long curl command. Um, one thing I notice is that at least recent versions have started adding this minus minus 2.0 thing to the command. That doesn't seem to work with all versions of curl, so something you might want to do is to oopsie daisy, copy is to pop that into an editor, find that to get rid of it, and then use that instead. Right. Now, um, one thing to be very careful about, by default, curl downloads uh, the, the file and displays it in your terminal. So if I try to display this, it's going to display gigabytes of binary data in my terminal and crash it. Okay. So to say that I want to um, output it using some different file name, I always type minus "-o", for output file name, and then the name of the file, bulldozers.html. Right. 
and make sure you give it a suitable um, uh, a suitable extension. So in this case, um, the file was train.zip. Okay, so bulldozers.zip. There it is. Okay, and so there it all is. So I could make directory bulldozers. Move my zip file into there. Oops, wrong way around. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Okay, and then you, if you don't have unzip installed, you may need to sudo apt install unzip, or if you're on a Mac, that would be uh, brew install unzip. If brew doesn't work, you haven't got homebrew installed, so make sure you install it, uh, and then unzip. Okay, and so they're the basic steps. Um, one nice thing is that if you're using Cressel, um, most of the data sets should already be pre-installed for you. Um, so what I can do here is I can say open a new tab. Um, uh, here's a cool trick. In Jupyter you can actually say new terminal and you can actually get a web-based terminal. Right? And so you'll find on Cressel there's a slash datasets folder, slash datasets slash Kaggle, uh, slash dataset slash fast AI. Um, often the things you need are going to be in one of those places. Um, okay, so assuming that we don't have it already downloaded uh, in paper, actually paper space should have most of them as well, um, then we'd need to go to fast AI. Let's go into the courses machine learning folder. And what I tend to do is I tend to put uh, all of my data for a course into a folder called data. Um, you'll find that if you try and if you're using well, we're using git right you'll find that that doesn't get added to git because it's in the git ignore right so um, So don't worry about creating the data folder. It's not going to screw anything up So I generally make a folder called data and then I tend to create folders for everything I need there so uh, in this case I'll make the bulldozers CD and remember the last Word of the last command is exclamation mark dollar. Um, I'll go ahead and grab that curl command again. Okay, and zip bulldozers. There we go. Okay, so you can now see I generally have like anything that would change that might change from person to person I kind of put in a constant. So here I just define something called path, but if you've used the same path I just did, you should just be able to go ahead and run that and let's go ahead and keep moving along. So we've now got all of our libraries imported and we've set the path to the data. Um, you can uh, uh, run shell commands from within Jupyter Notebook by using an exclamation mark. So if I want to check what's inside that path, I can go ls data slash bulldozers. Okay, and you can see that works. Or you can even use Python variables. If you use a Python variable inside a Jupyter shell command, you have to put it in curlies. Okay. So that makes me feel good that my path is pointing at the right place. If you say ls curly capitals path and you get nothing at all, then you're pointing at the wrong spot. Yes, um, let me do this query box. Yeah. And this up here. Can you explain again what the curly brackets were for? Yeah, so the curly brackets refer to the fact that I put an exclamation mark at the front, which means the rest of this um, is not a Python command, it's a bash command. And bash doesn't know about capital path because capital path is part of Python. 
So this is a special Jupyter thing which says expand this Python thing, please, before you pass it to the shell. Good question. Thank you. So the goal here is to use the training set, um, which contains data through the end of 2011, to predict the sale price of bulldozers. And so the main thing to start with then is, of course, to look at the data. Now the data is in CSV format, right? So one easy way to look at the data would be to use shell command head to look at the first few lines, head, bulldozers. And even tab completion works here. Jupyter does everything. Right? So here's the first few five lines. Okay? So there's like uh, a bunch of column headers, and then there's a bunch of data. So that's pretty hard to look at. So what we want to do is take this and read it into a nice tabular format. Okay? So um, does Terence put his glasses on? Mean I should make this bigger, or is it okay? Was it, is this uh, big enough font size, yeah, everybody? Okay. So. <clears throat> this kind of data where you've got columns representing a wide range of different types of things such as an identifier, a, value, a currency, a date, a size. Um, I refer to this as structured data. Now I say I refer to this as structured data because like uh, there have been many arguments in the machine learning community on Twitter about what is structured data. Weirdly enough, this is like the most important type of distinction is between data that looks like this, and data like images where every column is of the same type. Like that's the most important distinction in machine learning, uh, yet we don't have standard accepted terms. So I'm going to use the terms structured and unstructured. But note that other people you talk to, particularly in NLP, uh, in NLP people use structured to mean something totally different. Right? So. When I refer to structured data, I mean columns of data that can have varying different types of data in them. Um, by far the most important tool in Python for working with structured data is Pandas. Pandas is so important that it's one of the few libraries that everybody uses the same abbreviation for it, which is PD. So you'll find that one of the things I've got here is from FastAI imports import star. Right? Um, the FastAI imports uh, module has nothing but imports of a bunch of hopefully useful tools. So all of the code for FastAI is inside the FastAI directory inside the FastAI repo, and so you can have a look at um, imports, and you'll see it's just literally a list of imports, and you'll find there pandas as pd. And so everybody does this, right? So you'll see lots of people using pd.something, they're always talking about pandas. So pandas lets us read a CSV file. And so when we read the CSV file, we just tell it the path to the CSV file, um, a list of any columns that contain dates, uh, and I always add this low memory equals false that's going to actually make it read more of the file to decide what the types are. This here is something called a Python 3.6 format string. It's one of the coolest parts of Python 3.6. Um, you've probably used lots of different ways in the past in Python of interpolating variables into your strings. Uh, Python 3.6 has a very simple way that you'll probably always want to use from now on. And it's you create a normal string, you type an f at the start, uh, and then if I define a variable, then I can say hello, curly's Python function. Okay. Um, this is kind of confusing. These are not the same curlies that we saw earlier on in that ls command, right? That ls command is specific to Jupyter, and it interpolates Python code into shell code. Uh, these curlies are Python 3.6 format string curlies. They require an F at the start, so if I get rid of the F, it doesn't interpolate. Okay, so the F tells it to interpolate. And the cool thing is, inside that curlies, you can write any Python code you like, just about. 
So for example, name dot upper. Hello, Jeremy. Okay. So I use this all the time. Um, and it doesn't matter because it's a format string. It doesn't matter if the thing was. Um, I always forget my age. I think I'm 43. It doesn't matter if it's an integer, right? Normally, if you like do string concatenation with integers, Python complains. No such problem here. Okay, so uh, so this is going to read path slash train dot csv into a thing called a data frame. Um, Pandas data frames and R's data frames are kind of pretty similar. So if you've used R before, um, then you'll find that this is uh, you know reasonably comfortable. So uh, this file is 9.3 meg, and its size is sorry 112 meg, 112 meg, and it has. 400,000 rows in it. Okay, so it takes a moment to import it. Um, but when it's done, um, we can type the name of the data frame, df raw, uh, and then use various methods on it. So, for example, df raw.tail will show us the last few rows of the data frame. Um, by default, it's going to show the columns along the top and the rows down the side, but in this case there's a lot of columns, so I've just said dot .transpose to show it uh, the other way around. Um, I've created one extra function here, display all. Normally if you just type df raw, um, if it's too big to show conveniently, it truncates it and puts like little ellipses in the middle. So um, the details don't matter, but this is just changing a couple of settings to say even if it's got a thousand rows and a thousand columns, please still show the whole thing. Okay, so this is finished. I can actually show you that. So if I just type, this is really cool. In in, in Jupyter Notebook, you can type a variable of almost any kind, a video, HTML, an image, whatever, and it'll generally figure out a way of displaying it for you. Okay, so in this case, it's a pandas data frame. It figures it out a way of displaying it for me. And so you can see here that by default it's actually doesn't show me the whole thing. So, um, so here's the data set. Um, we've got uh, a few different rows. This is the last bit, the tail of it, right? Last few rows. Uh, this is the thing we want to predict: price. Okay. And then all of the other. So we call this the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the price. Um, and then we've got a whole bunch of things we could predict it with. And when I start with a data set, I tend... Um, yes, Terence, uh, can I give you this? Hello, Jeremy. Hi, Terence. Um, I've read in books that you should never look at the data because of the risk of overfit. Why do you start by looking at the data? Yeah, so I was actually going to mention, I actually kind of don't. like I. I want to find out at least enough to know that I've like managed to import it okay, but I tend not to really study it at all at this point um, because I don't want to make too many assumptions about it. Um, I would actually say most books say the opposite. Most books do a whole lot of ex EDA, exploratory data analysis first. Academic books. Yeah, academic books. Well, I mean, the academic, you, books, I've, the academic books I've read uh, say that's that's one of the biggest risks of overfitting. But the practical books say, let's do some EDA first. Yeah, so the, the truth is kind of somewhere in between. And I generally I generally try to do machine learning driven EDA, and that's what we're going to learn today. Okay. Um, so the do thing I do care about though is what's the purpose of the project? And for Kaggle projects, the purpose is very easy. We can just look and find out. There's always an evaluation section. How is it evaluated? And this is evaluated on root, mean, squared, log, error. So this means they're going to look at the difference between the log of our prediction of price and the log of the actual price, and then they're going to square it and add them up. Okay? So because they're going to be focusing on the difference of the logs, that means that we should focus on the logs as well. And this is pretty common, like for a price, generally you care not so much about did I miss by $10? But did I miss by 
right? So if it was a million dollar thing and you're a hundred thousand dollars off, or if you're, it's a ten thousand dollar thing and you're a thousand dollars off, often we would consider those equivalent scale issues. And so for this um, auction problem, um, the organizers are telling us they care about ratios more than differences, and so the log is the thing we care about. So the first thing I do is to take the log. Okay. Now NP is NumPy. I'm assuming that you have some familiarity with NumPy. If you don't, we've got a video called Deep Learning Workshop, which actually isn't just for deep learning, it's for a whole, it's basically for this as well. And one of the parts there, which we've got a time-coded link to, is a quick introduction to NumPy. Okay, but basically NumPy lets us treat arrays, matrices, vectors, high-dimensional tensors as if they're Python variables, and we can do stuff like log to them, and it'll apply it to um, everything. Uh, NumPy and pandas work together very nicely. So in this case, dfraw.saleprice is pulling a column out of a pandas data frame, which gives us a pandas series. Right? It shows us the sale prices and the indexes. Right? And a series can be passed to a NumPy function, okay, which is pretty handy. And so you can see here, this is how I can replace um, a column with a new column. Pretty easy. So okay, now that we've replaced the sale price with its log, we can go ahead and try to create a random forest. What's a random forest? Um, we'll find out in detail, but in brief, a random forest is a kind of universal machine learning technique. Uh, it's a way of predicting something that can be of any kind. It could be a category, like is it a dog or a cat, or it could be a continuous, fun uh, continuous variable like price. It can predict it with columns of pretty much any kind, pixel data, zip codes, revenues, whatever. Um, in general, it doesn't overfit. It, it can, and we'll learn to check whether it is, but it, it, it doesn't generally overfit too badly, and it's very, very easy to make to stop it from overfitting. Um, you don't need, and we'll talk more about this, you don't need a separate validation set in general. Uh, it can tell you how well it generalizes, even if you only have one data set. It has few, if any, statistical assumptions. It doesn't assume that your data is normally distributed. It doesn't assume that the relationships are linear. It doesn't assume that you've specified the interactions. Um, it requires very few pieces of feature engineering for many different types of situation. You don't have to take the log of the data. You don't have to multiply interactions together. So in other words, it's a great place to start. Right? If your first random forest does very little useful, then that's a sign that this, there might be problems with your data. Like it's designed to work pretty much first off. Can you please throw it at or towards this gentleman? Thank you. What about cursor dimensionality when using random forests? Does it affect? Yeah, great question. So there's this concept of cursive dimensionality. In fact, there's two concepts I'll touch on: cursive dimensionality and the no free lunch theorem. These are two concepts you'll often hear a lot about. Um, they're both largely meaningless and basically stupid, um, uh, and yet um, I would say maybe the majority of people in the field not only don't know that, but think the opposite. So it's well worth explaining. The curse of dimensionality is this idea that the more columns you have, it basically creates a space that's more and more empty. And there's this kind of fascinating mathematical idea, which is the more dimensions you have, the more all of the points sit on the edge of that space. Right? So if you've just got a single dimension where things are like random, then they're spread out all over. Right? Whereas if it's a square, then the probability that they're in the middle means that they can't have been on the edge of either dimension. So it's a little bit less likely that they're not on the edge. Each dimension you add, it becomes multiplicatively less likely that the point isn't on the edge of at least one dimension. Right? And so basically in high dimensions, everything sits on the edge. And what that means in theory is that the distance between points is much less meaningful. And so if we assume that somehow that matters, then it would suggest that when you've got lots and lots of columns, 
and you just use them without being very careful to remove the ones you don't care about, that somehow things won't work. Um, that turns out just not to be the case. Um, it's not the case for a number of reasons. Um, one is that the points still do have different distances away from each other. Uh, just because they're on the edge, they still do vary in how far away they are from each other. And so this point is more similar to this point than it is to that point. So even things we'll learn about k-nearest neighbors actually work really well, really, really well in high dimensions, despite what the theoreticians claimed. And what really happened here was that in the 90s, theory totally took over um, machine learning. Uh, and so particularly there was this concept of these things called support vector machines that were theoretically very well justified, extremely easy to analyze mathematically, and you could like kind of prove things about them. And we kind of lost a decade of real practical development, in my opinion, and all these theories uh, became very popular, like the curse of dimensionality. Um, nowadays, um, and a lot of theoreticians hate this, um, the, the, the world of machine learning has become very empirical, which is like which techniques actually work. And it turns out that in practice, um, building models on lots and lots of columns works really, really well. Um, so yeah, the other thing to quickly mention is uh, the no free lunch theorem. Um, there's a mathematical theorem by that name that uh, you will often hear about that claims that um, there is no type of model that works well for any kind of data set. Um, which is true, and is obviously true if you think about it, in the mathematical sense, um, any random data set, by definition it's random, right? So there isn't going to be some way of looking at every possible random data set that's in some way more useful than any other approach. In the real world, we look at data which is not random. Mathematically, we'd say it sits on some lower dimensional manifold. It was created by some kind of causal structure, right? There are some relationships in there. Um, so the truth is that we're not using random data sets. And so the truth is in the real world, there are actually techniques that work much better than other techniques for nearly all of the data sets you look at. Um, and nowadays there are um, empirical researchers who spend a lot of time studying this, which is which techniques work a lot of the time. <coughs> and um, Ensembles of decision trees, of which random forests are one, um, is perhaps the technique which most often comes up the top. And that is despite the fact that um, until the library that we're showing you today, FastAI came along, there wasn't really any standard way to pre-process them properly uh, and to properly um, set their parameters, uh, so I think it's even more strong than that. Um, so. Yeah, I think this is where the, the difference between theory and practice is, is, is huge. Um, so when I try to uh, create a ra so random forest regressor, um, what is that? Random forest regressor. Uh, okay, it's part of something called sklearn. sklearn is scikit-learn. It is by far the most popular and important package for machine learning in Python. It does nearly everything. It's not the best at nearly everything, but it's perfectly good at nearly everything. So like you might find in the next part of this course with Yannette, you're going to look at a different kind of decision tree ensemble called gradient boosting trees, um, where actually there's something called um, uh, XGBoost, which is better than gradient boosting trees in scikit-learn. Um, but it's pretty good at everything, so we're, I'm, I'm really going to focus on scikit-learn. Um, random forest, you can do two kinds of things with a random forest. If I hit tab, um, I haven't imported it. So let's go back to where we import. Uh, so you can hit tab uh, in uh, Jupyter Notebook to get tab completion for anything that's uh, in your environment. And you'll see that there's also a random forest classifier. So in general, there's uh, an important distinction between things which can predict continuous variables and that's called regression, and therefore a, a method for doing that would be a regressor, and things that predict categorical variables, uh, and that is called classification, and the things that do that are called classifiers. Right? So in our case, we're trying to predict a continuous variable price, uh, so therefore we are doing regression, and therefore we need a regressor. Um, a lot of people incorrectly use the word regression to refer to linear regression. Okay, which is just not 
at all true or appropriate. Regression means a machine learning model that's trying to predict some kind of continuous outcome. It has a continuous dependent variable. Um, so pretty much everything in, in scikit-learn has the same form. You first of all create an instance of an object for the machine learning model you want. You then call fit, passing in the um, independent variables, the things you're going to use to predict, and the dependent variable, the thing that you want to predict. So in our case, the dependent variable is, um, is the data frames sale price column. And so we, the thing we want to use to predict is everything except that. In pandas, the drop method returns a new data frame with a list of columns removed. Right? Well, a list of rows or columns removed. So axis equals one means remove columns. So this here is the data frame containing everything except for sale price. Okay. Uh, can I have the box, or can you throw it to Ernest directly? Yes, sure. Uh, so if you want to remove multiple columns, you just pass in a list of uh, strings with the column names. Let's find out. So to find out, I could hit Shift Tab, and that will bring up. Uh, the you know a quick inspection of the parameters in this case. It doesn't quite tell me what I want um, So if I hit shift tab twice uh, It gives me a bit more information uh, Yes, and that tells me it's a single label or list like list like means like anything you can index in Python There's lots of things by the way if I hit three times It will give me a whole little window at the bottom. Okay, so that was shift tab um, another way of doing that, of course, which we learned, would be question mark, question mark, df, draw, dot, drop. Okay? Uh, sorry, question mark, question mark would be the source code for it. Or a single question mark is the documentation. So I think that trick of like tab complete, shift tab parameters, question mark and double question mark for the docs and the source code. Like, if you know nothing else about using Python libraries, know that, because now you know how to find out everything else. Okay? So uh, we try to run it, and it doesn't work. Okay, so why didn't it work? So anytime you get a, um, a stack trace like this, so an error, the trick is to go to the bottom, because the bottom tells you what went wrong. Above it, it tells you all of the functions that called other function could cause other functions to get there. Could not convert string to float conventional. So there was a column name, uh, sorry, a, uh, there was a value rather inside my dataset, conventional, the word conventional, and it didn't know how to create a model using that string. Now that's true. Uh, we have to pass numbers to most machine learning. Um, models, uh, and certainly to random forests. So step one is to convert everything into numbers. Um, so our data set contains both continuous variables, so numbers where the meaning is numeric, like price, um, and it contains categorical variables, which could either be numbers where the meaning is not continuous, like a zip code, or it could be a string, like large, small, and medium. Okay, so categorical and continuous variables. Um, we want to basically get to a point where we have a data set where we can use all of these variables. So they have to all be numeric, and they have to be usable in some way. So one issue is that we've got something called sale date, which you might remember right at the top we told it that that's a date, so it's been parsed as a date. And so you can see here it's data type, D type, very important thing. Data type is date time 64-bit. So that's not a number. Right? And this is actually where we need to do our first piece of feature engineering. Right? Inside a date is a lot of interesting stuff. All right, so um, since you've got the catch box, can you tell me what are some of the interesting bits of information inside a date? Um, well, you we can see like a time series pattern, I guess. If it was that's true. I'm, I didn't express very well. What are some columns that we could pull out of this? Oh, year, month. Year, month. And then uh, the date. The date, as in, like, tell me a at least to be a number. Year, month. Quarter. You quarter. You want to pass it to your right and get some more or behind you? Just pass it to your right. Here you go. You got some more columns for us? Day of the month. 
Day of month, yeah. Keep going to the right. Day of week. Day of week, yeah. Else? Uh, a week, uh, week of year? Yeah, week of year. Yeah, okay. I'll give you a few more like that you might want to think about would be like, um, is it a holiday? Um, is it a weekend? Was it raining that day? Was there a sports event that day? Uh, like it depends a bit on what you're doing, right? So like if you're predicting soda sales in Soma, you would probably want to know was there a San Francisco Giants ball game on that day? Right? So like what's in a date is one of the most important pieces of feature engineering you can do. And no machine learning algorithm can tell you whether the Giants were playing that day and that it was important. Right? So this is where you need to do feature engineering. So I do as much things as many things automatically as I can for you. Right? So here I've got something called add date part. What is that? It's something inside fastai.structured. Okay. And what is it? Well, let's read the source code. Here it is. So you'll find most of my functions are less than half a page of code. Right? So here is something it's going to So rather than often rather than having docs, I'm going to try to add docs over time, but they're designed that you can understand them by reading the code. So we're passing in a data frame and the name of some field, okay, which in this case was sale date. And so in this case we can't go df dot field name because that would actually find a field called field name literally. So df square bracket field name is how we grab a column where that column name is stored in this variable. Okay, so we've now got the field itself, the series. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through all of these different strings, right? And this is a piece of Python which actually looks inside an object and finds a attribute with that name. So this is going to go through, and you can again, you can Google for Python get attribute. It's a cool little advanced technique. Um, but this is going to go through, and it's going to find for this field, it's going to find its year attribute. Now pandas has got this interesting idea, which is if I actually look inside, let's go field equals. This is the kind of experiment I want you to do, right? Play around, sale date. Okay, so I've now got that in a field object, and so I can go field, right? And I can go field dot tab, right? And let's see, is is year in there? Oh, it's not. Okay, why not? Well, that's because year is only going to apply to pandas series that are date time objects. So what pandas does is it splits out different methods inside attributes that are specific to what they are. So date time objects will have a DT attribute defined, and at that is where you'll find all the date time specific stuff. So what I went through was I went through all of these and picked out all of the ones that could ever be interesting for any reason, right? And this is like the opposite of the curse of dimensionality. It's like if there is any column or any variant of that column that could be ever be interesting at all, add that to your data set, add every variation of it you can think of. There's no harm in adding more columns, nearly all the time. right? So in this case, we're going to go ahead and add all of these different attributes. And so for every one, I'm going to create a new field that's going to be called um, uh, the name of your field with the word date removed, so it'll be sale, and then the name of the attribute. So we're going to get a sale year, sale month, sale week, sale day, etc., etc. Okay? And then at the very end, I'm going to remove the original field, right? Because remember, we can't use sale date directly because it's not a number. Okay? Uh, can we pass? So you're saying this only worked because it was a date type? Did you make it a date type or was it already saved as one in the original? Yeah, it's already a date type, uh, and the reason it was a date type is because when we imported it, we said parse dates equals and told pandas it's a date type. So as long as it looks date-ish, uh, and we tell it to parse it as a date, it'll turn it into a date type. Is there a way to do that so it would just look through all the columns and say, like, if it looks like a date, make it a date? Um, or do you have to know which one? 
I I think there might be, but for some reason it wasn't ideal. Like maybe it took lots of time, or it didn't always work, or for some reason um, I had to list it here. Um, I would suggest uh, checking out the docs for pandas.readcsv, and um, maybe on the forum you can tell us what you find, because I can't remember offhand. Good telephoning. So how about the time zone? Like, how can we get the time zone on this? Let's do that one on the same forum thread that Svanna creates because uh, I think it's a reasonably advanced question. But generally speaking, the uh, time zone in a properly formatted date will be included in the string, and um, it should format it. It should pull it out correctly and turn it into a universal time zone. So, generally speaking, it should handle it for you. Okay. So I um, noticed you uh, in, for indexing a column, you interchangeably use the F dot. And the EF brackets hmm. public. Is there any consideration um, between them? The square brackets one is safer, um, particularly if you're assigning to a column. If it didn't already exist, you need to use the square brackets format, otherwise, you'll get weird errors. Okay. So the square brackets format is safer. The dot version saves me like a couple of keystrokes, <laughs> so I probably use it more than I should. Um, in this particular case, um, because I wanted to Grab something that was had field name was had something inside it wasn't the name itself. I have to use square brackets. Um, so square brackets is going to be your your safe bet if in doubt. So after I run that, um, you'll notice that df raw dot columns gives me a list of all of the columns just as strings, and at the end there they all are. Right, so it's removed sale date and it's added all those. So that's not quite enough. Um, the other problem is that we've got a whole bunch of strings in there. Right, so we can just leave that there. Do you want to pass it back? Pass it back. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so here's like low, high, medium. Thank you. Right. So pandas actually has a concept of a category data type, but by default it doesn't turn anything into a category for you. So I've created something called train cats, which creates categorical variables for everything that's a string. Okay, and so what that's going to do is behind the scenes it's going to create a column that's actually a number, right? It's an integer, and it's going to store a mapping from the integers to the strings. Okay. Um, the reason it's train cats is that you use this for the training set. Uh, more advanced usage is that when we get to looking at the test and validation sets, this is a really important idea. Um, uh, in fact, Terence came to me the other day and he said, "My model's not working. Uh, why not?" And he figured it out for himself. Uh, it turned out the reason why was because the mappings he was using from string to number in the training set were different to the mappings he was using from string to number in the test set. So therefore, in the training set, high might have been three, but in the test set, it might have been two. So the two were totally different, and so the model was basically non-predictive. Okay. So I have another function called apply categories, um, where you can pass in your existing training set, and it'll use the same mappings to let your make sure your test set or validation set uses the same mappings. Okay, so when I go train cats, it's actually not going to make the data frame look different at all. Uh, behind the scenes, it's going to turn them all into numbers. We finish at twelve, eleven fifty. Um, let's see how we go. I'll try and finish on time. So. You'll see now. Remember, I mentioned there was this .dt attribute that gives you access to everything, assuming it's a date time about the date time. There's a .cat attribute that gives you access to things, assuming something's a category, right? And so usage band was a string, and so now that I've run train cats, it's turned it into a category. So I can go df raw .usage band .cat, right? And there's a whole bunch of other things we've got there. Okay. Um, so one of the things we've got there is dot categories, and you can see here is the list. 
Now, one of the things you might notice is that this list is in a bit of a weird order. High, low, medium. The truth is, it doesn't matter too much. But what's going to happen when we use the random forest is it's actually going to, this is going to be zero, this is going to be one, this is going to be two, and we're going to be creating decision trees. And so we're going to have a decision tree that can split things at a single point. So it would either be high versus low and medium, or medium versus high and low. And that would be kind of weird, right? It actually turns out not to work too badly, but it'll work a little bit better if you have these in sensible orders. Okay, so if you want to reorder a category, then you can just go cat.setCategories and pass in the order you want until it is ordered. And almost every pandas method has an in-place uh, uh, parameter, which rather than returning a new data frame, it's going to change that data frame. Okay, so I'm not going to do that, like I didn't check that carefully for categories that should be ordered, but this seems like a pretty obvious one. Can you reiterate that issue? I didn't understand what the problem was. Sure. So um, the usage band column is actually going to be This is actually what our random forest is going to see. These numbers. One, zero, two, one. Okay? And they map to the position in this array. And as we're going to learn shortly, a random forest consists of a bunch of trees that's going to make a single split, and the single split is going to be either greater than or less than one, or greater than or less than two. Right? So we could split it into high versus low and medium, which that semantically makes sense. It's like, is it big? Or we could split it into medium versus high and low, which doesn't make much sense. Right? So in practice, the decision tree could then make a second split to say like medium versus high and low, and then within the high and low into high and low. But by putting it in a sensible order, um, if it wants to split out low, it can do it in one decision rather than two. And we'll be learning more about this shortly. Um, it's, it, honestly, it's not a big deal, but I just wanted to mention it's there. and um, It's also good to know that People, when they talk about like different types of categorical variable, um, specifically you need to know there's a kind of categorical variable called ordinal, and an ordinal categorical variable is one that has some kind of order, like high, medium, and low. Right? And random forests aren't terribly sensitive to that fact, um, but it's, it's worth knowing it's there and trying it out. Still ordering, ordering wouldn't help our maximum that That's what I'm saying. It helps a little bit, right? It, it means you can get there with one decision rather than two. I noticed there is a negative one in that list of categories. Is that like an NA or? Yeah, exactly. So for free, we get um, a, a negative one, which refers to missing. Um, and one of the things we're going to do is we're going to actually add one. Can somebody pass it back to Paul? Is we're going to add one to our codes, maybe in two goes. <laughs> let people know it's coming. Um, yeah, so let people. Uh, so um, we're going to add one to all of our codes uh, to make missing zero later on. But um, so for the category, uh, for these uh, categories, you're basically mapping strings to different integers. Right? That's right. So there's one built-in function in Python is called uh, get dummies. So basically, for high, medium, low, there's like three columns. So yeah. Like we're going to get to that. So yeah. Yeah. So get dummies, which we'll get to in a moment, is going to create three separate columns. Uh, ones and zeros for high, ones and zeros for medium, ones and zeros for low, whereas this one creates a single column with an integer, zero, one, or two. Yeah, so what's the difference? Uh, like how, how should we choose? We're going to get to that one shortly. Yep. Did you have a question too, Paul, or are you just pointing out? Okay. Um, okay, so at this point, as long as we um, always make sure we use dot .cat dot .codes, the thing with the numbers in, um, we're basically done. All of our strings have been turned into numbers. Our dates have been turned into a bunch of numeric columns, and everything else is already a number. Okay? Um, the only other main thing we have to do is notice that we have lots of missing values. So here is dfraw.isNull, that's going to return true or false, depending on whether something is empty. Uh, .sum uh, is going to add up how many are empty for each series. Um, and then I'm going to sort them and divide by the size of the data set. Uh, so here we have um, some things which have like 
quite high percentages of um, nulls. So, uh, so missing values, we call them in display all. Isn't that what I called it? Or maybe I didn't run it. There we go. Okay. So um, we're going to get to that in a moment, but I will point something out, which is reading the CSV took a minute or so, the processing took another 10 seconds or so. Uh, from time to time, when I've done a little bit of work I don't want to wait for again, I will tend to save where I'm at. So here I'm going to save it. And I'm going to save it in a format called Feather Format. This is very, very new. Right? But what this is going to do is it's going to save it to disk in exactly the same basic format that it's actually in RAM. This is by far the fastest way to save something and the fastest way to read it back. Right? So most of the folks you deal with, unless they're um, on the cutting edge, won't be familiar with this format, so this would be something you can teach them about. It's becoming the standard. Right? It's actually becoming something that's going to be used not just in Pandas, but in Java, um, uh, in Spark, uh, in lots of like things for like communicating across computers, because it's incredibly fast. Um, and it's actually co-designed by the guy that made Panthers, by Wes McKinney. Um, so we can just go dfraw dot to feather and pass in uh, some name. Uh, I tend to have a, a folder called temp for all of my like as I'm going along stuff. Um, uh, and so when you go os dot make ders, you can path in any path path here you like. Um, it won't complain if it's already there, because I've got exists okay equals true. If there are some subdirectories, it'll create them for you. So this is a super handy little function. Okay, so um, it's not installed. Um, so because I'm using Cressel for the first time, it's complaining about that. So if you get a message that something's not installed, um, if you're using Anaconda, you can conda install. Um, Cressel actually doesn't use Anaconda, it uses pip. And so we wait for that to go along. Okay, and so now if I run it, uh, and so sometimes you may find you actually have to restart uh, Jupiter. So I won't do that now because we're nearly out of time, so if you restart Jupiter, you'll be able to keep moving along. So from now on, um, you don't have to rerun all the stuff above, you could just say pd.readfeather and we've got our data frame back. So the last step we're going to do is to um, actually replace the strings with their numeric codes, um, and we're going to pull out the dependent variable, sale price, into a separate variable, and we're going to also handle missing continuous values. And so how are we going to do that? So you'll see here we've got a function called procdf. What is that, procdf? Um, so it's inside fastai.structured, again. Um, and here it is. So quite a lot of um, the functions have a few additional parameters that you can provide, and we'll talk about them later, but basically we're providing the data frame to process and the name of the dependent variable, the, the, the Y field name. Okay, And so all it's going to do it's going to make a copy of the data frame, um, it's going to grab the y value, it's going to drop the, the, the dependent variable from the original, um, and then it's going to fix missing. So how do we fix missing? So what we do to fix missing is pretty simple. Um, if it's numeric, then we fix it by basically saying, um, let's first of all check that it does have some missing. Right? So if it does have some missing values, so in other words the is null.sum is non-zero, then we're going to create a new column called with the same name as the original plus underscore na, and it's going to be a boolean column with a 1 any time that was missing, and a 0 any time it wasn't. We're going to talk about this again next week, but this is, you know, I'll give you the quick version. Having done that, we're then going to replace the NAs, the missing, with the median. Okay, so anywhere that used to be missing will be replaced with the median, and we'll add a new column 
to tell us which ones were missing. We only do that for numeric. We don't need it for categories because pandas had his, handles categorical variables automatically by setting them to minus one. So what we're going to do is if it's not numeric and it's a categorical type, and we'll talk about the maximum number of categories later, but let's assume this is always true. So if it's not a numeric type, we're going to replace the column with its codes, the integers. Okay, plus one, right? So the, by default, um, pandas uses minus one for missing, so now zero will be missing, and uh, one, two, three, four will be all the other categories. Um, so we're going to talk about dummies later on in the course, but basically, optionally, you can say that, uh, if you already know about dummy values, there are columns with a small number of possible values you can turn into dummies instead. Of numericalizing them, but we're not going to do that for now. Okay, so for now all we're doing is we're using the categorical codes plus one, replacing missing values with the median, adding an additional column telling us which ones were replaced, uh, and removing the dependent variable. So that's what procdf does. It runs very quickly. Okay, so you'll see now sale price is no longer here. Okay, we've now got a whole new col a whole new variable called y that contains sale price. Um, you'll see we've got a couple of extra blah underscore nas at the end. Okay, and if I look at that, everything is a number. Okay, um, these booleans are treated as numbers. They're just considered as zero or one. They're just displayed as false and true. So you can see here, is it the end of a month? Is it the start of a month? Is it the end of a quarter? It's kind of funny, right, because we've got things like a model ID, which presumably is some like, I don't know, it could be a serial number, or it could be like the model identifier that's created by the factory or something. We've got like a data source ID. Like some of these are numbers, but they're not continuous. Um, it turns out, actually, random forests work fine with those. And we'll talk about why and how and a lot about that in detail, but for now all you need to know is no problem. Okay, so as long as this is all numbers, which it now is, we can now go ahead and create a random forest. So m.randomforestregressor. Random forests are trivially parallelizable. So what that means is that they, if you've got more than one CPU, which everybody will basically on their um, computers at home, and if you've got a T2 dot medium or bigger at AWS, you've got multiple CPUs. Trivially parallelizable means that it will split up the data across your different CPUs and basically linearly scale, right? So the more CPUs you have, pretty much it will divide the time it takes by that number. Not exactly, but roughly. So n jobs equals minus one tells the random forest regressor to create a separate job. So a separate process, basically, for each CPU you have. So that's pretty much what you want all the time. Uh, fit the model using this new data frame we created, using that Y value we pulled out, and then get the score. Okay, the score is going to be the R squared. We'll define that next week. Hopefully some of you already know about the R squared. One is very good. Zero is very bad. So as you can see, we've immediately got a very high score. Okay, so that looks great. But what we'll talk about next week a lot more is that it's not quite great because maybe we had data that had points that looked like this and we fitted a line that looks like this when actually we wanted one that looks like that. Okay? The only way to know whether we've actually done a good job is by having some other data set that we didn't use to train the model. Now we're going to learn about some ways with random forests we can kind of get away without even having that other data set, but for now what we're going to do is we're going to split into 12,000 rows, which we're going to put in a separate data set called the validation set, um, versus the training set is going to contain everything else. Right? And our data set is um, going to be sorted by date, and so that means that the most recent 12,000 rows are going to be our validation set. Again, we'll talk more about this next week, it's a really important idea, but for now um, we can just recognize that if we do that, and run it, I've created a little thing called print score, and it's going to pr pr print out the root mean squared error between the predictions and actuals for the training set, for the validation set, 
the R squared for the training set and the validation set and you'll see that actually the R squared for the training was 0.98 But for the validation was 0.89 Okay, then the RMSE and remember this is on the logs was 0.09 for the training set 0.25 for the validation set now if you actually go to Kaggle and go to the leaderboard um, In fact, let's do it right now He's got private and public I click on public leaderboard and We can go down and find out where is 0.25. So there are 475 teams And generally speaking if you're in the top half of a Kaggle competition, you're doing pretty well So 0.25 here we are 0.25 uh, what was it exactly? 0 0.25 0 0.2507 Yeah, about 110. So we're about in the top 25% So so the idea like this is pretty cool right with with like with no thinking at all using the defaults of everything We're in the top 25% of a capital competition. So like random forests are insanely Powerful and this totally standardized process is insanely good for like any data set. So um, We're going to wrap up but what I'm going to ask you to do uh, For Tuesday is like take as many Kaggle competitions as you can whether they be running now or old ones or data sets that you're interested in for, for your hobbies or work and and please try it right try this process and if it doesn't work you know, tell us on the forum. Here's the data set I'm using. Here's where I got it from. Here's like the stack trace of where I got an error. Or here's like, you know, if you use my um, print score function or something like it, like you know, show us what the training versus test set looks like. Uh, we'll try and figure it out, right? But what I'm hoping we'll find is that all of you will be pleasantly surprised that with with the you know an hour or two of information you got today, you can already get Better models than most of the very serious practicing data scientists that compete in capital competitions. Okay, great. Good luck, and I'll see you on the forums. Oh, one more thing. Friday, um, uh, the other class said a lot of them had class during my office hours. So if I made them one till three instead of two till four on Fridays, is that okay? We have seminar. seminar. Oh, damn it. Okay, I have to find a whole other time. All right, um, I will talk to somebody who actually knows what they're doing, unlike me, about finding office hours. Thank you. Absolutely. So, from here, the next two or three lessons, we're going to be really diving deep into random forests. So, so far, all we've learned is there's a thing called random forests. Um, for some particular data sets, they seem to work really, really well without too much trouble. But we don't really know yet like well, how do they actually work? Um, what do we do if they don't work properly? What are their pros and cons? What are the, what can we tune and so forth? So we're going to look at all that and then after that we're going to look at how do we interpret the results of random forests to get not just predictions But to actually deeply understand our data in a model driven way. So that's where we're going to go um, from here So let's just review where we're up to um, so we learned that there's this uh, library called FastAI, and the FastAI library um, is basically it's a highly opinionated library, which is to say um, we've spent a lot of time researching what are the best techniques to get like state-of-the-art results, and then we take those techniques and package them into pieces of code um, so that you can use the state-of-the-art results yourself. And so. Um, <coughs> Where possible, we wrap or provide things on top of existing code. And so in particular for the kind of structured data analysis we're doing, um, scikit-learn has a lot of really great code. So most of the stuff that we're showing you from FastAI is stuff to help us get stuff into scikit-learn uh, and then interpret stuff out from scikit-learn. Um, the FastAI library Um, the way it works in our environment here is that we've got um, 
our, our, um, our notebooks are inside FastAI repo slash courses and then slash ML1 and DL1. And then inside there, there's a sim link to the parent of the parent FastAI. So this is a sim link to a directory containing a bunch of modules. So if you want to use the FastAI library in your own code, uh, there's a number of things you can do. One is to put your notebooks or scripts in the same directory as ML1 or DL1, where there's already the sim link, and just import it just like I do. You could copy this directory dot dot slash dot dot slash fast AI uh, into uh, somewhere else and use it, or you could sim link it just like I have from here to wherever you want to use it. Right. So notice. It's mildly confusing. There's a GitHub repo called FastAI, and inside the GitHub repo called FastAI, which looks like this, there is a folder called FastAI. Okay, and so the FastAI folder in the FastAI repo contains the FastAI library. And it's that library when we go from fastai.imports import star, then that's looking inside the FastAI folder for a file called imports.py and importing everything from that. Okay? Uh, yes, Danielle? Nice catch. And uh, just like as a clarifying question for the sim link, it's just the ln thing you talked about last class? The L, that's just the ln thing that you talked about last class? Yeah, so a sim link is something you can create by typing ln minus s, and then the path to the source, which in this case would be dot 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 fast AI, uh, could be relative or it could be absolute, and then the name of the destination. If you just put the current directory as the destination, it'll use the same name as it comes from. Uh, like a alias on the Mac or a shortcut uh, on Windows. You can hold on to it. And when you do the import sys. Uh, can sys I just uh, hang on? Yeah, go again. Uh, import sys and then append that relative link that also creates the sim link in workbook two. I don't think I've created the sim link anywhere in the workbooks. The sim link actually lives inside the GitHub repo. Okay. Um, I created some sim links in the deep learning notebook to some data. Okay. But that was different. Yeah. Um, at the top of Tim Lee's workbook from the last class, there was import sys, then append the fast AI. Oh file. yeah, don't do that. Probably. Uh, don't do. I that. mean, you you can, but I think this is. I think this is better. Like this way, you can go from FastAI imports, and regardless of kind of how you got it there, it's it's going to work. Okay. You know. Great. Uh, okay. okay. So then um, we had all of our data for Blue Books for Bulldozers competition in data slash bulldozers, and here it is. Right. So um, we were able to read that CSV file. Um, the only thing we really had to do was to say which columns were dates, and having done that, we were able to take a look at a few of the examples of the rows of the data. Um, and so we also noted that it's very important to deeply understand the, the evaluation metric for this project. And so for Kaggle, they tell you what the evaluation metric is, and in this case it was the root mean squared log error. So that is um, the sum of the actuals minus the predictions, right? but it's the log of the actuals minus the log of the predictions squared. Right? So if we replace actuals 
with log actuals and replace predictions with log predictions, then it's just the same as root mean squared error. So that's what we did, was we replaced sale price with log of sale price, and so now uh, if, if we optimize for root mean squared error, we're actually optimizing for the uh, root mean squared error of the logs. Okay. So then we learnt that we need all of our columns to be numbers, and so the first way we did that was to take the date column and remove it, and instead replace it with a whole bunch of different columns. Such as, is that date the start of a quarter? Is it the end of a year? How many days are elapsed since January the 1st, 1970? What's the year? What's the month? What's the day of week? And so forth. Okay, so they're all numbers. Um, then we learnt that we can use train underscore cats to replace all of the strings with categories. Now when you do that, it doesn't look like you've done anything different. They still look like strings. Right? But if you actually take a deeper look, you'll see that the data type now is not string but category. And category is a pandas class where you can then go dot cat dot and find a whole bunch of different attributes, such as cat dot categories to find a list of all of the possible categories. And this says high is going to become zero, low will become one, medium will become two. So we can then get codes to actually get the numbers. So then what we need to do to actually use this data set to turn it into numbers is take every categorical column and replace it with cat.codes, and so we did that using procdf. Okay. Um, so how do I get the source code for procdf? Question, question mark. Okay. All right, so if I scroll down, I go through each column and I numericalize it. Okay, that's actually the one I want, so I'm going to now have to look up numericalize. So tab to complete it. Uh, if it's not numeric, then replace the data frames field with that columns dot cat dot codes plus one, because otherwise unknown is minus one. We want unknown to be zero. Okay. So that's uh, how we turn the strings into numbers. Right? They get replaced with uh, a unique, basically arbitrary index. It's actually based on the alphabetical order of the uh, feature names. Um, the other thing procdf did, remember, was um, continuous columns that had missing values. The missing got replaced with the median, and we added an additional column called column name underscore na which is a boolean column, told you if that particular item was missing or not. So once we did that, we were able to call random forest regressor dot fit and get the dot score, and it turns out we have an R squared of 0.98. Can anybody tell me what an R squared is? Melissa, you want to tell me? You know, how much? Okay. So uh, R squared essentially shows how much variance is explained by the model. Mm -hmm. um, this is the um, yeah. This is the relation of. Uh, um, this is SSR, which is like um, um, I'm trying to trying to remember the exact formula, but like I mean, uh, roughly, intuitively. Yeah, intuitively, it's how much the model explains uh, the uh, how much it accounts for the variance in the data. Okay, good. So let's talk about the formula. And so with formulas, the idea is not to learn the formula and remember it. 
but to learn what the formula does and understand it, right? So here's the formula. It's 1 minus something divided by something else. So what's the something else on the bottom? SS tot. Okay, so what this is saying is we've got some actual data, some yi's, right? We've got some actual data. 3, 2, 4, 1. Okay, and then we've got some average. Okay, so our top bit, this ss tot, is the sum of h of these minus that. So in other words, it's telling us how much does this data vary. But perhaps more interestingly is, remember when we talked about like last week, what's the simplest non-stupid model you could come up with? And I think the simplest non-stupid model we came up with was create a column of the mean, just co copy the mean a bunch of times and submit that to Kaggle. If you did that, then your root mean squared error would be this. So this is the root mean squared error of the most naive, non-stupid model, where the model is just predict the mean. On the top, we have SS res, which is here, which is that we're now going to add a column of predictions. Okay, and so now what we do is rather than taking the yi minus y mean, we're going to take yi minus fi. Right? And so now instead of saying what's the root mean squared error of our naive model, we're saying what's the root mean squared error of the actual model that we're interested in. And then we take the ratio. So in other words, if we actually were exactly as effective as just predicting the mean, then this would be, top and bottom would be the same, that would be 1, 1 minus 1 would be 0. If we were perfect, so fi minus yi was always 0, then that's 0 divided by something, 1 minus that is 1. Okay, so what is the possible range of values? Of R squared. Okay, I heard a lot of zero to one. Does anybody want to give me an alternative? Negative one to one. Negative one to one. Anything less than one. Huh? Anything less than one. Anything less than one. There's the right answer. Let's find out why. Can we hit the box? <laughs> Okay, so why is it any number less than one? Uh, because you can make a model basically as crap as you want, and just like get as like big errors as you want, and you're just subtracting from one in the formula. So. Exactly. So interestingly, uh, I was talking to our computer science professor Terence this morning, who was talking to a statistics professor, who told him that the possible range of values was R squared was zero to one. And I said that is totally not true. If you predict infinity for every column, sorry, for every row, then you're going to have infinity for every residual, and so you're going to have 1 minus infinity. Okay? So the possible range of values is less than 1. That's all we know. Um, and this will happen. You will get negative values sometimes in your R squared. And when that happens, it's not a mistake. It's not, a, it's not like a bug. It means your model is worse than predicting the mean. Okay? Which is, suggests it's not great. So that's R squared. Um, it's not. It's not necessarily what you're actually trying to optimize, right? But it's 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 the nice thing about it is that it's a number that you can use, kind of for every model, um, and so you can kind of start to try to get a feel of like what does point eight look like, what does point nine look like. So like something I find interesting is to like um, create some different 
uh, synthetic data sets, just two, two dimensions, with kind of different amounts of random noise, and like see what they look like on a scatter plot and see what their R squared are, just to kind of get a feel for like what is an R squared, you know, is an R squared a 0.9 close or not? What about 0.7 close or not? Um, okay, so I think R squared is a useful number to have a familiarity with, and you don't need to remember the formula if you remember the meaning, which is what's the ratio between how good your model is, where it means squared error, versus how good is the naive mean model, where it's squared error. Okay, in our case, 0.98, it's saying it's a very good model. Um, however, it might be a very good model because it looks like this, right? And this would be called overfitting. So we may well have created a model which is very good at running through the points that we gave it, but it's not going to be very good at running through points that we didn't give it. So that's why we always want to have a validation set. Creating your validation set is the most important thing that I think you need to do when you're doing a machine learning project, um, at least in terms of in the actual modeling part. Um, because what you need to do is come up with a data set where the score of your model on that data set is going to be representative of how well your model is going to do on, in the real world, like in Kaggle on the leaderboard or off Kaggle like when you actually use it in production. I very, very, very often hear people um, in industry say, I don't trust machine learning, I tried modeling once, it looked great, we put it in production, it didn't work. Now whose fault is that? Right? That means their validation set was not representative. Right? So here's a very simple thing which generally speaking Kaggle is pretty good about doing. If your data has a time piece in it, right? as happens in Blue Book for Bulldozers. In Blue Book for Bulldozers, we're talking about the sale price of a piece of industrial equipment on a particular date. So the startup doing this competition wanted to create a model that wouldn't predict last February's prices, but would predict next month's prices. So what they did was they gave us data representing a particular date range in the training set, and then the test set represented a future set of dates that wasn't represented in the training set. Right? So that's pretty good. Right? That means that if we're doing well on this model, we've built something which can actually predict the future, or at least it could predict the future then, assuming things haven't changed dramatically. So that's the test set we have, so we need to create a validation set that has the same properties. So the test set had 12,000 rows in. So let's create a validation set that has 12,000 rows, right? and then let's split the data set into the first um, n-12,000 rows uh, for the training set, and the last 12,000 rows for the validation set. And so we've now got something which hopefully looks like uh, Kaggle's test set, close enough that when we actually try and use this validation set, we're going to get some reasonably accurate scores. And the reason we want this is because on Kaggle, you can only submit so many times, and if you submit too often, you'll end up overfitting to the leaderboard anyway, and in real life, you actually want to build a model that's going to work in real life. Did you have a question? Uh, can we help the green box? Thank you. That's um, can you explain the difference between a validation set and a test set? Absolutely. So what we're going to learn today is how to set, um, one of the things we'll learn is how to set hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are like tuning parameters that are going to change how your model behaves. Now, if you just have one holdout set, so one set of data that you're not using to train with, and we use that to decide which set of hyperparameters to use, if we try a thousand different sets of hyperparameters, we may end up overfitting to that holdout set. That is to say, we'll find something which only accidentally worked. So what we actually want to do is we really want to have a second holdout set where we can say, okay, I'm finished, okay, I've done the best I can, and now just once, right at the end, I'm going to see whether it works. And so um, 
this is something which almost nobody in industry does correctly. Um, you really actually need to remove that holdout set, and that's called the test set. Remove it from the data, give it to somebody else, and tell them, do not let me look at this data until I promise you I'm finished. Like It's so hard otherwise not to look at it. And for example, in the world of psychology and sociology, you might have heard about this replication crisis. And this is basically because people in these fields have accidentally, or, or intentionally maybe, been p-hacking, which means they've been basically trying lots of different variations until they find something that works. And then it turns out when they try to replicate it, in other words, it's like somebody creates a test set, somebody says, okay, this study which shows you know, the impact of whether you eat marshmallows on your tenacity later in life, I'm going to rerun it, and like over half the time they're finding the effect turns out not to exist. So that's why we want to have a test set. Can you give that next door? Yeah. So for handling categorical data, uh, you converted those to numerics, uh, to numbers, order numbers. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, models where we convert categorical data into different columns using one hot encoding. Yes. So which approach to use in which model? Yeah, we're going to tackle that today. Yeah, it's a great question. Okay, so um, so I'm splitting my um, uh, my data into uh, validation and training sets, and so you can see now that my validation set is twelve thousand by sixty six. Um, where else my training set is 389,000 by 66. Okay, so we're going to use this set of data um, to train a model and this set of data to see how well it's working. So when we then tried that last week, um, we found out, just a moment, um, we found out that our model, which had 0.982 R squared on the training set, only had 0.887 on the validation set, which makes us think that we're overfitting quite badly. But it turned out it wasn't too badly because the root mean squared error on the logs of the prices actually would have put us in the top 25% of the competition anyway. So even though we're overfitting, it wasn't the end of the world. Could you pass the microphone to Marsha, please? Uh, in terms of uh, dividing the um, set into training and val validation, um, it seems like you simply take the first and train observations of the data set yes. and set them aside. Uh, why don't you, you like? Why don't you randomly pick up the observations? Because if I did that, I wouldn't be replicating the test set. So Kaggle has a test set that, when you actually look at the dates in the test set, they are a set of dates. That are more recent than any date in the training set. So if we used a validation set that was a random sample, that is much easier because we're predicting auctions like what's the value of this piece of industrial equipment on this day when we actually already have some observations from that day. So um, in general, anytime you're building a model that has a time element, you want your test set to be a separate time period and therefore you really need your validation set to be a separate time period as well. And in this case the data was already sorted, so that's why this works. Okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, I just one more question over there. forgot this time series. Sure. Uh, so let's say we have our test, uh, the training set where we train the data and then we have the validation set against which we are trying to find the R square. Uh, in, in case our R square turns out to be really bad, we, we would want to cheat tune our parameters and run it again. Yes. So wouldn't that be eventually overfitting on the overall training set? Um, yeah, so actually that's that's the issue. So that would eventually have the possibility of overfitting on the validation set, and then when we try it on the test set or we submit it to Kaggle, it turns out not to be very good. And this happens in Kaggle competitions all the time. Kaggle actually has a fourth data set, which is called the private leaderboard um, set. And every time you submit to Kaggle, you actually only get feedback on how well it does on something called the public leaderboard set, um, and you don't know which rows they are. And at the end of the competition, you actually get judged on a different data set entirely called the private leaderboard set. So the only way to avoid this is to actually be a good machine learning practitioner and know how to set these parameters as effectively as possible, which we're going to be doing partly today and over the next few weeks. Uh, can you get the actually? What did you throw?
Is it too early or late to ask? What's the difference between a hyperparameter and a parameter? Too early. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so um, let's start tracking things on root mean squared error. So here is root mean squared error in a line of code. And you can see here, like, this is one of these examples where I'm not writing this the way a proper software engineer would write this, right? So a proper software engineer would be a number of things differently. They would have it on a different line, uh, they would use longer variable names, um, um, uh, they would have documentation, right, blah blah blah. Right? But um, I really think, like for me, I really think that being able to look at something in one go with your eyes and like over time learn to immediately see what's going on has a lot of value. Um, and also to like consistently use like particular letters to have mean particular things or abbreviations, I think works really well in data science. Um, if you're doing a, like a take-home interview test or something, um, you should write your code according to PEP8 standards. Right? So PEP8 is the, um, the style guide for Python code, and you should know it and use it, because a lot of software engineers are super anal about this kind of thing. Um, but for your own work, you know, um, I think this is, I think this works well for me. You know, so I just wanted to make you aware, A, that you shouldn't necessarily use this as a role model for dealing with software engineers, but B, that I, I actually think this is, not, this is a reasonable approach. Okay, so there's our root mean squared error, and then from time to time we're just going to print out the score, which will give us the um, RMSC of the predictions on the training versus the actual, the predictions on the valid versus the actual RMSC, uh, the R squared for the training, and the R squared for the valid. And we'll come back to OOB in a moment. So when we ran that, uh, we found that this uh, RMSC was in the top 25%, and it's like, okay, there's a good start. Now, um, this took eight seconds of wall time, so eight actual seconds. If you put percent time, it'll tell you how long things took. Um, and luckily, I've got quite a few cores, quite a few CPUs in this computer, because it actually took um, over a minute of compute time, so it parallelized that across cores. Um, if your data set was bigger or you had less cores, um, you know, you could well find that this took a few minutes to run or even a few hours. Um, my rule of thumb is that if something takes more than 10 seconds to run, um, it's too long for me to do like interactive analysis with it, right? I want to be able to like run something, wait a moment, and then continue. So what we do is we try to make sure that things can run in a reasonable time. Um, and then when we're, when we're finished, at the end of the day, we can then say, okay, this feature engineering, these hyperparameters, whatever, these are all working well, and I'll now rerun it, you know, the, the, the big, slow, precise way. So one way to speed things up is to pass in the subset parameter to procdf, and that will randomly sample my data. Right? And so here I'm going to randomly sample 30,000 rows. Now, when I do that, um, I still need to be careful to make sure that my validation set doesn't change, and that my training set doesn't overlap with the dates, otherwise I'm cheating. So I call split vals again, to again do this split by dates. Um, and you'll also see I'm using, uh, rather than putting it into a validation set, I'm putting it into a variable called underscore. This is kind of a, a, a standard approach in Python, is to use a variable called underscore if you want to throw something away, because I don't want to change my validation set. Like No matter what different models I build, I want to be able to compare them all to each other, so I want to keep my validation set the same all the time. Okay? So all I'm doing here is I'm resampling my training set into a um, 20, the first 20,000 out of a 30,000 subset. So I now can run that, and it runs in 621 milliseconds, so I can like really zip through things now, try things out. Okay. So with that, 
let's use this subset to build a model that is so simple that we can actually take a look at it. And so we're going to build a forest is made of trees. And so before we look at the forest, we'll look at the trees. Um, in Scikit-Learn, they don't call them trees, they call them estimators. So we're going to pass in the parameter number of estimators equals one to create a forest with just one tree in. And then we're going to make a small tree. Uh, so we pass in maximum depth equals three. And a random forest, as we're going to learn, randomizes a whole bunch of things. Um, we want to turn that off. So to turn that off, you say bootstrap equals false. So if I pass in these parameters, it creates a small deterministic tree. Okay, so if I fit it and say print score, my R squared has gone down from 0.85 to 0.4. So this is not a good model. It's better than the, the mean model. This is better than zero, right? But it's not a good model. But it's a model that we can draw. Right? So let's learn about what it's built. So a tree consists of a sequence of binary decisions, of binary splits. So it first of all decided to split on coupler system greater than or less than 0.5. That's a Boolean variable, so it's actually true or false. And then within the group where coupler system was true, it decided to split into year made greater than or less than 1987. And then where coupler system was true and year made was less than or equal to 1986, it used fi product class desk is less than uh, or equal to 0.75, and so forth. Right? So right at the top, we have 20,000 samples, 20,000 rows. Right? And the reason for that is because that's what we asked for here when we split our data in the sample. We got a question. Uh, I just want to double check that for your uh, decision tree that you had there, that the coloration was whether it's true or false, not so like it, it gets darker, it's true for the next one, not the... Darker is um, a higher value. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay. So let's look at these numbers here. So in the whole data set, well, our, our sample that we're using, there are 20,000 rows. The, me, uh, the average of the log of price is 10.1. And if we built a model where we just use that average all the time, then the mean squared error would be 0.477. Okay? So this is, in other words, the denominator of an R squared. Right? This is like the most basic model is a tree with zero splits, right? which is just predict the average. So the best single binary split we can make turns out to be splitting by whether coupler system is greater than or equal to, sorry, less than or equal to or greater than 0.5. In other words, whether it's true or false. And it turns out if we do that, the mean squared error of coupler system is less than 0.5, so it's false, goes down from 0.477 to 0.11. Right? So it's really improved the error a lot. Uh, in the other group, it's only improved it a bit. It's gone from 0.47 to 0.41. And so we can see that the coupler system equals false group has a pretty small percentage. It's only got 2,200 of the 20,000, right? Whereas this other group has a much larger percentage, but it hasn't improved it as much. So let's say you wanted to create a tree with just one split. So you're just trying to find like what is the very best single binary decision you can make for your data. How might you be able to do that? How could you do it? Do you want to give it to Ford? Uh, specify the max depth of one. But I mean, you're writing, you don't have a random forest, right? Uh, how are you going to, how are you going to like write, what's an algorithm, a simple algorithm which you could use? Sure. So we want to start building a random forest from scratch. So the first step is to create a tree. The first step to create a tree is to create the first binary decision. How are you going to do it? I'm going to give it to Chris. Maybe in two steps. We'll give it to Chris. So 
Isn't this simply trying to find the best predictor based on maybe a linear regression? You could use a linear regression, but could you do something much simpler and more complete? Uh, we're trying not to use any statistical assumptions here. I can't see your name, sorry. Prince. Oh, of course you're Prince. I knew that. Uh, can we just do like, uh, take just one variable, if it is true, uh, give it like uh, the true thing, and if it is false, do, go into the So system. which variable are we going to choose? So at each binary point we have to choose a variable and something to split on. How are we going to do that? You want to pass it over there? How do I pronounce your name? Uh, Shikhar. Uh, so the variable to choose could be like uh, which divides the population into two groups uh, which are kind of heterogeneous to each other and homogeneous within themselves, like having the same quality within themselves and they are very different. Could you be more specific? Uh, like in terms of the target variable maybe, yes. like let's say we have two groups after split, so one has a different price altogether from the second group, yes. but internally they have similar prices. Okay, that's good. So, so like to simplify things a little bit, we're, we're saying find a variable that we could split into such that the two groups are as different to each other as possible. Um, and okay, how, do you, how would you pick which variable and which split point? That's the question. Yeah, what's your first cut? Which variable and which split point? We don't like, we're making a tree from scratch. We want to create our own tree. Does that make sense? We've got somebody over here. Maisley? You pass it to Jason, Maisley, maybe? Can we test all of the possible split and see which one has a uh, small RMSE? That sounds good. Okay, so let's dig into this. So when you say test all of the possible splits, what does that mean? How do we enumerate all the possible splits? Mm. Oh, I didn't think of that, but do you want? Uh, for each variable, you could put one aside um, and then put a second aside and compare the two and if it was better. Good, okay, so for each variable, for each possible value of that variable, see whether it's better. Now give it back to Maisley because I want to dig into the better. When you said see if the RMSC is better, what does that mean though? Because after a split you've got two RMSCs, you've got two, two groups. So you're just going to fit with that one variable comparing to the others, not so. So what I mean here is that before we decided to split on coupler system, yeah. we had a remove the mean squared of 0.477, and after we've got two groups, one with a mean squared error of 0.1, another with a mean squared error of 0.4. So you treat each individual model separately, so for the first split you're just going to compare between each variable themselves. And then you move on to the next node with the remaining. But but even the first node, like, so the model with zero splits has a single root mean squared error. The model with one split, so the very first thing we try, we've now got two groups okay. with two mean squared errors. You want to give it to Daniel? Do you pick the one that gets them as different as they can be? Well, we're try well, okay, that would be one idea. Get the two mean squared errors as different as possible, but why might that not work? What might be a problem with that? Sample size. Go on. Because you could just literally leave one point out. Yeah, so we could have like year made is less than 1950 and it might have a single sample with a low price and like that's not a great split, is it? You know, because the other group is actually not going to be very interesting at all. Can you improve it a bit? Can Jason improve it a bit? Could you take a weighted average? Yeah, a weighted average. So we could take 0.41 times 17,000 plus 0.1 times 2,000. That's good, right? And that would be the same as actually saying, I've got a model 
the model is a single binary decision, and I'm going to say for everybody with year made less than 986.5, I'm going to fill in 10.2. For everybody else, I'm going to fill in 9.2, and then I'm going to calculate the root mean squared error of this crappy model. And that would give exactly the same, right, as the weighted average that you're suggesting. Okay, good. So we now have a single number that represents how good a split is, which is the weighted average of the mean squared errors of the two groups it creates. Okay, And uh, thanks to, I think it was, was it Jake, we have a way to find the best split, which is to try every variable and to try every possible value of that variable and see which variable and which value gives us a split with the best score. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, what's your name, sorry? Okay. Can somebody give Natalie the box? And I will give Natalie. Um, when you say every possible number for every possible variable, like, mm. are you saying like here we have 0.5 as like our criteria to split the tree? So are you <laughs> are you saying we're trying out every single number for? Every possible value, right? So a coupler system only has two values, true and false, so there's only one way of splitting, which is trues and falses. Year made is an integer which varies between like, I don't know, 1960 and 2010, so we can just say what are all the possible unique values of year made and, and try them all. So we're trying all the possible split points. Can you pass that back to Daniel, or pass it to me and I'll pass it to Daniel. I remember. So I just want to clarify again uh, for the first split, why did we split on coupler system true or false to start because with? Because what we did was we used Jake's technique. We tried every variable. For every variable we tried every possible split. For each one, we noted down, I think it was Jason's idea, which was the weighted average mean squared error of the two groups it created. We found which one had the best mean squared error, and we picked it. And it turned out it was coupler system, true or false. Does that make sense? Um, I guess my question is more like, so coupler system is like one of the like best indicators, I guess? It's the best. Okay. We tried every variable and, and every so possible each level. Level after that, it gets less and less. Everything else it tried wasn't as good. Okay, and then you do that each time you split. Right. So okay. now that we've done that, we now take this group here, everybody who's got coupler system equals true, and we do it again for every possible variable, for every possible level, for people where coupler system equals true. What's the best possible split? And then. Are there circumstances when it's not just like binary, like you split it into like three groups, for like example, year made? So I'm going to make a claim, okay. and then I'm going to see if you can justify it. I'm going to claim that it's never necessary to do more than one split at a level. Because you can just split it again. Because you can just split it again, exactly. So you can get exactly the same result by splitting twice. Okay, good. So. That is the entirety of creating a decision tree. You stop either when you hit some limit that was requested, so we had a limit where we said max depth equals 3. So that's one, one way to stop would be you ask to stop at some point, and so we stop. Otherwise you stop when your, um, your leaf nodes, these things at the end are called leaf nodes, when your leaf nodes only have one thing in them. Okay? That's a decision tree. That is how we grow a decision tree. And this decision tree is not very good because it's got a validation R squared of 0.4. So we could try to make it better by removing max depth equals 3, right, and creating a deeper tree. So it's going to go all the way down, it's going to keep splitting these things further until every leaf node only has one thing in it. And if we do that, the training R squared is, of course, 1. Because we can exactly predict every training element because it's in a leaf node all on its own. But 
the validation R squared is not one. It's actually better than our really really shallow tree, um, but it's not as good as we'd like. Okay, so we want to find some other way of making these trees better, and the way we're going to do it is to create a forest. So what's a forest? To create a forest, we're going to use a statistical technique called bagging. And you can bag any kind of model. In fact, Michael Jordan, who was one of the speakers at the recent Data Institute conference here at University of San Francisco, developed a technique called the bag of little bootstraps, in which he shows how to use bagging for absolutely any kind of model to make it more robust and also to give you confidence intervals. The random forest is simply a way of bagging trees. So what is bagging? Bagging is a really interesting idea, which is what if we created five different models, each of which was only somewhat predictive, but the models weren't at all correlated with each other. They gave predictions that weren't correlated with each other. That would mean that the five models would have to have found different insights into the relationships in the data. And so if you took the average of those five models, right, then you're effectively bringing in the insights from each of them. And so this idea of averaging models is a, is, is a technique for ensembling, right, which is really important. Now let's come up with a more specific idea of how to do this ensembling. What if we created a whole lot of these trees? Big, deep, massively overfit trees. Right? But each one, let's say we only pick a random one-tenth of the data. So we pick one out of every ten rows at random, build a deep tree, right, which is perfect on that subset, and kind of crappy on the rest. Right? Let's say we do that a hundred times, so different random sample every time. So all of the trees are going to be better than nothing, right? because they do actually have a real random subset of the data, and so they found some insight, but they're also overfitting terribly. But they're all using different random samples, so they all overfit in different ways on different things. So in other words, they all have errors, but the errors are random. What is the average of a bunch of random errors? Zero. So in other words, if we take the average of these trees, each of which have been trained on a different random subset, the errors will average out to zero, and what's left is the true relationship. And that's the random forest. Right? So there's the technique. Right? We've got a whole bunch of rows of data, we grab a few at random, Right? Put them into a smaller data set and build a tree based on that. Right? And then we put that tree aside and do it again with a different random subset. And do it again with a different random subset. Do that a whole bunch of times, and then for each one, we can then make predictions by running our test data through the tree to get to the leaf node, take the average in that leaf node for all the trees. And average them all together. So to do that, we simply call random forest regressor, and by default, it creates ten what Scikit-Learn calls estimators. An estimator is a tree, right? So this is going to create ten trees. And so we go ahead and train it. I can't remember if I remember to do the split. Okay, so create our 10 trees, and we're just doing this on our little random subset of 20,000. Um, and so let's take a look at one example. Uh, can you pass the box to Devin? So just to make sure I'm understanding this, so you're saying like we take 10 kind of crappy models, we average 10 crappy models, and we get a good model. Exactly. Because the crappy models are based on different random subsets, and so their errors are not correlated with each other. If the er errors were correlated with each other, this isn't going to work. 
Okay, so the key insight here is to construct multiple models which are better than nothing and where the errors are as much as possible not correlated with each other. Is it, so uh, is there like a certain number of trees that like we need that in order to be valid? Like, There's no such thing as like valid or invalid. There's like has a good validation set RMSE or, or not, you know? Um, and so that's what we're going to look at is how to is how to make that metric higher. And so this is the first of our hyperparameters, and we're going to learn about how to tune hyperparameters. And the first one is going to be the number of trees, and we're about to look at that now. Yes, Maisley. Um, the subset that you are selecting are they exclusive? Can can you have overlapping over them? Yeah. So I mentioned um, you know one approach would be pick out like a, a tenth at random. Um, but actually, what Scikit-Learn does by default is for n rows, it picks out n rows with replacement. Okay, and that's called bootstrapping. And if memory serves me correctly, that gets you on average 63.2 percent of of the rows will be represented, and you know a bunch of them will be represented multiple times. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So rather than just picking out like a tenth of the rows at random. Instead, we're going to pick out of an n row data set. We're going to pick out n rows with replacement, which on average gets about 63. I think 63.2 percent of the rows will be represented. Many of those rows will appear multiple times. I think there's a question behind you. In essence, what this model is doing is, if I understand correctly, it's just picking out the uh, data points that look most similar to the one you're looking at. Yeah, that's a great insight. So what a tree is kind of doing... Isn't that quite a complicated way of going about doing that, if you see what I mean? There would be other ways of like assessing similarity of features. There are other ways of saying, assessing similarity, but what's interesting about this way is it's doing it in, in tree space. Right? So we're basically saying what are, in this case, like for this little tree, what are the 593 samples you know, closest to this one and what's their average closest in tree space? So other ways of doing that would be like, and we'll learn later on in this course about k nearest neighbors, you could use like Euclidean distance, say. Right? <clears throat> but here's the thing, um, the whole point of machine learning is to identify which variables actually matter the most. And how do they relate to each other and to your dependent variable together, right? So if you've like imagine a synthetic data set where you create five variables that add together to create your independent to create your dependent variable and 95 variables which are entirely random and don't impact your dependent variable. And then if you do like a k nearest neighbors in Euclidean space, you're going to get meaningless nearest neighbors because most of your columns are actually meaningless. Or imagine your actual relationship is that your dependent variable equals x1 times x2. Then you actually need to find this interaction, right? So you don't actually care about how close it is to x1 and how close to x2, but how close to the product. So the entire purpose of modeling in machine learning is to find a model which tells you which variables are important and how do they interact together to drive your dependent variable. And so you'll find in practice the difference between using like tree space or random forest space to find your nearest neighbors versus like Euclidean space is the difference between a model that makes good predictions and a model that makes meaningless predictions. Melissa, do you have? Why be cute for a break? Um, I did, but I feel like we've got only thirty-five minutes, so yeah. Um, great. So. So in general, a machine learning model which is effective is one which is um, accurate when you look at the training data, it's, it's, it's accurate at predicting, at, at actually finding the relationships in that training data, and then it generalizes well to new data. And so in bagging, that means that each of your individual estimators each of your individual trees, um, you want to be as predictive as possible, but for the predictions of your individual trees to be as uncorrelated as possible. And so the inventor of random forests talks about this at length in his original paper that introduced this in the late 90s. This idea of trying to come up with um, 
predictive but poorly correlated trees. The, the research community in recent years has generally found that the more important thing seems to be creating uncorrelated trees rather than more accurate trees. So more recent advances tend to create trees which are less predictive on their own, but also less correlated with each other. So for example, in scikit-learn, there's another uh, class you can use called extra trees regressor or extra trees classifier with exactly the same API. You can try it tonight. Just replace my random forest regressor with that. Uh, that's called an extremely randomized trees model. And what that does is exactly the same as what we just discussed, but rather than trying every split of every variable, it randomly tries a few splits of a few variables. Right? So it's much faster to train. It has more randomness, okay? but then you, with that time you can build more trees and therefore get better generalization. Um, so in practice, if you've got crappy individual models, you just need more trees to get a good end-up model. Melissa, could you pass that over to Devin? <laughs> uh, could you talk a little bit more about what you mean by like uncorrelated trees? Yeah. Um, if I build a thousand trees, each one on just ten data points, then it's quite likely that the ten data points for every tree are going to be totally different, and so it's quite likely that those ten trees are going to a thousand trees are going to give totally different answers to each other. So the correlation between the predictions of tree one and tree two is going to be very small, between tree one and tree three very small, and so forth. On the other hand, if I create a thousand trees where each time I use the entire data set with just one element removed, all those trees are going to be nearly identical, i.e. their predictions will be highly correlated. And so in the latter case, it's probably not going to generalize very well, whereas in the former case, the individual trees are not going to be very predictive. So I need to find some nice in-between. So uh, yes, Danielle. And is there a case where you want to use one over the other, like any particular times? Yeah. So again, hyperparameter tuning. So okay. do you mean in terms of like random random forests versus extremely randomized trees? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, a hyperparameter. Uh, what tree architecture do we use? So we're going to talk about that now. Uh, can you pass that to Dina? Yeah, I was just trying to understand how this random forest actually makes sense for continuous variables. I mean, I'm assuming that you build a tree structure and the last final nodes you'd be saying like maybe this small node represents maybe a category A or a category B, but how does it make sense for a continuous target? So this is actually what we have here, and so the value here is the average. So this is the average log of price for this subgroup, and that's all we do. The prediction is the average of the value of the dependent variable in that leaf node. Okay, so that means uh, finally, if we have just like ten leaf nodes, we just have ten values. Yes. By predicting. That's well, if it was only one tree, all right. Yeah. So a couple of things to remember. The first is that by default, we're actually going to train the tree all the way down until the leaf nodes are of size one, okay. which means for a data set with n rows, we're going to have n leaf nodes, and then we're going to have multiple trees. Which we average together, right? So in practice, um, we're going to have a, a, you know, lots of different possible values. Is a question behind you. Uh, so for the continuous variable, how do we decide like which value to split out? Because there can be many values. In we try every possible uh, value that of that in the training set. Won't it be computationally computationally expensive? And this is where it's very good to remember that your CPU's performance is measured in gigahertz, which is billions of clock cycles per second, and it has multiple cores. And each core has something called SIMD, single instruction multiple data, where it can do up to eight computations per core at once. And then, if you do it on the GPU, the performance is measured in teraflops. So trillions of floating point operations per second. And so this is where, when it comes to designing algorithms, it's very difficult for us mere humans to realize how stupid algorithms should be, given how fast today's computers are. So yeah, it 
it's quite a few operations, but at trillions per second, you hardly notice it. Masha. Uh, I have a question. So uh, essentially, at each mode, uh, we make a decision, uh, like which category to uh, which uh, variable to use, and which split point. Yes. Uh, yeah, but one thing I can't understand. So we have uh, MSE calculated at, for each node, right? Yes. So this is kind of our one of the decision criteria. But this MSE, it, it is calculated for which model? Like which model underlies? Like, the model what do is we build? the model is um, for the uh, initial root load is what if we just predicted the average, right? Which is here is ten point oh nine eight. Just and just the average. And then the next model is what if we predicted the average of those people with cut plus system equals false and for those people with cut plus system equals true. Just okay. And then the next is what if we predicted the average of cut plus systems equals true year made less than 1986. Is it always average or we can use median or we can even run linear regression? There's all kinds of things we could do. In practice the average works really well. Um, there are there are types of they're not called random forests, but there are kinds of trees where the leaf nodes are independent linear regressions. Um, they're not terribly widely used, uh, but there are certainly researchers who uh, have worked on them. Okay, thank you. And pass it back over there to Ford, and then to Jake. Um, so this tree has a depth of three. Yeah. And then I, on one of the next commands, we get rid of the max depth. Is yeah. the tree without the max depth, does that contain the tree with, with the depth of three? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is, is that like by definition? It's, yeah, it's well, except in this case, we've added randomness. But if you turn bootstrapping off, then yeah, the, the, the deeper tree will, you know, the, 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 the less deep tree would be how it would start and then it just keeps spinning. Okay. Uh, so you have many trees. You're going to have uh, different leaf nodes across trees. Hopefully, mm -hmm. that's what we want. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you average leaf nodes across different trees? So we just take um, the first row in the validation set. We run it through the first tree. We find its average, 9.28. Then do it through the next tree, find its average in the second tree, 9.95, and so forth. And we're about to do that, so you'll see it. Okay, so let's try it, right? So after you've built a random forest, each tree is stored in this attribute called estimators underscore. Okay, so one of the things that you guys need to be very, very comfortable with is using um, list comprehensions. Okay, so I hope you've all been practicing. Okay, so here I'm using a list comprehension to go through each tree in my model. I'm going to call predict on it with my validation set. And so that's going to give me a list of arrays of predictions. So each array will be all of the predictions for that tree. And I have 10 trees. np.stack concatenates them together on a new axis. So after I run this and call dot shape, you can see I now have the first axis 10, means I have my 10 different sets of predictions, and for each one my validation set is a size of 12,000, so here are my 12,000 predictions for each of the 10 trees. Right? So let's take the first row of that and print it out, and so here are what we were just saying. Here are 10 predictions, one from each tree. Okay? And so then if we say take the mean of that, here is the mean of those 10 predictions. And then what was the actual? The actual was 9.1, our prediction was 9.07. So you see how like none of our individual trees had very good predictions, but the mean of them was actually pretty good. Right? And so when I talk about experimenting, like Jupyter Notebook is great for experimenting, this is the kind of stuff I mean. Dig inside these objects and like look at them, plot them, take your own averages, cross-check to make sure that they work the way you thought they did. Write your own implementation of R squared, make sure it's the same as a scikit-learn version, plot it. Like here's an interesting plot I did. Um, let's go through each of the 10 trees, right? And then take the mean of all of the predictions up to 
the ith tree. Right? So let's start by predicting just based on the first tree, then the first two trees, then the first three trees, and let's then plot the R squared. So here's the R squared of just the first tree. Here's the R squared of the first two trees, three trees, four trees, blah 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 blah, up to ten trees. And so, not surprisingly, R squared keeps improving, right? Because the more estimators we have, the more bagging that we're doing, the more it's well, it's going to generalize, right? And you should find that that number there, a bit under 0.86, should match this number here. Okay. Um, let's rerun that. Yeah, okay, so that's actually slightly above 0.86. Right? So again, these are all like the cross-checks you can do, the things you can visualize to deepen your understanding. Okay, so as we add more trees, our R-squared improves. It seems to flatten out after a while. So we might guess that if we increase the number of estimators to 20, right, it's maybe not going to be that much better. Um, so let's see, we've got 0.862 versus 0.860. Yeah, so doubling the number of trees didn't help very much. If I double it again, 867, double it again, 869. So you can see like there's some point at which you're going to, you know, not want to add more trees, not because it's it's never going to get worse, right? Because every tree is, you know, giving you more semi-random models to bag together, right? But it's going to stop Improving things much. Okay, and so this is like the first hyperparameter for you to learn to set is number of estimators, and the method for setting it is as many as you have time to fit um, and that actually seem to be helping. Okay, now in practice, we're going to learn to set a few more hyperparameters. Adding more trees slows it down, um, but with less trees, you can still get the same insights. So I build most of my models in practice with like 20 to 30 trees, and it's only like then at the end of the project or maybe at the end of the day's work, I'll then try doing like, I don't know, a thousand trees and run it overnight. Was there a question? Yes. Uh, can we pass that to Prince? Uh, so each tree might have different estimators, different combination of estimators. What each tree is an estimator, so this is a synonym. So in scikit-learn, when they say estimator, they features, mean tree. Uh, so I mean features. Features. Each tree might yeah. have different. Each tree will have different breakpoints on different on different uh, columns. But yeah. if at the end we want to look at the important features, we'll get to that. Yeah. So um, after we finish with kind of setting hyperparameters. The next stage of the course will be um, uh, learning about what it tells us about the data. If you need to know it now, you know, for your projects, feel free to look ahead. Um, uh, there's a, a, a lesson two RF interpretation um, is where you can see it. Okay, so that's our first hyperparameter. Um, I want to talk next about out of bag score. Um, sometimes your data set will be kind of small. And you won't want to pull out a validation set um, because doing so means you now don't have enough data to build a good model. What do you do? There's a cool trick which is pretty much unique to random forests, and it's this. Um, what we could do is recognize that some of our in our first tree, some of our columns, sorry, some of our rows didn't get used. So what we could do would be to pass those rows through the first tree and treat it as a validation set. And then for the second tree, we could pass through the rows that weren't used for the second tree through it to create a validation set for that. And so effectively, we would have a different validation set for each tree. And so now, to calculate our prediction, we would average all of the trees where that row was not used for training. Right? So for um, tree number one, we would have the ones I've marked in blue here, and then maybe for tree number two, it turned out it was like this one, this one, this one, and this one, and so forth. Right? So as long as you've got enough trees, every row is going to appear in the out-of-bag sample for one of them, at least. So you'll be averaging you know, hopefully a few trees. 
Um, you know, so if you've got a hundred trees, um, it's very likely that all of the rows are going to appear many times in these out-of-bag samples. So what you can do is you can create an out-of-bag prediction by averaging all of the trees you didn't use to train each individual row, and then you can calculate your root mean squared error, r squared, etc. on that. Um, if you pass OOB score equals true to scikit-learn, it will do that for you, um, and it will create an attribute called OOB score underscore. And so my little print score function here, if that attribute exists, it it adds it to the, the print. So if you take a look here, OOB score equals true, we've now got one extra number, and it's R squared, that is the R squared for the OOB sample, it's R squared is very similar to the R squared in the validation set, which is what we hoped for. Uh, can we pass it? Is it the case that the the prediction for the OOB score has to be must be mathematically lower than the one for our entire forest? Um, certainly, it's not true that the prediction is lower. It's possible that Sorry, the, the accuracy the, the is squared, lower. The R squared, the R yeah, squared, I mean. um, it's not mathematically necessary that it's true, but it's going to be true on average because your average for each row appears in less trees. In the OOB samples than it does in the full set of trees. So as you see here, it's a little less good. Um, so in, in general, it's a great insight, Chris. In general, the OOB R squared will slightly uh, underestimate how generalizable the model is. The more trees you add, um, the less serious that underestimation is. And for me, in practice, I I find it's totally good enough. You know, in, in practice. Okay. So um, this OOB score is, is, is super handy, and one of the things it's super handy for is um, you're going to see there's quite a few hyperparameters that we're going to set, and we would like to find some automated way to set them. Um, and one way to do that is to do what's called a grid search. A grid search is where it's, there's a, a scikit-learn um, function called grid search, and you pass in the list of all of the parameters, all of the hyperparameters that you want to tune. You pass in for each one a list of all of the values of that hyperparameter you want to try, and it runs your model on every possible combination of all of those hyperparameters and tells you which one is the best. And um, OOB score is a great like choice. For, t for getting it to tell you which one is best in terms of OOB score. Like that's an example of something you can do with OOB which works well. Now, um, if you think about it, um, I kind of did something pretty dumb earlier, which is I took a subset of 30,000 rows of the data and it built all my models of that, um, which means every tree in my random forest is a different subset of that subset of 30,000. Why do that? Why not pick a different, like a totally different subset of 30,000 each time? So in other words, let's leave the entire 300,000 records as is, right? And if I want to make things faster, right, pick a different subset of 30,000 each time. So rather than bootstrapping the entire set of rows, let's just randomly sample a subset of the data. And so we can do that. Um, so let's go back and recall PROCTF without the subset parameter to get all of our data again. And so to remind you, um, that is okay, 400,000 uh, in the whole data frame, of which we have 389,000 in our training set. And instead, uh, we're going to go set RF samples 20,000. Remember that was the, the site the, of the 30,000 we used 20,000 of them in our training set. If I do this, then now when I run a random forest, it's not going to bootstrap an entire set of 391,000 rows, it's going to just grab a subset of 20,000 rows. Right? And so now if I run this, it will still run just as quickly as if I had like originally done a random sample of 20,000, but now every tree 
can have access to the whole data set, right? So if I do enough estimators, enough trees, eventually it's going to see everything. Right? So in this case, with 10 trees, which is the default, I get an R squared of 0.86, which is actually about the same as my R squared with the, with the 20,000 subset. And that's because I haven't used many estimators yet. Right? But if I increase the number of estimators, it's going to make more of a difference. Right? So if I increase the number of estimators to 40, right, it's going to take a little bit longer to run, but it's going to be able to see a larger subset of the data set. And so as you can see, the R squared has gone up from 0.86 to 0.876. Okay, so this is actually a, a great approach, and for those of you who are doing the groceries competition, that's got something like 120 million rows. Right? There's no way you would want to create a random forest using 128 million rows in every tree. Like it's going to take forever. Um, so what you could do is use this set RF samples to do like I don't know 100,000 or a million, or play around with it. So the trick here is that with a random forest using this technique. No data set is too big. I don't care if it's got a hundred billion rows, right? You can create a bunch of trees, each one of the different random subset. Uh, can somebody pass the? Um, actually, I can pass it. Oh, sorry. No. Uh, we've got some actual pieces of pad, so if you've got a yeah. sloppy. Thing, use one of these pieces of uh, so my question was for the OOB scores and these ones, does it take the only like for the the ones from the sample, or does yeah. it take from all the? That's a great question. Um, so unfortunately, Scikit-Learn does not support this functionality out of the box. So I had to write this, um, and it's kind of a horrible hack, right? Because we'd much rather be passing in like a sample size parameter rather than doing this kind of setting up here. So what I actually do is um, if you look at the source code is I'm actually this is a, an internal this is the internal function I looked at their source code that they call and I've replaced it with a with a lambda function that has the behavior we want. Um, unfortunately uh, it, the current version is not changing how OOB is calculated. Um, so yeah so currently, uh, OOB scores and set RF samples are not compatible with each other, so you need to turn OOB equals false if you use this approach, um, which I hope to fix. Um, but at this stage, it's it's not fixed. Um, so if you want to turn it off, you just call reset RF samples. Okay, and that returns it back to what it was. Um, okay. So, in practice, um, when I'm like doing interactive machine learning using random forests in order to like explore my model, explore hyperparameters, um, the stuff we're going to learn in the future lesson where we actually uh, analyze like feature importance and partial dependence and so forth, I generally use um, subsets uh, and reasonably small forests. Um, because all the insights that I'm going to get are exactly the same as the big ones, but I can run it in like you know three or four seconds rather than hours. Right? So this is one of the biggest tips I can give you, and very very few people in industry or academia actually do this. Most people run all of their models on all of the data all of the time using their best possible parameters. Which is just pointless, right? If you're trying to find out like which features are important and how are they related to each other and so forth, having that fourth decimal place of accuracy isn't going to change any of your insights at all. Okay, so I would say like do most of your models on, you know, a large enough sample size that your accuracy is, you know, reasonable. When I say reasonable, it's like within a reasonable distance of the best accuracy you can get. Um, and it's taking you know a small number of seconds to train so that you can interactively do your analysis. So there's a couple more parameters I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to call reset RF samples to get back to our full data set because in this case, um, at least on this computer, it's actually running in less than 10 seconds. Um, so here's our baseline. Um, we're going to do a baseline with 40 estimators. 
Okay, and so each of those 40 estimators is going to train all the way down until the leaf nodes uh, just have one um, sample in them. Um, so that's going to take uh, a few seconds to run. Here we go. Uh, so that gets us a 0.898 R squared uh, on the validation set, or 0.908 uh, on the OOB. Now in this case, the OOB is better. Why is it better? Well, that's because remember our validation set is not a random sample. Our validation set is a different time period. Okay, so it's actually much harder to predict a different time period than this one, which is just predicting random. Okay, so that's why this is not the way around we expected. So the next, the first parameter we can try fiddling with is min samples leaf, and so min samples leaf says stop training the tree further when your leaf node has um, three or less samples in. So rather than going all the way down until there's one, we're going to go down until there's three. So in practice this means there's going to be like one or two less levels of decision being made, um, so which means we've got like half the number of actual decision criteria we have to do, so it's going to train more quickly. It means that when we look at an individual tree, rather than just taking one point, we're taking the average of at least three points. That's so we'd expect the trees to generalize each one to generalize a little bit better. Okay, but each tree is probably going to be slightly less powerful on its own. So let's try training that. So possible values of min samples leaf. I find ones which work well are kind of one, three, five, ten, twenty-five. You know, like I find that kind of range seems to work well, but like sometimes if you've got a really big data set and you're not using the small samples, you know, you might need a min samples leaf of hundreds or thousands. So it's you kind of got to think about like how big are your subsamples going through and try things out. Now in this case, going from the default of one to three has increased our um, validation set R squared from 898 to 902. So it's a slight improvement, okay? and it's going to train a little faster as well. Okay, something else you can try, which is, and so since this worked, I'm going to leave that in. I'm going to add in max features equals 0.5. What does max features do? Well, the idea is that the less correlated your trees are with each other, the better. Now imagine you had one column that was so much better than all of the other columns of being predictive that every single tree you built, regardless of like which subset of rows, always started with that column. So the trees are all going to be pretty similar, right? But you can imagine there might be some interaction of variables where that interaction is more important than that individual column. So if every tree always splits on the first thing, the same thing the first time, you're not going to get much variation in those trees. So what we do is, in addition to just taking a subset of rows, we then, at every single split point, take a different subset of columns. So it's slightly different to the row sampling. For the row sampling, each new tree is based on a random set of rows. For column sampling, every individual binary split we choose from a different subset of columns. So in other words, rather than looking at every possible level of every possible column, we look at every possible level of a random subset of columns. Okay? And each time, each decision point, each binary split, we use a different random subset. How many? Well, you get to pick. 0.5 means randomly choose half of them. The default is to use all of them. Um, there's also a couple of special values you can use here. As you can see in max features, you can also pass in square root to get square root of features, or log 2 to get log 2 of features. So in practice, good values I found are uh, range from 1, 0.5, log 2, or square root. That's going to give you a nice bit of variation. Right. Uh, can somebody pass it to Danielle? And so just to clarify, does that 
just like break it up smaller each time it goes through the tree or is it just taking half of what's left over or like hasn't been touched each time? There's no such thing as what's left over. Okay. Like after you've split on year made less than or greater than 1984, mm -hmm. year made's still there, right? So later on you might then split on year made less than or greater than 1989. So, so it's just each time, rather than checking every variable to see where its best split is, you just check half of them. And so the next time you check a different half, the next time you check a different half. But I mean like in terms is as you get like further to like the leaves, um, you're going to have less options, right? No, no. you're not. Okay. You never remove the variables. Okay. You can use them again and again and again because you've got lots of different split points. So imagine for example that the relationship was just entirely linear between year made and price. Right? Then in practice, to actually model that, you know, your real relationship is year made versus price. Right? But the best we could do would be to kind of first of all split here, right? and then to split here and here, right? and like split and split and split. But so if they were binary, I'm saying. Like for yeah, example, even if they're binary, like most random forest libraries don't do anything special about okay. that. They just kind of go, okay, we'll try this variable. Oh, it turns out there's only one level left, you know. So, yeah, that that generally they don't do any kind of clever bookkeeping. Okay. Um, okay. So if we add max features equals 0 0.5, it goes up from 901 to 906. So that's better still. Um, and so as we've been doing this, you also hopefully have noticed that our root mean squared error of log price has been dropping on our validation set as well. And so it's now down to 0.2286. So how good is that, right? So like our totally untuned random forest got us in about the top 25%. Now remember, our validation set isn't identical to the Kaggle test set, right? And this competition, unfortunately, is old enough that you can't even put in a, in a, in a kind of after the, after the time entry to find out how you would have gone. So we can only approximate how we could have gone, but you know, generally speaking, it's going to be a pretty good approximation. So 2286, here is the competition, here's the public leaderboard. 2286, here we go, 14th or 15th place. Okay. So you know, roughly speaking, looks like we would be about in the top 20 of this competition with a basically totally brainless random forest with some totally brainless minor hyperparameter tuning. Yeah. And so this is kind of why the random forest is such an important f not just first step but often only step for machine learning because it's kind of hard to screw it up. Like even when we didn't tune the hyperparameters, we still got a good result, right? And then a small amount of hyperparameter tuning got us a much better result. And so any kind of model, so and I'm particularly thinking of like linear type models, um, which have a whole bunch of statistical assumptions and you have to get a whole bunch of things right before they start to work at all, can really throw you off track, right? Because they give you like totally wrong answers about how accurate the predictions can be. Or else with a random forest, you know, generally speaking, um, they tend to work on most data sets most of the time with most sets of hyperparameters. So for example, um, we um, did this thing with, the, with our categorical variables. In fact, let's take a look at our tree. Single tree. Look at this, right? Fi product class desk less than 7.5. What does that mean? So. fi product class desk. Here's some examples of that column. Right, so what does it mean to be less than or equal to 7? Well, we'd have to look at dot .cat dot .categories to find out. Okay, and so it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So what it's done is it's created a split where all of the backhoe loaders and these three types of hydraulic excavator are in one group, and everything else is in the other group. So like, that's like weird, you know, like, like these aren't even 
in order. We could have made them in order if we had you know, bothered to say the categories have this order, but we hadn't, right? So how come this even works? Right? Like, Because when we turn it into codes, um, it's actually, this is actually what the random forest sees. And so imagine, to think about this, imagine like the only thing that mattered was whether it was a hydraulic excavator zero to two metric tons and nothing else mattered. Imagine that, right? So it has to pick out this, this single level. Well, it can do that because first of all it could say, okay, let's pick out everything less than seven versus greater than seven to create, you know, this as one group and this as another group, right? And then within this group it could then pick out everything less than or six versus greater than six, which is going to pick out this one item, right? So with two split points, we can pull out a single category. Um, so this is why it works, right? Is because the tree is like infinitely flexible, um, even with a categorical variable. If there's particular categories which have different levels of price, it can like gradually zoom in on those groups by using multiple splits. Right? Now you can help it by telling it the order of your categorical variable, but even if you don't, it's okay. It's just going to take a few more decisions to get there. Right? And so you can see here, it's actually using this product class desk quite a few times. Right? And and as you go deeper down the the tree, you'll see it used more and more. Right? So where else in a linear model or almost any kind of other model, certainly any. Um, any non-tree model, pretty much, uh, encoding a categorical variable like this won't work at all, because there's no linear relationship between totally arbitrary identifiers and anything. Right? So, so these are the kinds of things that make random forests very easy to use and, and very resilient. And so by using that, you know, we've gotten ourselves a model which is clearly you know, world-class. At this point already, it's like you know probably well in the top top twenty of this Kaggle competition, and then in our next lesson, um, we're going to learn about how to um, uh, analyze that model to learn more about the data to make it even better. Yeah. Great. So this week, um, try and like really experiment, right? Have a look inside. Look, try and draw the trees. Try and plot the. Different errors. Try maybe using different data sets to see how they work. Um, really experiment to try and get a, a sense, and maybe try to like replicate things like write your own R squared. Um, you know, write your own versions of some of these functions. Um, see if yeah, see how much you can really learn about your data set about the random forest. Great. See you on Thursday. Last lesson. We looked at what random forests are, and we looked at some of the tweaks that we could use to make them work better. Um, uh, so in order to actually practice this, um, we needed to have a Jupyter Notebook environment running. Uh, so uh, we can either install Anaconda on our own computers, uh, we can use AWS, um, or we can use Cressel.com that has everything up and running straight away, um, or else Paperspace.com also works really well. Um, so assuming that you've got all that going, hopefully you've had a chance to practice running some random forests this week. I think one of the things to point out though is that before we did any tweaks of any hyperparameters or any tuning at all, uh, the raw defaults uh, already gave us a very good answer for an actual data set that we got off Kaggle. So like the tweaks aren't always, you know, the main piece. They're they're just tweaks. Sometimes they're totally necessary. Um, um, but uh, quite often you can go a long way without doing many tweaks at all. So today we're going to look at something um, I think maybe even more important than building a predictive model that's good at predicting which is to learn how to interpret that model to find out what it says about your data, to actually understand your data better by using machine learning. And this is um, 
kind of contrary to the, the common refrain that things like random forests are black boxes that hide meaning from us. And you'll see today that the truth is quite the opposite. Uh, the truth is that random forests allow us to understand our data deeper and more quickly uh, than traditional approaches. The other thing we're going to learn today is how to uh, look at larger data sets uh, than those which um, you can import with just the defaults. And specifically, we're going to look at a data set with over 100 million rows, which is the current uh, Kaggle competition for um, groceries forecasting. Did anybody have any questions outside of those two areas since we're covering that today, um, or comments that they wanted to talk about? So that is Yeah, I apologize. This is kind of like basic, just to make sure I'm understanding the concept. Make sure they can hear you. Oh, too. sorry. Um, can you just talk a little bit about like in general? I understand the details more now of a random forest, but like, yeah. when do you know this is an applicable model to use? Like, in general, be like, oh, I should try a random forest here because that's the part that I'm still like. Yeah. If I'm told to, I can. But yeah. No. So the short answer is, um, I can't really think of anything offhand that it's definitely not going to be at least somewhat useful for, so it's always worth trying. Um, I think really the question is, in what situations should I try other things as well? Um, and the short answer to that question is, for unstructured data, what I call unstructured data, so where all the different data points represent the same kind of thing, like a, a, a waveform in a sound or speech, or the words in a piece of text, or the pixels in an image, uh, you almost certainly are going to want to try deep learning. Um, and then outside of those two, there's a particular type of model we're going to look at today called a collaborative filtering model, where, um, which it so happens that the groceries competition is of that kind, where neither of those approaches are quite what you want without some tweaks to them. So that would be the, the other main one. So you're saying neither? Are you saying deep learning in random forests? Neither forest? deep learning or random forests is exactly what you want. You need to kind of do some tweaks. You'll see. Um, yeah, if anybody thinks of other places where maybe neither of those techniques is the right thing to use, um, yeah, mention it on the forums, even if you're not sure, you know, so we can talk about it, because I think this is one of the more interesting questions. And to some extent, it is a case of practice and experience, um, but I, I do think there are you know, two main classes to know about. So last week, we um, at the point where we had kind of done some of the key steps. Uh, you know, like the CSV reading in particular, which took you know a minute or two. At the end of that, we uh, saved it to a feather format file. And just to remind you, that's because this is uh, basically almost the same format that it lives in in RAM. So it's like ridiculously fast to read and write stuff from from feather format. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at lesson two, RF interpretation. And the first thing we're going to do is read that feather format file. Um, now, one thing to mention is um, a couple of you pointed out during the week uh, a really interesting little little bug or little issue, which is um, in the procdf function. The procdf function, uh, remember, um, finds the numeric columns which have missing values and creates an additional Boolean column as well as replacing the missing with medians. Um, and um, uh, also turns the categorical objects, you know, into into the integer codes. Um, the main things it does. And uh, a couple of you pointed out some uh, key points about the missing value handling. The first one is that your test set uh, may have missing values in some columns that weren't in your training set, or vice versa. And if that happens, you're going to get an error when you try to do the random forest, because it's going to say, um, you know, if that is missing field appeared in your training set but not in your test set, and it ended up in the model, um, it's going to say you can't use that 
uh, data set with this model because you're missing one of the columns it requires. Um, that's problem number one. Problem number two is that the median of the missing value, uh, sorry, the median of the numeric values in the test set may be different for the training set, and so it may actually process it into something which has different semantics. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting point. So what I did was I um, changed prop df, so it returns a third thing, um, NAs, um, and the NAs thing it returns, it doesn't matter in detail what it is, but I'll tell you just so you know, that's a dictionary that where the keys are the names of the columns that have missing values, and the values of the dictionary are the medians. And so then optionally you can pass NAs as an additional argument to PropDF, and it will make sure that it adds those specific columns and it uses those specific medians. Okay, so it's kind of it's, it's it's giving you the ability to say process this test set in exactly the same way as we process this training set. Can you pass that, please? Hi, is this a updated feature? So you just updated yeah. So I just did that. Like, so we have to do get, the day before. So just the get pull. And yeah, then, in yeah. fact, that's a good point. Um, before you start doing work any day. I would start <laughs> doing a git pull, and if something's not working today that was was working yesterday, check the forum where there'll be an explanation of why. Uh, you know this um, this library in particular is moving fast, but pretty much all the libraries that we use, uh, including PyTorch in particular, move fast. And so one of the things to do if you're watching this uh, on uh, through the MOOC is to make sure that you go to course.fast.ai and check the links there because there'll be links saying, oh, these are the differences from the course. And so they're kind of kept up to date so that you're never going to, because I can't edit what I'm saying. <laughs> I can only edit that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do a git pull before you start each day. Um, so I haven't actually updated um, all of the notebooks to add the extra uh, return value, I will over the next couple of days, but if you're using them you'll just need to put an extra comma and a's here, otherwise you'll get an error that it's returned three things and you only have room for two things. Um, okay. What I want to do, I think what I want to do before I talk about interpretation is to show you what the exact same process looks like um, when you're working with a really large data set. Um, so, and you'll see it's kind of almost the same thing, but there's going to be a few cases where we can't use the defaults um, because the defaults kind of like just run a little bit too slowly. Right? So specifically, I'm going to look at the um, Kaggle Groceries competition, specifically, what's it called? Here it is. Compression favorite grocery sales forecasting. So um, this competition, um, uh, well, who's who who is entering this competition? Okay, a lot of you. Um, who would like to have a go at explaining what this competition involves, what what the data is, and what you're trying to predict? Okay, you're trying to uh, predict uh, the items on the shelf uh, depending on um, lots of factors like oil prices. What do you say, predicting the items on the shelf? What do you mean? What are you actually predicting? Um, how much they need to have in stock to maximize their, I guess. Uh, it's not quite what we're predicting, but that, we'll try and fix that yeah, in a moment. So okay, go on. Yeah. And then uh, there's a bunch of different data sets that you can use to do that. There's oil prices, there's uh, stores, there's locations, uh, and then each of those can be used to try to predict it. Okay. Does anybody want to have a go at expanding on that? Uh, All right. Uh, so we have a bunch of information on uh, different products. Uh, so we have uh, so for Let's every. Just up a little bit higher. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for uh, every store, uh, for every item, for every day, we have a lot of uh, uh, related information available, like the. Uh, uh, location where the store was uh, located, the class of the product, uh, and the uh, units sold, 
and then based on this we are supposed to forecast in a much shorter time frame compared to the training data for every item number how much uh, we think uh, it's going to sell so only the units uh, and nothing else okay good so somebody can help get that back here so um So your ability to explain the problem you're working on is really, really important. Okay, so if you don't currently feel confident of your ability to do that, practice, right, with someone who is not in, in this competition, tell them all about it. So in this case, um, uh, or in any case really, the key things to understand a machine learning problem would be to say what are the independent variables and what is the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is the thing that you're trying to predict. The thing you're trying to predict is how many units of each kind of product were sold in each store on each day during a two-week period. So that's the thing that you're trying to predict. And the information you have to predict it is how many units of each product at each store on each day were sold in the last few years, and for each store some metadata about it, like where is it located and what class of store is it. For each type of product, you have some metadata about it, such as what category of product is it and so forth. For each date, we have some metadata about it, such as what was the oil price on that date. So this is what we would call a relational data set. So a relational data set is one where we have a number of different pieces of information that we can join together. Specifically, this kind of relational database uh, data set is what we would refer to as a star schema. A star schema is a kind of data warehousing schema where we basically say there's some central transactions table. In this case, the central transactions table, if we go to the data section here, is train.csv and it contains the number of units that were sold by date by store ID, by item ID. Okay, So that's the central transactions table, very small, very simple. And then from that we can join various bits of metadata. And it's called a star schema because you can kind of imagine the transactions table in the middle and then all these different metadata tables join onto it, giving you more information about the date, the item ID, and the store ID. Okay. Sometimes you'll also see a snowflake schema, which means there might then be additional information joined on to maybe the, um, the items table that tells you about different item categories, and store, joined to the store table telling you about the state that the store is in, and so forth. So you can have like a kind of a whole snowflake. Right? So um, that's the basic information about this problem. Okay? The, the, independent variables, the dependent variable, uh, and you probably also want something about like things like the time frame. Okay. Now, we start in exactly the same way as we did before, loading in exactly the same stuff, setting the path, but when we go read CSV, if you say um, limit memory equals uh, false, Right? Then you're basically saying use as much memory as you like to figure out what kinds of data is here. Um, it's going to run out of memory um, pretty much regardless of how much memory you have. Um, so what we do in order to limit the amount of space that it takes up when we read it in is we create a dictionary for each column name to the data type of that column. Right? And so for you to create this, it's basically up to you to, you know, run less or head or whatever on the data set to see what the types are uh, and to figure that out and pass them in. So then you can just pass in D type equals with that dictionary. And so check this out, right? We um, can read in the whole CSV file in 1 minute and 48 seconds and there are 125.5 million rows. So like when people say like Python's slow, no Python's not slow. Python can be slow if you don't use it right, 
but we can actually parse 125 million CSV records in less than two minutes. Put my language hat on for just a moment. Uh, actually, if it's fast, almost certainly it's going to C. Right. Yeah, so Python is a wrapper around a bunch of C code usually. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so if Python itself isn't actually very fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was Terence Parr, who writes things for writing programming languages for a living. So, and he is right. Um, Python itself is not fast, but almost everything we want to do in Python and data science has been written for us in C, or actually more often in Cython, which is a Python-like language which compiles to C, and so most of the stuff we run in Python is actually running not just C code, but actually in Pandas a lot of it's written in like assembly language, it's heavily optimized, behind the scenes a lot of that is going back to actually calling um, uh, Fortran-based uh, libraries for linear algebra. So there's layers upon layer of speed that actually allow us to spend less than two minutes reading in uh, that much data. Yeah, if we wrote our own CSV reader in pure Python, um, it would take it takes thousands of times, at least thousands of times longer than the um, optimized versions. Um, yeah, so for us, uh, what we care about is the speed we can get in practice. Um, and so this is pretty cool. Um, we, as well as telling it um, what the different data types were, we also have to tell it, uh, as before, which things do you want to parse as, as dates. Nice catch. I've noticed that in this dictionary you specify in 64, in 33, and in 8. I was wondering in practice, um, is it like faster if you all specify them to int or slower or like any performance consideration? So the key performance consideration here was to use the smallest number of bits that I could to fully represent the column. So if I had used int 8 for item number, there are more than 255 item numbers. But the, I mean, more specifically, the maximum item number is bigger than 255. So um, on the other hand, if I had used int 64 for store number, it's using more bits than necessary. Uh, given that the whole purpose here was to avoid running out of RAM, um, we don't want to be using up eight times more memory than necessary. Um, so the key thing was really about memory, and in fact when you're working with large data sets, um, very often you'll find the slow piece is the actually reading and writing to RAM, not the actual CPU operations. So very often that's the key performance consideration. Um, also, however, um, as a rule of thumb, smaller data types often will run faster, um, particularly if you can use SIMD, so that's uh, single instruction multiple data vectorized code. It can pack more, um, more uh, numbers into a single vector to run at once. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, that was all heavily simplified and not exactly right, but uh, right enough, I think, for this purpose. Once you do this, uh, the shuffle thing beforehand is not needed anymore? Like maybe just send a random subselection? Yeah, so, so although here I've read in the whole thing, um, when I start, I never start by reading in the whole thing. Um, so if you um, search the forum for, sh for shuff, uh, S-H-U-F, uh, you'll find some tips about how to use this Unix command to get a random sample of data um, at the command prompt. Um, and then you can just read that. And the nice thing is that that way, like that's a good way, for example, to find out what data types to use, you know, is to read in a random sample and let pandas figure it out for you. Um, oh, thank you. I think I'm still fine for this one. Though. Um, yeah, and in general, um, I do as much work as possible on a sample until I feel confident that I understand the sample before I move on. Uh, so, yeah. Um, having said that, um, what we're about to learn is some techniques for running models on this full data set that are actually going to work on arbitrarily large data sets. That also I specifically wanted to talk about how to read in large data sets. Um, one thing to mention, on promotion object, objects are like, like saying 
create a general purpose Python data type which is slow and memory heavy. And the reason for that is that this is a Boolean which also has missing values, and so we need to deal with this before we can turn it into a Boolean. So you can see after that I then go ahead and I say fill in the missing values with false. Um, now you wouldn't just do this without doing some checking ahead of time, but some exploratory data analysis shows that it seems that this is probably an appropriate thing to do. It seems that missing does mean false. Um, it, uh, objects generally read in a string, so replace the strings true and false with actual booleans, and then finally convert it to an actual boolean type. So at this point when I save this, um, this file now of uh, 123 million records takes up something under two and a half gigabytes of memory. So like you can do, like run, you know, look at pretty large data sets even on pretty small computers, um, which is interesting. So at that point, now that it's in a nice fast format, look how fast it is. I can save it to feather format in under five seconds. Okay, so that's nice. Um, and then because pandas is generally pretty fast, um, you can do stuff like summarize every column of all 125 million records in 20 seconds. Okay, so the first thing I looked at here actually is the dates. Right? Generally speaking, dates are just going to be really important in a lot of the stuff you do, particularly because any model that you put in, in in practice, you're going to be putting it in at some date that is later than the date that you trained it, by definition. Right? And so if anything in the world changes, you need to know how your predictive accuracy changes as well. And so what you'll see on Kaggle, and what you should always do in your own projects, is make sure that your dates don't overlap. So in this case, the dates that we have in the training set go from 2013 to mid-August 2017. Okay, there's our first and last. And then in our test set, they go from one day later, right, August the 16th, until the end of the month. So this is a key thing that, like, you can't really do any useful machine learning until you understand this basic piece here, which is you've got uh, four years of data, and you're trying to predict the next two weeks. Okay, so like that's just a fundamental thing that you're going to need to understand before you can really do a good job of this. And so, as soon as I see that, what does that say to you? If you wanted to now use a smaller data set, should you use a random sample, or is there something better you could do? Probably from the bottom, more recent? Yeah, get the most recent, right? And, and if you ever have trouble answering questions like this, just try to make it as physical as possible. So it's like, okay, um, I'm going to go to a shop next week, and I'm, I've got a $5 bet with my brother as to whether I can guess how many cans of Coke are going to be on the shelf. Um, all right, well, probably the best way to do that would be to go to the shop same day of the previous week and see how many cans of coke are on the shelf and guess it's going to be the same. You wouldn't go and look at how many were there four years ago. But couldn't four years ago that same time frame of the year be important? I mean like for example how much coke they have on the shelf at Christmas time is going to be way more than... So exactly, so it's not that there's no useful information from four years ago um, uh, and so we don't want to entirely throw it away, but as a, as a first step, uh, like what was the, what is the simplest possible thing? It's kind of like submitting the means. I wouldn't submit the mean of 2012 sales, I would want to probably submit the mean of last month's sales, for example. Uh, so yeah, we're just trying to think about like how might we want to kind of create some initial easy models and how, and later on like we might want to weight it. So, for example, we might want to weight more recent dates more highly. They're probably more relevant. Um, but we should do a whole bunch of exploratory data analysis to check that. So here's what the bottom of that data set looks like. Okay, um, And you can see literally it's got a date, a store number, an item number, and unit sales, and tells you whether or not that particular item was on sale uh, at that particular store on that particular date and then there's some uh, arbitrary ID. Right? So that's, that's it. 
So now that we have read that in, we can do stuff like, uh, take, uh, this is interesting, uh, again we have to take the log of the sales, um, and it's the same reason as we looked at last week, right? Because we're trying to predict something that kind of varies according to ratios, um, they told us in this, in this competition that the root mean squared log error is the thing they care about, so we take the log. Um, they mentioned also, if you check the competition uh, details, which you always should read carefully the definition of any project you do, it's, they say that there are some negative sales that represent returns, and they tell us that we should uh, consider them to be zero for the purpose of this competition. So I clip the sales so that they fall between zero and no particular maximum. Okay, so clip just means cut it off at that point, truncate it. And then take the log of that plus one. Why do I do plus one? Because again, if you check the details of the capital competition, that's what they tell you they're going to use. Is they're not actually just taking the root mean squared log error, but the root mean squared log plus one error. Okay, because log of zero doesn't make sense. Uh, we can add the date part as usual, and you know again. It's taking a couple of minutes, right? So I would, I would run through all this on a sample first, so everything takes 10 seconds to make sure it works, just to check everything looks reasonable before I go back, because I don't want to wait two minutes for something I don't know it's going to work. Um, but as you can see, all, this, all these lines of code are identical to what we saw for the bulldozers competition. Um, in this case, I mean, all I'm reading in is a training set, I didn't need to run train cats because all of my data types are already numeric. Okay. Um, if they weren't, I would need to call train cats, and then I would need to call apply cats to apply the same categorical codes uh, that I now have in the training set to the validation set. Uh, I call propdf uh, as before um, to check for missing values and uh, so forth. Um, so all of those lines of code are identical. Uh, these lines of code again are identical um, because root mean squared error is still what we care about. Um, and then I've got two changes. The first is set RF samples, which we learned about last week. So we've got 120 something million records. Um, we probably don't want to create a tree from 120 million something records, right? I don't even know how long that's going to take. I haven't been, I haven't had the time and patience to wait and see. Um, so you know, you could start with 10,000 or 100,000. You know, maybe it runs in a few seconds, make sure it works, and you can kind of figure out how much you can run. And so I found getting it to a million, uh, it runs in under a minute. Right? And so the point here is there's no relationship between the size of the data set and how long it takes to build the random forest. The relationship is between the number of estimators multiplied by the sample size. Okay? Uh, yes. Um, just curious what n jobs is, because in the past it's always been negative one, and you made it eight here. Yeah, so the number of jobs is the number of cores that it's going to use. Um, and I was running this on a computer that has about 60 cores, and I just found if you try to use all of them, it spent so much time spinning up jobs, so it was a bit slower. So if you've got like lots and lots of cores on your computer, sometimes you want less than negative one means use every single core. Oh. Yeah. Um, there's one more change I made, which is that I converted the data frame into an array of floats, and then I fit it on that. Um, why did I do that? Um, because internally, inside the random forest code, they do that anyway, right? And so given that I wanted to run a few different random forests with a few different hyperparameters, by doing it once myself, I save that minute 37 seconds, right? So, um, if you run a line of code and it takes like quite a long time, so the first time I ran this random forest regressor, it kind of took two or three minutes, and I thought, I don't really want to wait two or three minutes. Um, you can always add in front of the line of code p run, uh, percent p run. And what percent p run does is it runs something called a profiler. And what a profiler does is it'll tell you which lines of code behind the scenes took the most time, right? And in this case I noticed that there was a line of code inside scikit-learn that was this line of code, and it was taking all the time, nearly all the time. And so I thought, oh, I'll do that first, 
and then I'll pass in the result and I won't have to do it again. Okay, so this thing of looking to see which things is taking up the time is called profiling and in software engineering It's one of the most important tools you have uh, data scientists really underappreciate this tool but you'll find like uh, amongst Conversations on github issues or on Twitter or whatever amongst the top data scientists They're sharing and talking about profiles all the time and that's how easy it is to get a profile um, so for fun, you know, try running PRun from time to time on stuff that's taking 10-20 seconds and see if you can learn to interpret and use uh, profiler outputs. You know, even though in this case I didn't write this scikit-learn um, plus, I was still able to use the profile to figure out how to um, make it run uh, over twice as fast, right, by avoiding recalculating this each time. So in this case, uh, I build my regressor, I decided to use 20 estimators. Um, something else that I noticed in the profiler is that I can't use OOB score when I use set RF samples, because if I do, it's going to use the other 124 million rows to calculate the OOB score, which is like, again, it's still going to take forever. Uh, so I may as well have a proper validation set anyway. Besides which, I want a validation set that's the most recent dates rather than as random. So if you use set RF samples on a large data set, don't put the OOB score parameter in, because um, it takes forever. So that got me um, a 0.76 validation root mean squared log error. Uh, and then I tried like fiddling around with different min samples. So if I decrease the min samples lead from 100 to 10, it took a little bit more time to run, as you would expect. And the um, error uh, went down from 76 to 71, so that looked pretty good. So I kept decreasing it down to 3, and that brought this error down to 0 0.70. Uh, when I decreased it down to 1, uh, it didn't really help. So I kind of had like a reasonable random forest here. When I say reasonable, though, it's not reasonable in the sense that it's it's does not give a good result on the leaderboard. And so this is a very interesting question about why is that? And the reason is really coming back to Savannah's question earlier, like where might random forests not work as well? Let's go back and look at the data. Okay, here's the entire data set that we, well not the whole data set, here's all the columns that we used. So the columns that we have to predict with are they, the date, the store number, the item number, and whether it was on promotion or not. And then, of course, we used add date part, so there's also going to be day of week, day of month, day of year, is quarter, start, etc., etc. So, if you think about it, most of the insight, you know, around like how much of something do you expect to sell tomorrow, is likely to be very wrapped up in the details about like what, where is that store, what kind of things do they tend to sell at that store. For that item, what category of item is, is it? You know, if it's like um, uh, fresh bread, they might not sell much of it on Sundays because on Sundays, you know, fresh bread doesn't get made. Um, where else is it's gasoline? Maybe they're going to sell a lot of gasoline because on Sundays people go and fill up their car for the week ahead, right? Now, a random forest has no ability to do anything other than create a bunch of binary splits on things like day of week, store number, item number. It doesn't know which one represents gasoline. It doesn't know which stores are in the center of the city versus which ones are out in the sticks. It doesn't know any of these things. So its ability to really understand what's going on is somewhat limited. So we're probably going to need to use the entire four years of data to even get some useful insights. But then as soon as we start using the whole four years of data, a lot of the data we're using is really old. So interestingly, um, there's a Kaggle kernel that points out that what you could do is just take the last two weeks and take the average sales, the average sales by date, by store number, by item number, and just submit that. And if you just submit that, you come about 30th. <laughs> Alright? So, for those of you in the grocery uh, 
Terence has a comment or a question. I think this may have tripped me up, actually. Uh, I think you said date, store, item. I think it's actually store, item, sales, and then you mean across date. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's uh, store, item, and on promotion. On uh, promotion, yeah. 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 Um, if, you do it, if you do it by date as well, you end up... Um, so these, these, each row represents basically like a cross-tabulation of all of the sales on that date in that store for that item. So if you put date in there as well, there's only going to be one or two um, items being averaged in each of those cells, which is, you know, too much variation, basically. It's too sparse. Um, it doesn't give you a terrible result, but it's, it's not 30th. Um, so, so your job, if you're looking at this competition, and we'll talk about this in the, in the next class, is how do you start with that model and make it a little bit better, right? Because if you can, um, then by the time we meet up next, hopefully you'll be above the top 30. Because, you know, Kaggle being Kaggle, lots of people have now taken this kernel and submitted it, and they all have about the same score, and the scores are ordered not just by score, but by date submitted. So if you now submit this kernel, you're not going to be 30th, because you're way down the list of, of, of when it was submitted. Right? But if you can do a tiny bit better, you're going to be better than all of those people. So try and think of how can you make this a tiny bit better. Yes, I just... Uh, could you try to capture seasonality and trend effects by creating new columns like these are the average sales in the month of August, these are the average sales for this year? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So the thing for you to think about is how to do that, right? And so like, see if you can see if you can make it work because there are details to get right, which and I know Terence has been working on this for the last week and he's gone almost crazy. Right, but the details crazier. crazier. The details are are difficult. They're not difficult like intellectually difficult. They're kind of difficult in the way that makes you like want to head back your desk at two AM. Um, and like this is something to mention in general is the coding you do for machine learning is like it's incredibly frustrating and incredibly difficult. Not difficult like technically, but difficult like there if you get a detail wrong much of the time, it's not going to give you an exception. It'll just silently be slightly less good than it otherwise would have been, right? And if you're on Kaggle, at least you know, okay, well, I'm not doing as well as other people on Kaggle, right? But if you're not on Kaggle, you just don't know. Like, you don't know if your company's model is like half as good as it could be because you made a little mistake, right? So that's why one of the reasons why practicing on Kaggle now is great, right? Because you're going to get practice in finding all of the ways in which you can infuriatingly screw things up, right? And you'll be amazed, like for me, there's an extraordinary array, array of them. But as you get to know what they are, you'll start to know how to check for them as you go, right? And so the only way, like you should assume every button you press, you're going to press the wrong button, right? And that's fine as long as you have a way to find out. Okay, so... Um, We'll talk about that more you know, during the course, but unfortunately there isn't like a set of specific things I can tell you to always do. You just always have to think like, okay, what do I know about the results of this thing I'm about to do? I'll give you a really simple example. No, I'll give you a really simple example. If you've actually created that, that basic entry, entry where you do take the mean by date, by store number, by on promotion, right, and you've like submitted it and you've got a reasonable score, and then you think you've got something that's a little bit better, and you do predictions for that. How about you now create a scatter plot showing the predictions of your average model on one axis versus the predictions of your new model on the other axis? You should see that they just about form a line, right? And if they don't, then that's a very strong suggestion that you've screwed something up. Right? So that would be an example. Okay, can you pass that one to the end of that row? Possibly two steps. One step now. Yeah, so, can you, so for a problem like this, um, unlike 
the car insurance problem on Kaggle where we don't, where columns are unnamed. We know, uh, we, we know what the columns represent and what they are. Do you, uh, how often do you pull in data from other sources um, to supplement that? I mean, you could maybe like weather data or, you know, for example, or, or how often is that used? Very often, right? And so the whole point of this um, star schema is that you've got your central table and then you've got these other tables coming off it that provide metadata about it. So for example, weather is metadata about a date, right? Now, on Kaggle specifically, most competitions have the rule that you can use external data as long as you post on the forum that you're using it and that it's publicly available. Um, but you have to check on a competition by competition basis, they will tell you. Um, outside of Kaggle, you should always be looking for like, what external data could I possibly leverage here? Because otherwise they can't hear on the recording. Oh, okay. So are we still talking about how to tweak this data set? If you wish. Um, well, I'm not familiar with the countries here, so maybe... This is Ecuador. Ecuador. So maybe I would... It's Ecuador's largest grocery chain. Ecuador's largest grocery chain. Maybe I would start looking for Ecuador's holidays and shopping holidays, maybe when they have a three-day weekend or a week yeah. off. Yeah, and actually that information is provided um, uh, in this case. And so in, in general, um, one way of tackling this kind of um, problem is to create lots and lots of new columns containing things like you know, average number of sales on holidays, uh, average percent change in sale between January and February, and so on and so forth. And so um, if you have a look at, there's been a previous competition on Kaggle um, called Rossmann's Door Sales that was almost identical. Uh, it was uh, in Germany in this case, for a major grocery chain, how many items are sold by day, by item type, by store. And the, uh, in this case the person who won, uh, quite unusually actually, was something of a domain expert in this space. Uh, they're actually a specialist in doing um, logistics predictions. And this is basically what they did, was he's a professional sales forecast consultant. Um, <laughs> he, um, he created just lots and lots and lots of columns based on his experience of what kinds of things tend to be useful for making predictions. Okay, so that, that, that's an approach that can work. Um, the third place team did almost no feature engineering, however, and also they uh, had one big oversight, which I think they would have won if they had no had it. So you don't necessarily have to use this approach. Um, so we'll be learning, anyway, we'll be learning a lot more about how to win this competition um, and ones like it as we go. They did interview the third place team. So if you Google for um, Kaggle, Rossman, you'll see it. Uh, the short answer is they use deep learning. Um, so one of the things, and these are a couple of charts that, um, so Terence is actually my teammate on this competition. So Terence um, drew a couple of these charts for us and I wanted to talk about this, which is if you don't have a good validation set, um, it's, it's hard if not impossible to create a good model. So in other words, like, if you're trying to predict next month's sales and you build a bunch, you know, you try to build a model and you have no way of really knowing whether the models you built are good at predicting sales a month ahead of time, then you have no way of knowing when you put your model in production whether it's actually going to be any good. Right? So, so you need a validation set that you know is reliable at telling you whether or not your model is likely to work well when you like put it into production or use it on the test set. So in this case, um, what Terence has plotted here is, and so normally you should not use your test set for anything other than using it right at the end of the competition or right at the end of the project to find out how you've gone. But there's one thing I'm going to let you use the test set for in addition, and that is to calibrate your validation set. So what Terence did here was he built four different models, right? some which he thought would be better than others, and he submitted each of the four models to Kaggle to find out its score. 
And so the x-axis is the score that Kaggle told us on the leaderboard. Okay? And then on the y-axis, he plotted the score on a particular validation set he was trying out to see whether this validation set looked like it was going to be any good. Okay. So if your validation set is good, then the relationship between the leaderboard score, i.e. the test set score, and your validation set score should lie in a straight line. Ideally, it will actually lie on the y equals x line. Okay? But honestly, that doesn't matter too much. As long as, relatively speaking, it tells you which models are better than which other models, then you know which model is the best. Right? Uh, and you know how it's going to perform on the test set, because you know the linear relationship between the two things. Okay? So in this case, Terence has managed to come up with a validation set which is looking like it's going to predict our Kaggle leaderboard score pretty well. And that's really cool, right? Because now he can go away and try a hundred different types of models, feature engineering, weighting, tweaks, hyperparameters, whatever else, see how they go in the validation set, and not have to submit to Kaggle, right? So we're going to get a lot more iterations, a lot more feedback. Right? This is not just true of Kaggle, but every machine learning project you do. Right? And so if you find, so here's a different one he tried, right, where it wasn't as good. Right? It's like, oh, these ones that were quite close to each other, it's showing us the opposite direction. That's a really bad sign. So it's like, okay, this validation set idea didn't seem like a good idea, this validation set idea didn't look like a good idea. And so in general, if your validation set's not showing a nice straight line, you need to think carefully. Like, okay, how is the test set constructed? Why, how is my validation set different? You know, there's some way you're constructing it which is, which is different. You're going to have to draw lots of charts and so forth. So one question is, uh, and I'm going to try to to guess how how you did it. So how do you actually try to construct this validation set as close to the? So what I would try to do is to try to sample points from the training set that are very closer as possible to some of the points in the test set. Close in what sense? Uh, I don't know. I will have to find the what would you features. Guess? Um, well, in this case, for this groceries. For it, those groceries, um, the last points? Yeah, or... close by date. Yeah. Um, so basically, date. all the different things Terence was trying were different variations of Something close like that. by date. So the most recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> what I noticed was so first I looked at the date range of the test set. And then I looked at the uh, the kernel that described how so he or she. So here's the date range of the test set. So the last two weeks of August 26, 2017. That's right. And then the person who submitted the kernel that said how to get the 0.58 leaderboard position or whatever yeah, score. The average by group. Yep. I looked at the date range of that, and um, that it's was like nine or ten days. Right? Well, it was actually fourteen days, 14. and the test set is sixteen days. Okay. But the interesting thing is the test set begins on the day after payday and ends on the payday. Ah. And so these are things I also paid attention to, mm. uh, but. And I think that's one of the bits of metadata that they told us. You know, so yeah. these are the kinds of things you just gotta like try. Like I said. Try, Plot lots of pictures, and like even if you didn't know it was payday, you know you would want to like draw the time series chart of sales, and you would hopefully see that like every two weeks there would be a spike or whatever, and you'd be like, oh, I want to make sure that my I have the the same number of spikes in my validation set that I've had in my test set, for example. Okay, let's take a five minute break, and uh, let's come back at uh, two thirty two. Okay, so um, this is my favorite bit, uh, interpreting machine learning models. Um, and by the way, um, if you're looking for my notebook about the groceries competition, you won't find it in GitHub because I'm not allowed to share uh, code for running competitions with you unless you're on the same team as me, um, that's the rule. Uh, after the competition is finished, it'll be on GitHub, however, so if you're doing this through the video, you should be able to find it. Um, so let's start by reading in our feather file. So our feather file is exactly the same as uh, our CSV file. This is for our 
Blue Book for Bulldozers competition. So we're trying to predict the sale price of heavy industrial equipment at auction. Um, and so reading the feather format file means that we've already um, read in the CSV and processed it into categories. Um, and so the next thing we do is to run procdf in order to turn the categories into integers, deal with the missing values, and pull out the dependent variable. Okay, uh, this is exactly the same thing as we used last time to create a validation set, where the validation set represents the last uh, couple of weeks, the last 12,000 records um, by date. And uh, I discovered, um, thanks to one of your excellent questions on the forum last week, I had a, a bug here. Um, which is that um, um, procdf was um, shuffling uh, the order, sorry, um, uh, sorry not procdf. Uh, and last week we saw a particular version of procdf where we passed in a subset, uh, and when I passed in the subset it was randomly shuffling, and so then when I said split vowels, it wasn't getting the last rows by date, but it was getting a random set of rows. So I've now fixed that. So if you rerun um, the Lesson 1 RF code, you'll see slightly different results. Uh, specifically, you'll see in that section that my validation set uh, results look less good, uh, but that's only for this tiny little bit where I had subset equals uh, set. Yes, Chenchi. Um, I'm a little bit confused about the notation here. So NAS is both a input variable and it's also the output variable of mm. this function. And yeah. Why is that? The uh, procdf returns a dictionary telling you um, which things were missing, which columns were missing, uh, and for each of those columns what the median was. Um, so when you uh, call it on uh, like the larger data set, the non-subset, um, you want to take that return value, right, and you don't pass in uh, an NAD to that point, you just want to get back the result. Later on, when you pass it into a subset, you want to use the, have the same missing columns and the same medians, and so you pass it in. And if, like this different subset, uh, like if it was a whole different data set, turned out it had some different missing columns, it would update that dictionary with some uh, with additional key values as well. So it kind of you can you don't have to pass it in. If you don't pass it in, then it just gives you gives you the information about what was missing and, and the medians. If you do pass it in, it uses that information for uh, any missing columns that that are there. And if there are some new missing columns, it'll update that dictionary with that additional information. So it's like keeping um, all data sets, uh, column information. Yeah, it's going to keep track of all any any missing columns that you came across in any of anything you passed across. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we split it into the training and test set just like we did last week. And so to remind you, once we've done PropDF, this is what it looks like. This is the log of sale price. Okay. So. The first thing to think about is um, we already know how to get the predictions, right? Which is we take the uh, average uh, we take the average value in each leaf node in each tree uh, after running a particular row through each tree, right? That's how we get the the prediction. But normally we don't just want a prediction; uh, we also want to know how confident we are of that prediction, and so. We would be less confident of a prediction if we haven't seen many examples of rows like this one. And if we haven't seen many examples of rows like this one, then we wouldn't expect any of the trees to kind of have a path through which, which is really designed to help us predict that row. And so conceptually, you would expect then that as you pass this unusual row through different trees, it's kind of going to end up in very different places. So in other words, rather than just taking the mean of the predictions of the trees and saying that's our prediction, what if we took the standard deviation of the predictions of the trees? So the standard deviation of the predictions of the trees, if that's high, that means each tree 
is giving us a very different estimate of this row's prediction. So if this was a really common kind of row, right, then the trees will have learnt to make good predictions for it, because it's seen lots of opportunities to split based on those kinds of rows. Right? So the standard deviation of the predictions across the trees gives us some kind of at least relative understanding of how confident we are of this prediction. So that is not something which exists in scikit-learn or in any library I know of, uh, so we have to create it. But we already have almost the exact code we need, because remember last lesson we actually manually calculated the averages across different sets of trees, so we can do exactly the same thing to calculate the standard deviations. So when I'm doing random forest interpretation, I pretty much never use the full data set. I always call set RF samples, because like we don't need a massively accurate random forest, we just need one which indicates the nature of the relationships involved. right? And so I just make sure this number is high enough that if I call the same interpretation commands multiple times, I don't get different results back each time. That's like the rule of thumb about how big does it need to be. right? But in practice, like 50,000 is a high number, and most of the time you know, it would be surprising if that wasn't enough, right? And, and it runs in seconds, so I generally start with 50,000. So with my 50,000 samples per tree set, I create 40 estimators. I know from last time that min samples leaf equals 3, max features equals 0.5 isn't bad, and again, we're not trying to create the world's most predictive tree anyway, um, so that all sounds fine. Um, we get an R-squared on the validation set of 0.89, again, we don't particularly care, but it's, as long as it's good enough, which it certainly is. Um, and so here's where we can do that exact same list comprehension as last time, remember? Go through each estimator, that's each tree, call dot .predict on it with our validation set, make that a list comprehension, and pass that to np.stack, which concatenates everything in that list across a new axis. Okay. So now our rows are the results of each tree, and our columns are the result of each row in the original data set. And then we remember we can calculate the mean, right? So here's the prediction for uh, our data set row number one, and here's our standard deviation. Okay, so here's how to do it for just one uh, observation right, at the end here. Um, we've calculated for all of them, just printing it for one here. Now, this, um, this can take quite a while, and specifically, it's not taking advantage of the fact that my computer has lots of cores in it. Um, list comprehensions, this is, this is like, the list comprehension itself is Python code, right? It's my Python code. And Python code, unless you're doing special stuff, runs in serial, which means it, it runs on a single CPU. Doesn't take advantage of your multi CPU hardware, and so if I wanted to run this, you know, on, on more trees and more data, you know, this um, one second is going to go up. And you see here the wall time, the amount of actual time it took, is roughly equal to the CPU time. Where else, if it was running on lots of cores, the CPU time would be higher than the wall time. So it turns out that um, uh, Scikit-Learn provides a handy. Uh, actually, not scikit learn. Uh, Fast AI provides a handy uh, function called parallel trees, which calls some stuff inside scikit learn. And parallel trees takes two things. It takes a random forest model that I trained. So here it is, M, and some function to call. And it calls that function on every tree in parallel. So in other words, rather than calling t.predict x valid. Let's create a function that calls t.predict x valid. Let's use parallel trees to call it on our model for every tree. Okay, and it will return a list of the result of applying that function to every tree. And so then we can np.stack that. So hopefully you can see that that code and that code are basically the same thing. Right? But this one is doing it in parallel. 
And so you can see here now um, our um, wall time has gone down to uh, 500 milliseconds um, and it's now uh, giving us exactly the same answer. Okay, so a little bit faster. Um, time permitting, we'll talk about more general ways of, of writing code that runs in parallel because it turns out to be super useful for data science. Um, but here's one that we can use that's very specific to random forests. Um, okay, so what we can now do is we can always call this to get our um, predictions for each tree, and then we can call standard deviation to then get them for every row. Um, and so let's try using that. So what I could do is let's create a copy of our data, and let's add an additional column to it, which is the standard deviation of the predictions across the first axis. Okay, um, And let's also add in the mean, so they're the predictions themselves. Um, so we, you might remember from last lesson that one of the uh, predictors um, we have is called enclosure, uh, and we'll see later on that this is an important predictor. Um, and so let's start by just doing a histogram. So one of the nice things in pandas is it's got built-in plotting capabilities. Uh, it's well worth googling for pandas plotting to see how to do it. Uh, yes, Terence. Jeremy, can you remind me what enclosure is? Uh, so we don't know uh, what it means, uh, and it doesn't matter. You know, like that's the whole purpose of this process is that we're going to figure out. We're going to learn about what things are, or at least what things are important, and we'll later on figure out what they are and how they're important. So we're going to start out knowing nothing about this data set, right? So there's something. So I'm just going to look at something called enclosure that has something called erops and something called orops, and I don't even know what this is yet. All I know is that the only three that really appear in any great quantity are orops, erops, wac, and erops. And this is like really common as a data scientist, you know, you often find yourself looking at data that you're not that familiar with, and you've got to figure out at least like which bits to study more carefully and which bits seem to matter and so forth. So in this case, I at least know that these three groups I really don't care about because they basically don't exist. Um, so given that, we're going to ignore those three. So we're going to focus on this one here, this one here, and this one here. And so here you can see what I've done is I've taken um, my uh, data frame uh, and I've uh, grouped by enclosure and I am taking the average of these three fields. So here you can see here's the average sale price, the average prediction, and the standard deviation of prediction for each of my three groups. So I can already start to learn a bit here. Um, as you would expect, the uh, prediction and the sale price are close to each other on average, so that's a good sign. Um, and then the standard deviation varies a little bit. It's a little hard to see in a table, uh, so what we could do is um, we could try to start like printing these things out. Uh, so here we've got um, the sale price for each level of enclosure. And here we've got the prediction for each level of enclosure, and for the error bars I'm using the standard deviation of prediction. All right, so here you can see the actual, and here's the prediction, and here's my confidence interval. Okay, um, Or at least it's the average of the standard deviation of the random forests. So this tells us, it'll tell us if there's some groups or some rows that we're not very confident of at all. Um, so we could do something similar for product size, right? So here's different product sizes. Uh, we can do exactly the same thing of looking at our predictions and our standard deviations. Okay, we could sort by, and what we could say is like, well, what what's the uh, ratio of the standard deviation of the predictions to the predictions themselves, right? So you'd kind of expect, on average, that when you're predicting something that's a bigger number, that your standard deviation would be higher. Right, so you can like sort by that ratio, and what that tells us is that the product size large and product size compact, our predictions are less accurate. You know, as relatively speaking, as a ratio of the total price. And so then, if we go back and have a look, 
Well, there you go. That's why. From the histogram, those are the smallest groups. Okay, so as you would expect, in small groups, we're doing a less good job. Right? So this confidence interval you can really use for two main purposes. One is that you can group it up like this and look at the average confidence interval by group to find out are there some groups that you just don't seem to have confidence about, about those groups. But perhaps more importantly, you can look at them for specific rows. And so when you put it in production, you might always want to see the confidence intervals. So if you're doing, say, credit scoring, so deciding whether to give somebody a loan, you probably want to see not only what's their level of risk, but how confident are we. And if they want to borrow lots of money, and we're not at all confident or about our ability to predict whether they'll pay it back, we might want to give them a smaller loan. Okay, so those are the two ways in which you would use this. Okay, let me go to the next one, which is the most important. Uh, the most important is feature importance. Um, and the only reason I didn't do this first is because I think the intuitive understanding of how to calculate confidence interval is the easiest one to understand intuitively. In fact, it's almost identical to something we've already calculated. Right? But in terms of which one do I look at first in practice, I always look at this in practice. So when I'm working on whether it be a cattle competition or a real-world uh, project, um, I build a random forest as fast as I can, um, uh, try and get it to the point that it's like, you know, significantly better than random, but doesn't have to be much better than that. And then the next thing I do is to plot the feature importance. And the feature importance tells us in this random forest which columns mattered. Right, so we had like dozens and dozens of columns originally in this data set, and here I'm just picking out the top 10. So you can just call RF feature importance, again this is part of the FastAI library, it's leveraging stuff that's in scikit-learn, pass in the model, pass in the data frame, because we need to know the names of the columns, right? and it will tell you, uh, it will order, uh, give you back a pandas data frame showing you in order of importance uh, how important was each column. And here I'm just going to pick out the top 10. So we can then plot that, right? So fi, um, because it's a data frame, we can use data frame plotting commands. So here I've plotted all of the feature importances, right? And so you can see here, like, and I, I haven't been able to write all of the names of the columns at the bottom, which that's not the important thing. The important thing is to see that some columns are really really important and most columns don't really matter at all and like in nearly every data set you use in real life this is what your feature importance is going to look like it's going to say there's like a handful of columns that you care about and this is why I always start here right because at this point in terms of like looking into learning about this domain of heavy industrial equipment auctions I only going to care about learning about the columns which matter. Right? So are we going to bother learning about enclosure? Depends whether enclosure is important. And there it is. It's in the top 10. So we are going to have to learn about enclosure. Okay? So then we could also plot this as a bar plot. Right? So you can here I've just created a little a little tiny little function here that's going to just plot um, my bars. Um, and I'm just going to do it for the top 30, and so you can see the same basic shape here, uh, and I can see there's my enclosure. Okay, so we're going to learn about how this is calculated in just a moment, um, but before we worry about how it's calculated, much more important is to know what to do with it. So the most important thing to do with it is to now sit down with your client or your data dictionary or whatever your source of information is and say to them, okay, tell me about year made. What does that mean? Where does that come from? Um, plot lots of things like histograms of year made and scatter plots of year made against price and learn everything you can because year made and coupler system, they're the things that matter, right? And what will often happen in real world projects is that you'll sit with the client and you'll say, oh, it turns out the coupler system is the second most important thing. And then they might say, that makes no sense. Now that doesn't mean that there's a problem with your model. It means there's a problem with their understanding of the data that they gave you. Right? So let me give you an example. 
Um, I entered a Kaggle competition where the goal was to predict which applications for grants at a university would be successful. And I used this exact approach, and I discovered a number of columns which were almost entirely predictive of the dependent variable. And specifically, when I then looked to see in what way they were predictive, it turned out that whether they were missing or not was basically the only thing that mattered in this data set. And so later on, so I ended up winning that competition, and I think a lot of it was thanks to this insight. right? And so later on, I heard what had happened, and it turns out that at that university, there's, you know, there's an administrative burden to filling out the database. And so for a lot of the grant applications, they don't fill in the database for the folks whose applications weren't accepted. right? So in other words, these missing values in the data set were saying, Okay, this grant wasn't accepted because if it was accepted, then you know the admin folks are going to go in and, and type in that information. So this is what we call data leakage, and data leakage means there's information in the data set that I was modeling with, which the university wouldn't have had in real life at the point in time they were making a decision, right? So when they're actually deciding, you know, um, which grant applications. Should I like prioritize? Um, they don't actually know which ones the admin staff are later on going to add information to because it turns out that they got accepted. You see what I mean? Right? So one of the key things you'll find here is is data leakage problems, and that's a, a serious problem that you need to deal with. Um, the other thing that will happen is you'll often find it's signs of collinearity. And I think that's what's happened here with coupler system. I think coupler system tells you whether or not a particular kind of heavy industrial equipment has a particular feature on it. Um, but if it's not that kind of industrial equipment at all, it will be empty, it will be missing. And so coupler system is really telling you whether or not it's a certain class of heavy industrial equipment. Now this is not leakage, this is actual information you actually have at the right time. It's just that like interpreting it you have to be careful. Okay? Um, so I would go through at least the top 10 or like kind of look for where the natural breakpoints are and really study these things carefully. Um, to make life easier for myself, what I tend to do is I try to throw some data away and see if that matters. So in this case, I had a um, random forest which let's go and see how accurate it was. Uh, 0.89, um, what I did was I said here, okay, well let's go through our feature importance data frame and filter out those where the importance is greater than 0 0.005, right? So 0 0.025, so 0 0.005 is about here, right? It's kind of like where they really flatten off, right? So let's just keep those. Um, and so that gives us uh, a list of 25 column names. And so then I say, okay, let's now create a new uh, data frame view which just contains those 25 columns. Um, call split vowels on it again, just put it into test and training set, and um, create a new random forest. And let's see what happens. And you can see here the uh, R squared basically didn't change. Uh, 891. Versus 889. So it's actually increased a tiny bit, right? I mean, generally speaking, removing uh, redundant columns, uh, will, you know, it, it shouldn't, obviously, it shouldn't make it worse. If it makes it worse, they weren't redundant after all. Um, it might make it a little better, because if you think about how we built these trees, um, when it's deciding what to split on, you know, it's it's got less things to have to worry about trying, it's less often going to like accidentally find a crappy column. Uh, so it's you know got a slightly better opportunity to create a slightly better tree with slightly less data, but it's you know it's not going to change it by much. Uh, but it's going to make it a bit faster, and it's going to let us focus on what matters. So if I rerun feature importance now, um, I've now got 25. Now the key thing that's happened is that when you remove redundant columns, is that you're also removing sources of collinearity. Right? In other words, two columns that might be related to each other. Now, collinearity doesn't make your random forest less predictive, 
But if you have two columns that are related to each other, you know, uh, you know, like this column is a little bit related to this column, and this column is a strong driver of the dependent variable, then what's going to happen is that the, the importance is going to end up like kind of split between the two collinear columns. It's going to say like, well, both of those columns matter, so kind of it's going to split it between the two. So by removing some of those columns with very little impact, it makes your feature importance plot clearer. And so you can see here actually year made was pretty close to coupler system before, but there must have been a bunch of things that were collinear with year made, which makes perfect sense, right? Like old industrial equipment wouldn't have had a bunch of kind of technical features that new ones would, for example. So it's actually saying like, oh okay, year made really, really matters. Right? So I trust this feature importance better. You know, the predictive accuracy of the model is a tiny bit better, but this feature importance has a lot less collinearity to confuse us. So let's talk about how this works. And it's actually really simple. And not only is it really simple, it's a technique you can use not just for random forests, but for um, basically any kind of machine learning model. Um, and interestingly, almost no one knows that. Um, like many people will tell you, oh, this particular kind of model, there's no way of like interpreting it. And the most important interpretation of a model is knowing like which things are important. Um, and that's almost certainly not going to be true because this technique I'm going to teach you actually works for any kind of model. So here's what we're going to do: we're going to take our data set, the bulldozers, right, and we've got this column which we're trying to predict, right, which is price. And then we've got all of our independent variables. Okay, so here's an independent variable here, year made, right? Plus a whole bunch of other variables. And remember, we had after we did a bit of trimming, we had 25 independent variables. Okay, how do we figure out how important year made is? Well, we've got our whole random forest. Right? And we can find out our predictive accuracy, where, so we're going to put all of these rows through our random forest, and we're going to spit out some predictions, right? and we're going to compare them to the actual price to get, in this case, for example, our root mean squared error and our R squared. And we're going to call that, like, that's our starting point. Right? So now, let's do exactly the same thing, but let's take the year made column and randomly shuffle it. So randomly permute just that column. So now year made has exactly the same like distribution as before, same mean standard deviation, but it's going to have no relationship to the dependent variable at all because we totally randomly reordered it. So before we might have found our R squared was 0.89, right? And then after we shuffle year made, we check again, and now it's like 0.8. Like, oh, our score got much worse when we destroyed that variable. And it's like, okay, let's try again. Let's put year made back to how it was. And this time, let's take enclosure and shuffle that. Right? And we find this time with enclosure, it's 0.84. And we can say, oh, okay, so the amount of decrease in our score for year made was 0.09, and the amount of decrease in our score for enclosure was 0.05, right? and this is going to give us our feature importances for each one of our columns. Yes? Um, wouldn't just excluding, let's say, each column and running, running a random forest and checking the uh, decay in the performance. Yeah, so um, you could remove the column and train a whole new random forest, but that's going to be really slow. Whereas this way, we can keep our random forest and just test the predictive accuracy of it again. Mm. Right, so this is nice and fast by comparison. In this case, we just have to rerun every row forward through the forest um, for each shuffled column. I see. We, we're just basically doing predictions after exactly. shuffling. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, great question. 
Um, so if you want to do like multicoloniality, would you do two of them and then random shuffle and then three of them random shuffle? Like that yeah, so I mean, I don't think you mean multicoloniality. I think you mean looking for interaction effects. Yeah, so if you want to say um, which pairs of variables are most important, you could do exactly the same thing uh, each pair in, in turn. Um, in practice, there are better ways to do that um, because that's obviously computationally pretty expensive. And so we'll try and find time to do that if we can. Okay, so we now have a model which is a little bit more accurate um, and uh, is, we've learned a lot more about it. Um, so we're out of time, and so um, what I would suggest you try doing now, uh, uh, before the next class, uh, for this bulldozer's data set, is like go through the top, I don't know, five or ten predictors, and um, try and learn what you can about how to draw plots in pandas, and try to come back with like some insights about like what's the relationship between year made and the dependent variable, what's the histogram of year made, you know, try and find, you know, some possible like, now that you know year made is really important, is there some noise in that column which we could fix, are there some weird encodings in that column that we could fix? Um, this idea I had that maybe couple system is there entirely because it's collinear with something else, do you want to like try and figure out whether that's true? If so, how would you do it? Um, FI product class desk, that rings alarm bells for me. It sounds like it might be a high cardinality categorical variable. It might be something with lots and lots of levels because it sounds like it's like a model name. So like, go and have a look at that model name. Does it have some ordering to it? Could you make it an ordinal variable to make it better? Does it have some kind of hierarchical structure in the string that we could split it on like hyphen to create more sub-columns? You know, have a think about this, you know, and, and so try and make it so that you know, by Tuesday when you come back, you've got some new, ideally you've got a, a better accuracy than what I just showed because you found some new insights, uh, or at least that you can tell the class about some things you've learnt about how heavy industrial equipment options work in practice. Okay? Great. See you on Tuesday. All right. Welcome back. Um, uh, something to mention, uh, somebody asked on the forums, really good question, uh, was like, how do I deal with version control and notebooks? Uh, uh, the question was something like, every time I change the notebook, Jeremy goes and changes it on git, and then I do a git pull, and I end up with a conflict, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's that happens a lot with notebooks, because notebooks behind the scenes are JSON files, which like every time you run even a cell without changing it, it updates that little number saying like what numbered cell this is, and so now suddenly there's a change. And so trying to merge notebook changes is a nightmare. Um, so my suggestion, uh, like a simple way to do it, is is when you're looking at um, some notebook, uh, like lesson two, RF interpretation, you want to start playing around with this. Um, first thing I would do would be to go file, make a copy, and then in the copy say file rename, and give it a name that starts with TMP. And that will hide it from Git, right? And so now you've got your own version of that notebook that you can that you can play with, okay? And so if you now do a Git pull and see that the original changed, it won't conflict with yours, and you can now see there are two different versions. Um, there are different ways of kind of dealing with this Jupyter notebook Git problem. Like everybody has it. One one is there are some hooks you can use that like remove all of the cell outputs before you commit to Git. But in, in this case, I actually want the outputs to be in the repo so you can read it on GitHub and see it. Um, so it's a minor issue, but it's uh, it's something which catches everybody. Um, uh, yes, Terence. Before we move on to interpretation of the random forest model, I wonder if we could summarize the relationship between the uh, hyperparameters on the random forest and its uh, effect on, you know, overfitting and dealing with collinearity and yada yada yada. Yeah, that sounds like a question born from experience. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I got to go back to lesson one RF. Um, if you're ever unsure about where I am, you can always see my top here, courses, ML1, Lesson 1, RF. Um, in terms of the 
hyperparameters that uh, are interesting, and I'm ignoring um, I'm ignoring like pre-processing, but just the actual hyperparameters. The first one of interest, I would say, is the set RF samples um, command, which determines how many rows are in each sample, so in each tree built, created from how many uh, rows. Is that tree or nodes? In each tree. Ah. Right. So before we start a new tree, we uh, either bootstrap a sample, so sampling with replacement from the whole thing, or we pull out a, a subsample of a, of a smaller number of rows. And then we build a tree from there. So, so step one is we've got our whole big data set, and we grab a few rows at random from it, and we turn them into a smaller data set, and then from that we build a tree. Right. So uh, that's the size of that is set RF samples. So when we change that size, um, let's say this originally had like a million rows, and we said set RF samples twenty thousand. Right, and then we're going to grow a tree from there. Um, assuming that the tree remains kind of balanced as we grow it, can somebody tell me how many layers deep would this tree be? And assuming we're growing it until every leaf is of size one, yes. Uh, log base two, two of twenty thousand. Right. Okay. So the the depth of the tree doesn't actually vary that much depending on the number of samples, right? Because it's it's uh, related to the log of the size. Um, can somebody tell me at the very bottom? So once we go all the way down to the bottom, how many leaf nodes would there be? Speak up. What? Twenty thousand, right? Because every single leaf node has a single thing in it. So we've got uh, obviously a linear relationship between the number of leaf nodes and the size of the sample. So when you decrease the sample size, um, it means that there are less kind of final decisions that can be made, right? So therefore the tree is, is going to be less rich in terms of what it can predict, because it's just making less different individual decisions. And it also is making less binary choices to get to those decisions. So therefore, setting RF samples lower is going to mean that you overfit less, but it also means that you're going to have a less accurate individual tree model, right? And so remember, the way Bryman, the inventor of Random Forest, described this is that you're trying to do two things when you build a model um, when you build a model with bagging. Um, one is that um, each individual tree, or as SK Learn would say, each individual estimator is as accurate as possible, right, on the training set. Um, so it's like each model is a strong predictive model. But then the across the estimators, The correlation between them is as low as possible, so that when you average them out together, you end up with something that generalizes. So by decreasing the set RF samples number, we are actually decreasing the power of the estimator and increasing the correlation. And so, is that going to result in a better or a worse validation set result for you? It depends, right? This is the kind of compromise which. You have to figure out when you do machine learning models. Um, can you pass that back there? If I base, if I put the OOB value equal to two, uh, so it is it is basically dividing every third. It ensures that uh, every third of the data won't be there in each tree, right? The OOB. Say again. OOB. If I put OOB equal to true yep. in random forest. Yep. So isn't that make sure that out of my entire data, 37% of data won't be there in every tree? So all OOB equals true does is it says um, whatever your subsample is, it might be a bootstrap sample or it might be a, 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 a subsample, take all of the other rows right, and put them into a 
for each tree and put them into a different data set and calculate the, the error on those. So it doesn't actually impact training at all, it just gives you an additional metric, which is the OOB error. So if you don't have a validation set, um, then this allows you to get kind of a, a, a quasi-validation set uh, for free. If I don't set out of sample, what is the default? If you what, sorry? If I don't set out of sample. Set out of uh, sample? The, if I don't set RF sample. RF sample? Yeah. So the, the default is um, actually if you say uh, reset RF samples, and that causes it to bootstrap. So it'll sample a new data set as big as the original one, but with replacement. Okay, so um, obviously the second benefit of set RF samples is that you can run uh, more quickly, and particularly if you're running on a really large data set, like 100 million rows, you know, it won't be possible to run it on the full data set, so you'd either have to pick a subsample of yourself before you start, or you set RF samples. Um, the second key parameter um, that we learnt about was min samples leaf. Okay, so if I changed min samples leaf before we assumed that min samples leaf was equal to one. All right, if I set it equal to two, then what would be my new depth? How deep would it be? Yes, log base 2, 20,000 minus 1. Okay, so uh, each time we double the min samples leaf, we're removing one layer from the tree. Um, and uh, Fang, I'll come back to you again since you're doing so well. How many um, leaf nodes would there be in that case? Fang? How many leaf nodes would there be in that case? 10,000. Okay, so we're going to be again dividing the number of leaf nodes by that number. So the result of increasing min samples leaf is that now each of our leaf nodes has more than one thing in, so we're going to get a, a, a more stable average that we're calculating in each tree. Okay, um, um, we've got a little bit less depth. Okay, we've got less decisions to make and we've got a smaller number of leaf nodes. So again, we would expect the result of that would be that each estimator would be less predictive, um, but the estimators would be also less correlated. So again, this might help us to avoid overfitting. Could you pass the uh, microphone over here, please? Uh, hi, Jeremy. I'm not sure if um, in that case every node will have t exactly two no, observations. No, it won't necessarily have exactly two, and, and I thank you for mentioning that. Uh, so it, it might try to do a split, and so one reason, well, what would be an example, Chen Shi, that you wouldn't split even if you had a hundred nodes? What might be a reason for that? Sorry, a hundred items in a leaf node. They're identical. They're all the same. Uh, they're all the same in terms of Ones. The independent or the dependent? Of the, um, the dependent. And in terms of the dependent, right? I mean, I guess either, but much more likely would be the dependent. So if you get to a leaf node where um, every single one of them has the same auction price or in classification, like every single one of them is a dog, then there is no split that you can do that's going to improve your information, right? And remember, information is the term we use in a kind of a, a general sense in Random Forest to describe. Um, uh, the amount of difference, about about of additional information we create from a split is like how much are we improving the model. So you'll often see this this word information gain, which means like how much better did the model get by adding an additional split point? Um, and it could be based on RMSE, or it could be based on cross entropy, or it could be based on how different are the standard deviations, or or whatever. So that's just a general term. Okay, so that's the second thing that we can do, which again, it's going to speed up our training because it's like one less set of decisions to make. Remember, even though there's one less set of decisions, those decisions like have as much data again as the previous set, so like each layer of the tree can take like twice as long as the previous layer, so it could definitely speed up training, uh, and it could definitely make it uh, generalized better. Um, so then the third one that we had was um, max features, 
Uh, who wants to tell me what Max Features uh, does? Uh, do you want to pass that back over there? Okay, Vinay. So Max Features determines how many features you are going to use in each tree. Uh, in this case, it's a fraction half. So you are going to use half half the features for each tree. Nearly right or kind of right. Can you be more specific or can somebody else be more specific? It's not exactly for each tree, Chen Shi. Is it for each tree randomly sample half of the uh, features? So not quite. It's not for each tree. So the, the, the set, do you want to pass it to Karen? So the set RF samples picks a, picks a subset of samples. A uh, subset of rows for each tree, but min samples leaf. Uh, sorry, but um, max features doesn't quite do that. It does something different. Uh, at each split, we will be picked. at each at each split. Se split. split split. It will. It will pick randomly half. Yeah, of right. Columns. So it kind of sounds like a small difference, but it's actually quite a different way of thinking about it. Which is, um, we do our set RF samples, so we pull out our sub sample or our bootstrap sample, and that's kept for the whole tree. Um, and we have all of the columns in there, right? And then with um, max features equals 0.5, at each point we then, at each split, we pick a different half of the features. And then here we'll take a, pick a different half of the features, and here we'll pick a different half of the features. And so the reason we do that is because we want the trees to be as, as rich as possible, right? So particularly like if you if you were only doing a small number of trees, like you had only 10 trees, and you picked the same column set all the way through the tree, you're not really getting much variety in what kind of things it can find. Okay, so this, this way, at least in theory, um, uh, seems to be something which is going to give us a better set of trees, is picking a different random subset of features uh, at every decision point. The overall. So the overall effect of max features, again, it's the same. It's going to mean that the tr each individual tree is probably going to be less accurate, um, but the trees are going to be more varied. And in particular here, this can be critical, because like imagine that you've got one feature that's just super predictive, it's so predictive that like every random subsample you look at always starts out by splitting on that same fe feature, then the trees are going to be very similar in the sense like they all have the same initial split, right? But there may be some other interesting initial splits because they create different interactions of variables. So by like half the time, that feature won't even be available at the top of the tree, so half, at least half the trees are going to have a different initial split. So it definitely can give us more variation, uh, and therefore again it can help us to create more generalized trees that have less correlation with each other, even though the individual trees probably won't be as predictive. In practice, uh, we actually looked at, uh, have a little picture of this, that as, as you add more trees, right, if you have max features equals none, that's going to use all the features every time, right? Then with like very, very few trees, that can still give you a pretty good uh, error. But as you create more trees, it's not going to help as much because they're all pretty similar because they're all trying every single variable. Um, where else if you say max features equals square root or max features equals log two, then uh, as we add more estimators, we see improvements. Okay, so there's an interesting interaction between those two. And this is from the sklearn docs, this cool little chart. Okay. Um, so then things which don't impact our, our training at all, n jobs simply says how many CPU, how many cores do we run on, okay, so it'll make it faster up to a point. Generally speaking, making this more than like eight or so may, may have diminishing returns. Um, minus one says use all of your cores. Um, so there's, there's, I don't know why the default is to only use one core, that seems weird to me. Um, you'll definitely get more performance by using more cores, because all of you have computers with more than one core nowadays. And then OOB score equals true um, simply allows us to see the OOB score. If you don't say that, it doesn't calculate it. Um, and particularly if you had set RF samples pretty small compared to a big data set, OOB is going to take forever to calculate. 
Uh, hopefully at some point we'll be able to fix the library so that doesn't happen. There's no reason it need be that way, but for right now that's that's how the library works. Okay. So there are our base, you know, key basic um, parameters that we can change. Um, there are more uh, that you can see in the docs or shift tab to have a look at them, um, but the ones you've seen are the ones that I've found useful to play with. Um, so feel free to play with others as well. Um, and generally speaking, you know, max features of, as I said, max features of like either um, uh, none uh, means all of them, um, um, about 0.5, uh, or um, square root, uh, or log, you know, kind of those three seem to work pretty well. And then for min samples, leaf, um, you know, I would generally try kind of 1, 3, 5, 10, 25, you know, 100. And like as you start doing that, if you notice by the time you get to 10 it's already getting worse, then there's no point going further. If you get to 100 it's still going better, then you can keep trying, right? But they're the kind of general amounts that most things seem to sit in. All right, so random forest interpretation um, is something which you could use to create some really cool Kaggle kernels. Now obviously one issue is the FastAI library is not available in Kaggle kernels, but if you look inside fastai.structured, right, and remember you can just use um, double question mark to look at the source code for something, or you can go into the editor to have a look at it, um, you'll see that most of the methods we're using are a small number of lines of code in this library and have no dependencies on anything, so you could just copy that little, if you need to use one of those functions, just copy it into your kernel. Uh, and, and if you do, just say, this is from the FastAI library, you can link to it on GitHub because it's, it's available on GitHub as open source, um, but you don't need to import the whole thing, right? So this is a cool trick, is that because you're the first people to learn how to use these tools, you can start to show things that other people haven't seen, right? So, for example, uh, this confidence based on tree variance is something which doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, feature importance definitely does, uh, and that's already in quite a lot of Kaggle kernels. If you're looking at a competition or a data set that where nobody's done feature importance, being the first person to do that is always going to win lots of votes, because it's like the most important thing, is like which features are important. Um, so last time we, let's just make sure we've got our tree, and our data, um, so we need to change this to add one extra thing, alright, so that's going to load in our data, split, there's our data, okay. So as I mentioned, when we do model interpretation, I tend to set RF samples to some subset, something small enough that I can run a model in under 10 seconds or so, um, because there's just no point run, running a super accurate model, 50,000 is more than enough uh, to, to see. You'll basically see each time you run an interpretation, you'll get the same results back. And so as long as that's true, then you, you're already using enough data. Okay. Um, So feature importance, uh, we learnt it works by randomly shuffling a column, um, each column one at a time, and then seeing how accurate the model, the pre-trained model, the model we've already built is, uh, when you pass it in uh, all the data as before but with one column shuffled. So um, <clears throat> some of the questions I got after class uh, kind of reminded me that it's very easy to underappreciate how powerful and kind of magic this approach is. Um, and so to explain, I'll, I'll mention a couple of the questions that I heard. Um, so one question was like, why don't we, or what if we just um, create, uh, took one column at a time and created a tree on just each one column at a time? So we've got our data set, it's got a bunch of columns, so why don't we just like grab that column and just build a tree from that, right? And then like we'll see which which column's tree is the most predictive. 
Um, can anybody tell me why what why that may give misleading results about feature importance? Karen. Uh, I also asked ask this question. Okay. <laughs> so we, we will be going to lose the interactions between the features. Yeah. If we just shuffle them, it will be at randomness and we will able to both capture the interactions and the importance of the feature at the same Great. time. Great. Yeah. And and so this issue of interactions is not a minor detail. It's like it's massively important. So like think about this um, bulldozers data set where for example where there's one uh, field called year made and there's one field uh, called sale date. And like if we think about it, it's pretty obvious that what matters is the combination of these two, which in other words is like uh, how old is the piece of equipment when it got sold? So if we only included one of these, we're going to massively underestimate how important that feature is. Now, here's a really important point though. If you, it's pretty much always possible to create a simple like logistic regression, which is as good as pretty much any random forest. If you know ahead of time exactly what variables you need, exactly how they interact, exactly how they need to be transformed, and so forth, right? So in this case, for example, we could have created a new field which was equal to year made, uh, sorry, uh, sale date or sale year minus year made, and we could have fed that to a model and got you know got that interaction for us. But the point is, we never know that. Like you, you never like you might have a guess about. I think some of these things are interacted in this way, and I think this thing we need to take the log and so forth. But you know, the truth is that the the way the world works, the causal structures, you know, they've got many many things interacting in many many subtle ways, right? And so that's why using trees, uh, whether it be gradient boosting machines or random forests, works so well. So um, can you pass that to Terence, please? One thing that uh, bit me uh, years ago was also uh, I tried that uh, doing one variable at a time, thinking, mm. oh, well, I'll figure out which one's most correlated with the dependent variable. But what it doesn't uh, pull apart is that what if all variables are basically copied the same variable, then they're all going to seem equally important, but in fact, it's really just one factor. Yeah, and that's also true here. So if we had like a column appeared twice, right? Then shuffling that column isn't going to make the model much worse, right? There'll be, if you think about like how it was built, some of the times, particularly if we had like max features is 0.5, then some of the times we're going to get version A of the column, some of the times we're going to get version B of the column. So like half the time um, shuffling version A of the column is going to make a tree a bit worse. Half the time, it's going to make you know column B will make it a bit worse, and so it'll show um, that both of those features are somewhat important, um, and it'll kind of like share the importance between the two features. And so this is why um, I, I write collinearity, but collinearity literally means that they're linearly related. Um, so this isn't quite right, um, but this is why. Having two variables that are related closely related to each other or more variables that are closely related to each other means that you will often uh, underestimate their importance using this this random forest technique um, Yes, Terence and so once we've shuffled and we get a uh, a new model What exactly are the units of these importances? Is this a change in the R squared? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the library we're using. Uh, so the units are kind of like, I, I never think about them. I, I just kind of know that like in this particular library, um, you know, 0 0.005 is often kind of a cutoff I would tend to use, but all I actually care about is, is this picture, right, which is the um, feature importance uh, ordered for each variable, and then kind of zooming in, turning it into a bar plot. And I'm kind of like, okay, you know, here they're all pretty flat, and I can see, okay, that's about 0 0.005, and so I remove them at that point and just see like the model. Hopefully, the validation score didn't get worse. And if it did get worse, I'll just increase this a little bit, 
uh, sorry, decrease this a little bit until it it doesn't get worse. Um, so yeah, uh, the 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 units of measure of this don't matter too much. Uh, and we'll learn later about a second way of doing variable importance. Uh, by the way, can you pass that over there? Uh, is one of the goals here to remove variables that uh, I guess your like your score will not get worse if you remove them, so you might as well get rid of them. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do next. So, um, so having looked at our feature importance plot, we said, okay, it looks like the ones like less than 0.005, you know, a kind of this long tail of boringness. So I said, let's try removing them, right? So let's just try grabbing the columns where it's greater than 0.005. And I said, let's create a new data frame called DF Keep, which is DF Train with just those kept columns. Created a new training and validation set with just those columns. Created a new random forest. And I looked to see how the validation set score and the validation set RMSC changed. And I found they got a tiny bit better. Um, so if they're about the same or a tiny bit better, then the thinking, my thinking is, well, this is uh, just as good a model, but it's now simpler. And so now when I redo the feature importance, there's less collinearity, right? And so in this case, I saw that year made went from being like quite a bit better than the next best thing, which was coupler system, to way better than the next best thing, right? And coupler system went from being like quite a bit more important than the next two to equally important to the next two. So it, it did seem to definitely change these feature importances and hopefully give me some more insight there. So how does that help our model in general? Like what does it mean that your maid is now way ahead of the others? Like what yeah, so we're going to dig us? into that kind of now, um, but basically it tells us um, um, that, for example, if we're looking for like how we're we dealing with missing values, is there noise in the data? Um, you know, if it's a high cardinality categorical variable, they're all different steps we would take. So, for example, if it was a high cardinality categorical variable that was originally a string, right? Like, for example, I think like maybe FI product class description. Um, I remember one of the um, ones we looked at the other day had like. First of all, was the type of vehicle, and then a hyphen, and then like the size of the vehicle. We might look at that and be like, okay, well that was an important column. Let's try like splitting it into two on hyphen, and then take that bit which is like the size of it and try and you know parse it and convert convert it into an integer. You know, we can try and do some feature engineering. And basically, until you know which ones are important, um, you don't know where to focus that feature engineering time. You can talk to your client. You know, uh, and say, uh, you know, or if, you know, in, if you're doing this inside your workplace, you go and talk to the folks that like were responsible for creating this data. So, in this, in the, if you were actually working at a bulldozer auction company, you might now go to the actual auctioneers and say, "I'm really surprised that coupler system seems to be driving people's pricing decisions so much. Why do you think that might be?" And they can say to you, "Oh, it's actually because." Only these classes of vehicles have coupler systems, or only this manufacturer has coupler systems. And so, frankly, this is actually not telling you about coupler systems, but about something else. And oh, hey, that reminds me. That's that that something else. We actually have measured that. Uh, it's in this different CSV file. I'll go get it for you. So it kind of helps you focus your attention. So I had a fun little problem this weekend. As you know, I introduced a couple of uh, crazy computations in a, into my random forest, and all of a sudden they're like, oh my god, these are the most important variables ever, squashing all of the others. But then I got a terrible score. Hmm. And then is that because, uh, now that I think I have my scores computed correctly, what I noticed is that the importance went through the roof, but the validation set uh, was still bad or got worse. Is that because somehow that computation allowed the training to almost like an identifier map exactly what the answer was going to be for training? But of course, that doesn't uh, generalize to the validation set. Is that what I is that what I observed? Okay, so there's um, 
there's two reasons why your validation score might not be very good. Um, let's go up here. Okay, so we get these five numbers, right? Uh, the um, RMSE of the training, validation, R squared of the training, validation, and the R squared of the OOB. Okay, so there's two reasons, uh, and really in the end what we care about like for this Kaggle competition is the RMSE of the validation set, assuming we've created a good validation set. So uh, in Terence's case, he's saying this number, this, this thing I care about, um, got worse when I did some feature engineering. Why is that? Okay, there's two possible reasons. Uh, reason one is that you're overfitting. If you're overfitting, then your OOB will also get worse. Uh, if you're doing a huge data set with a small set RF sample so you can't use an OOB, then instead um, create a second validation set which is a random sample, okay, and, and do that, right? So in other words, if your OOB or your random sample validation set is, has got much worse, then you must be overfitting. Um, I think in your case, Terence, it's unlikely that's the problem, because random forests don't overfit that badly. Like it's very hard to get them to overfit that badly, unless you use some really weird parameters like only one estimator, for example. Like once you've got 10 trees in there, there should be enough variation that you're, you, know, you can definitely overfit, but not so much that you're going to destroy your validation score by adding a variable. So I think you'll find that's probably not the case, but it's easy to check. And if it's not the case, then you'll see that your OOB score or your random sample validation score hasn't got worse. Okay, so the second reason your validation score can get worse, if your OOB score hasn't got worse, you're not overfitting, but your validation score has got worse, that means you're, you're doing something that is true in the training set, but not true in the validation set. So this can only happen when your validation set is not a random sample. So for example, in this bulldozers competition or in the grocery shopping competition, we've intentionally made a validation set that's for a different date range. It's for the most recent two weeks, right? And so if something different happened in the last two weeks to the previous weeks, um, then uh, you could totally break your validation set. So for example, if there was some kind of unique identifier, um, which is like uh, different in the two date periods, then you could learn to identify things using that identifier in the training set, but then like the last two weeks may have a totally different set of IDs with a different set of behavior, could get a lot worse. Um, yeah, what you're describing is not common though. Um, and so I'm a bit skeptical it might be a bug, um, but hopefully there's enough uh, things you can now use to figure out if it is a bug. Uh, we'll be interested to hear what you learn. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's feature importance. And so um, I'd like to compare that to uh, how feature importance is normally done in industry and in academic communities outside of machine learning, like in psychology and economics and so forth. And generally speaking, people uh, in those kind of environments tend to use uh, uh, some kind of linear regression, logistic regression, general linear models. Um, so they start with their data set and they basically say, well, that was weird. Um, oh, okay. So they start with their data set uh, and they say, I'm going to assume that I know the kind of parametric relationship between my independent variables and my dependent variable. So I'm going to assume that it's a linear relationship, say, or it's a linear relationship with a link function like a sigmoid logistic regression, say. And so assuming that I already know that, I can now write this as an equation, so if I've got like x1, x2, so forth, right, I can say, all right, my uh, y values are equal to uh, a x1 plus b x2 equals y, and therefore I can 
find out the feature importance easily enough by just looking at these coefficients and saying like which one's the highest, Partic particularly if you've normalized the data first, right? So there's this kind of trope out there. It's it's very common, which is that like this is somehow more accurate or more pure or in some way better way of doing feature importance. Um, but that couldn't be further from the truth, right? If you think about it, if you were like, if you were missing an interaction, right, or if you were missing a transformation you needed, um, or if you have any way been anything less than 100% perfect in all of your pre-processing so that your model is the absolute correct truth of this situation, right, unless you've got all of that correct, then your coefficients are wrong. Right, your coefficients are telling you in your totally wrong model. This is how important those things are, right? Which is basically meaningless. So, um, where I'll say the random forest feature importance, it's telling you in this extremely high parameter, highly flexible functional form with few, if any, statistical assumptions. This is your feature importance, right? Um, so I would be very cautious, you know, and, and again, I, I can't stress this enough, when you, when you leave MSAN, when you leave this program, you are much more often going to see people talk about logistic regression coefficients than you're going to see them talk about random forest variable importance, and every time you see that happen, you should be very, very, very skeptical of what you're seeing. Anytime you read a paper in economics or in psychology, or the marketing department tells you they did this regression or whatever, every single time those coefficients are going to be massively biased by any issues in the model. Um, furthermore, if they've done so much pre-processing that actually the model is pretty accurate, then now you're looking at coefficients that are going to be of like a coefficient of some principal component from a PCA, or a coefficient of some distance from some cluster or something, at which point they're very, very hard to interpret anyway, they're not actual variables, right? So they're kind of the two options I've seen when people try to use classic statistical techniques to do a kind of a, a variable importance equivalent. Um, I think things are starting to change, um, slowly, you know, there are, there are some fields that are starting to realize that this is totally the wrong way to do things, but it's, it's been, you know, nearly 20 years since random forests appeared, so it, 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 it takes a long time. You know, people say that the only way that um, knowledge really advances is when the previous generation dies, um, and that's kind of true, right? Like, particularly academics, you know, they make a career of being good at a particular sub thing, and um, you know, often don't. It you know, it's not until the next generation comes along that that people notice that oh, that's actually no longer a good way to do things, and I think that's what's happened here. Um, okay, so uh, we've got now a model which isn't really any better as a, a predictive accuracy wise, um, but it's kind of we're getting a good sense that there seems to be like four main important things uh, when it was made, the coupler system, its size, and uh, its product classification. Okay, so that's cool. Um, there is something else that we can do, however, which is we can do something called uh, one hot encoding. Um, so this is kind of where we're talking about categorical variables. So remember a categorical variable, let's say we had like um, uh, a string, hi, um, and remember the order we got was kind of back weird, it was hi, low, medium, so it was in alphabetical order by default, right? Was there our original category for like usage band or something? Uh, and so we mapped it to 0, 1, two, right? And so by the time it gets into our data frame, it's now a number. So the random forest doesn't know that it was originally a category. It's just a number, right? So when the random forest is built, it basically says, oh, is it greater than one or not? Or is it greater than naught or not? You know, basically the two possible decisions it could have made. Um, for a um, for something with like five or six bands, you know, um, it could be that just one of the levels of a category is actually interesting, right? So like if it was like very high, uh, very low, 
um, or, or unknown, right? Then we've now got like six levels, and maybe the only thing that mattered was whether it was like unknown. Maybe like not knowing its size somehow impacts the price. And so if we wanted to be able to recognize that, and particularly if like it just so happened that the way that the numbers were coded was that unknown ended up in the middle, Right? Then what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, there is a difference between these two groups, you know, less than or equal to two versus greater than two, uh, and then when it gets into this this leaf here, it's going to say, oh, there's a difference between these two, between less than four and greater than or equal to four, and so it's going to take two splits to get to the point where we can see that it's actually unknown that matters. Um, so this is a little inefficient, and we're kind of like wasting tree computation. And like wasting tree computation matters because every time we do a split, we're halving the amount of data at least that we have to do more analysis. So it's going to make our tree less rich, uh, less effective, if we're not giving the data in a way that's kind of convenient for it to do the work it needs to do. So what we could do instead is create six columns. We could create a column called is very high, is very low, is high, is unknown, is low, is medium, and each one would be ones and zeros, right? So either one or a zero. So we had six columns. Um, just one moment. Um, so having added six additional columns to our data set, um, the random forest uh, now has the ability to pick one of these and say like, oh, let's have a look at is unknown. There's one possible split I can do, which is one versus zero. Let's see if that's any good, right? So it actually now has the ability in a single step to pull out a single category level. And so um, uh, this this kind of coding is called one hot encoding. And for Many many types of machine learning model. This is like Necessary something like this is necessary like if you're doing logistic regression You can't possibly put in a categorical variable that goes not through five because there's obviously no linear relationship between that and anything right um, so one hot encoding a lot of people incorrectly assume that all machine learning requires one hot encoding um, uh, but in this case, I'm going to show you how we could use it optionally and see whether it might uh, improve things sometimes. Yeah. Hi, Jeremy. So if we have six categories, like in this case, would there be any problems with adding a column for each of the categories? So, because in, in linear regression, we said we had to do it. Like if there's six categories, we should only do it for five of them. Yeah. So. Um, it, it you certainly can say, oh, we let's not worry about adding is medium because we can infer it from the other five. Um, um, I would say include it anyway, um, because like rather than the, otherwise the random forest would have to say is very high no, is very low no, is high no, is unknown low, is low no, okay and finally I'm, I'm there, right? So it's like five decisions to get to that point. So um, the reason in um, uh, Linear models that you you need to not include one is because linear models hate collinearity, um, but we don't care about about that here. So we can uh, do one hot encoding um, uh, easily enough, and the way we do it is we pass um, one extra parameter to procdf, which is what's the max number of categories. Right. So uh, if we say it's seven, then anything with um, less than seven levels uh, is going to be turned into a one hot encoded bunch of columns. Right. So in this case, this has got six levels, so this would be one hot encoded. Where else, like zip code has more than six levels, and so that would be left as a number. And so generally speaking, you obviously probably wouldn't want to one hot encode zip code, right? Because that's just going to create Masses of data, memory problems, computation problems, and so forth. Right. So, so this is like a, another parameter that you can play around with. So, if I do that, um, 
uh, try it out, run the random forest as per usual. You can see what happens to the um, R squared of the validation set and to the RMSE of the validation set. And in this case, I found it got a little bit worse. Uh, this isn't always the case, and it's going to depend on your data set. You know, do you have a data set where you know single categories tend to be quite important, um, or not? And in this particular case, it didn't make it more predictive. However, um, what it did do is that we now have different features, right? So procdf puts um, the name of the variable and then an underscore and then the level name. And so interestingly, it turns out that where else before it said that enclosure was somewhat important, when we do it as one hot encoded, it actually says enclosure erops with a C is the most important thing. So, for at least the purpose of like interpreting your model, you should always try one hot encoding, you know, quite a few of your variables. And so I often find somewhere around six or seven is pretty good. Um, you can try like making that number as high as you can so that it doesn't take forever to compute and the feature importance doesn't include like really tiny levels that aren't interesting. So that's kind of up to you to play it play around with. Um, but in this case, like this is actually, I found this very interesting. It clearly tells me I need to find out what enclosure erupts with AC is. Why is it important? Because like uh, it means nothing to me, right? And but it's the most important thing, so I should go figure that out. Uh, Savannah had a question. Can you plus that. So can you explain how changing the max number of categories works? Because for me, it just seems like there's five categories. There's five categories. How oh yeah, sorry. Them? So it's it's just like. Um, all it's doing is saying like, okay, here's a column called zip code, here's a column called usage band, and here's a column sex, right? I don't know, whatever, right? And so like zip code has whatever, 5,000 levels. The number of levels in a category, we call its cardinality, okay? So it has a cardinality of 5,000. Usage band maybe has a cardinality of 6. Sex has maybe a cardinality of 2. So when procdf goes through and says, okay, this is a categorical variable, should I one-hot encode it? It checks the cardinality against max and cats and says, oh, 5,000 is bigger than 7, so I don't one-hot encode it. And then it goes to usage band. 6 is less than 7, I do one-hot encode it goes to sex, 2 is less than 7, I do one hot encode it. So it just says for each variable, um, how do I decide whether to one hot encode it or not. In procdf, we are keeping both label encodes and one hot encodes, right? No, once we decide to one hot encode, it, no, it, it does not keep the original variable. Uh, wouldn't the fact that uh, maybe the best split will be an interval? And we would need a label encode. Well, you don't need a label encode if the if so if the best is an interval, it can approximate that with multiple mm -hmm. one-hot encoding levels. So in terms of efficiency, it will be yeah. Same. So like you know, it's a the 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 truth is that each column is going to have some you know uh, different you know should it be label encoded or not you know which you could make on a case by case basis. I find in practice. It's just not that sensitive to this, and so I find like just using a single number for the whole data set has, gives me what I need. Um, but you know, if you were building a model that really had to be as awesome as possible, and you had lots and lots of time to do it, you can go through man. You know, don't use procdf. You can go through manually and decide which things to to use dummies or not. You'll <coughs> you'll see in 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 the code uh, if you look at the code for procdf. Proc df, right? Like, I, I never want you to feel like um, the code that happens to be in the fast AI library is the code that you're limited to, right? So where is that done? Um, you can see that um, uh, the max n cat gets passed to numericalize, and numericalize. 
simply checks, okay, is it a numeric type, and is the number of categories either not been passed to us at all, or we've got more unique va va values than there are categories, and if so, we're going to use the categorical codes. Um, so for any column where that's uh, where it's skipped over that, right? So it's remained as a category. Then at the very end, we just go pandas dot get dummies. We pass in the whole data frame. And so pandas dot get dummies. You pass in the whole data frame. It checks for anything that's still a categorical variable, and it turns it into a dummy variable, which is another way of saying a one-hot encoding. So you know, with that kind of approach, you can easily override it and do your own dummy verification variableization. Did you have a question? Uh, so some data has a quite obvious order, like if you have like a rating system like good, bad, uh, poor, or whatever, things like that, um, there's an order to that, and destroying that order by doing the dummy variable thing probably won't work in your benefit. So is there a way to just force it to leave alone one variable, just like convert it beforehand yourself? Um, not, not in the library. Um, and to remind you, like unless we explicitly do something about it, we're not going to get that order. So when we um, when we import the data, so this is in lesson one RF. We showed how by default the categories are ordered alphabetically, and we have the ability to order them properly. So. Yeah, if you've actually made an effort to turn your ordinal variables into proper ordinals, um, using procdf can destroy that if you have max n cats. So the simple thing, the simple way to avoid that is if we know that we always want to use the codes for usage band rather than the um, you know like never one hot encode it, you could just go ahead and replace it, right? You could just say okay. Let's just go df.usageBand equals df.usageBand.cat.codes, and it's now an integer, and so it'll never get changed. All right. So we kind of have already seen how variables, which are basically measuring the same thing, can kind of confuse our variable importance. Um, and they can also make our random forest slightly less good because it requires like more computation to do the same thing There's more columns to check um, So uh, I'm going to do some more work to try and remove redundant features um, And the way I do that is to do something called a dendrogram um, And it's a kind of uh, hierarchical clustering so cluster analysis um, is something where you're trying to look at objects They can be either rows in a data set or columns and find which ones are similar to each other So often you'll see people particularly talking about cluster analysis They normally refer to rows of data and they'll say like oh, let's plot it Right and like oh, there's a cluster and there's a cluster right um, a common type of cluster analysis uh, time to permitting we may get around to talking about this in some detail is called k-means um, Which is basically where you assume that you don't have any labels at all uh, and you take basically uh, uh, a couple of data points at random and you gradually Find the ones that are near to it and move them closer and closer to centroids and you kind of repeat it again and again um, And it's an iterative approach that you basically tell it how many clusters you want and it'll tell you where it thinks the clusters are um, a really And I don't know why, but I really underused technique. Um, 20, 30 years ago, it was much more popular than it is today. Is um, hierarchical clustering, hierarchical, um, also known as agglomerative clustering. And in hierarchical or agglomerative clustering, we basically look at every pair of options, uh, every pair of objects, and say, okay, which two objects are the closest? Right. So in this case, we might go, okay. Um, those two objects are the closest, and so we've kind of like delete them and replace it with the midpoint of the two. And then, okay, here are the next two closest. We delete them and replace them with the midpoint of the two. And you keep doing that again and again, right? Uh, since we're kind of removing points and replacing them with their averages, 
uh, you're gradually reducing the number of points by pairwise combining. And the cool thing is you can plot that like so, right? So if rather than looking at points, you look at variables, we can say, okay, which two variables are the most similar? And it says, okay, sale year and sale elapsed are very similar. So the uh, kind of horizontal axis here is how similar are the two points that are being compared, right? So if they're closer to the right, it means they're very similar. So sale year and sale elapsed have been combined, and they were very similar. What are you measuring? What is the similarity? Um, Again, it's like who cares, you know, it'll be like a correlation coefficient or something like that, you know um, In this particular case what I actually did um, So you get to, to tell it um, so in this case I actually used uh, Spearman's R so uh, uh, You guys familiar with correlation coefficients already? Correlation? So correlation is, is almost exactly the same as the R squared, right? Um, Uh, but it's between two variables rather than a variable and its prediction. Um, the problem with um, a normal correlation is that um, if the I create a new workbook here. Um, if you have data that looks like this, then you can do a correlation and you'll get a good result, right? But if you've got data which looks like This right and you try and do a correlation uh, it assumes linearity. That's not very good, right? So there's a thing called a rank correlation a really simple idea. It's replace every point By its rank right so instead of like so we basically say okay. This is the smallest so we'll call that one two there's the next one three here's the next one four five right so you just replace every number by its rank Right? And then you do the same for the y-axis. So we'll call that one, two, three, and so forth. Right? And so then you do like a new plot where you don't plot the data, but you plot the rank of the data. And if you think about it, the rank of this data set is going to look an exact line. Because every time something was greater on the x-axis, it was also greater on the y-axis. So if we do a correlation On the rank, that's called a rank correlation. Okay. Um, so, because I want to find the um, columns that are similar in a way that the random forest would find them similar, random forests don't care about linearity; they just care about ordering. So, a rank correlation is the the right way to think about that. So, um, Spearman's R is is The name of the most common rank correlation, but you can literally replace the data with its rank and chuck it at the regular correlation and you'll get basically the same answer. The only difference is in how ties are handled. It's a pretty minor issue. Um, like if you had like a full parabola in that rank correlation, you'll you will not right rely right. It has to be so. has to be monotonic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, once I've got a correlation matrix, uh, there's basically a, a couple of standard steps you do to turn that into a, a dendrogram, which I have to look up uh, on Stack Overflow each time I do it. Um, you basically turn it into a distance matrix, and then you create something that tells you, you know, which things are connected to which other things hierarchically. So uh, this kind of uh, these two and this step here, are like. Just three standard steps that you always have to do to create um, a dendrogram, um, and so then you can plot it. Uh, and so, all right. So, sale year and sale elapse seem to be measuring basically the same thing, at least in terms of rank, which is not surprising because sale elapsed is the uh, number of days since the first day in my data set. Uh, so obviously, these two are nearly entirely correlated with some ties. Grouse attracts and hydraulics flow and coupler system all seem to be measuring the same thing And this is interesting because remember coupler system it said was super important Right, and so this rather supports our hypothesis that it's nothing to do with whether it's a coupler system But whether it's whatever kind of vehicle it is that has these kind of features um, Product group and product groups desk seem to be measuring the same thing FI base model and FI model desk seem to be measuring the same thing and so 
once we get past that Everything else like suddenly the things are further away. So I'm probably going to not worry about those So we're going to look into these one two three four groups that are very similar. Could you pass that over there? Um, is it implied in that graph that the similarity between stick length and enclosure is higher than with stick length and anything that's higher? Yeah, pretty much. I mean it It's a little hard to interpret, but given that stick length and enclosure don't join up until way over here um, it, it would strongly suggest that then that they're a long way away from each other um, Otherwise you would expect them to have joined up earlier. I mean it, it's it's possible to construct like a synthetic data set where you kind of end up joining things that were close to each other through different paths so you've got to be a bit careful but I think it's fair to, to us probably assume that stick length or enclosure are probably very different. So they are very different, but would they be more similar than, for example, stick length and sale day of year? Day of, day of Which year. Which is at the very top. No, there's nothing to suggest that here, because like the key point is to notice where they sit in this tree, right? And they both they, they sit in totally different halves of the tree. Okay, thank you. Um, but really to actually know that the best way would be to actually look at the SPM and R correlation matrix Right if you just want to know how similar is this thing to this thing the SPM and R correlation matrix tells you that can you pass that over there? So today's we are passing the data frame, right? Say again Uh, we are passing the data frame or are we passing the model to it? This is just a data frame. So we're passing in DF keep So that's the data frame containing the whatever it was 30 or so features that our random forest thought was interesting So there's no random forest being used here the measure the, the distance measure is being done entirely on rank correlation So what I then do is I take these these groups right And I create a little function that I call get out of band score, right? Which is it does a random forest um, for some data frame. Um, uh, I make sure that I've uh, taken that data frame and split it into a training and validation set, uh, and then I call fit and return the OOB score, right? So um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try removing each one of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or so. Variables one at a time and see which ones I can remove and it doesn't make the OOB score get worse um, And each time I run this I get slightly different results So actually it looks like last time I had seven things not not eight things So you can see I just do a loop through each of the things that I'm thinking like maybe I could get rid of this because it's redundant and I print out the column uh, name and the OOB score of a model that is trained after dropping That one column Okay, so the OOB score on my whole data frame is 0.89 and then after dropping each one of these things They're basically none of them get much worse sale elapsed is getting quite a bit worse than sale year But like it looks like pretty much everything else I can drop with like only like a third decimal place uh, problem So obviously though, you've got to remember the dendrogram like let's take FI model desk and FI base model Right, they're very similar to each other, right? So what this says isn't that I can get rid of both of them, right? I can get rid of one of them because they're basically measuring the same thing Okay, so so then I try it. I say okay. Let's try getting rid of one from each group say all year FI base model and Grouser tracks Okay And like let's now have a look. It's like okay. I've gone from 0.890 to 0.888 It's like again so close as to be meaningless. So that sounds good uh, simpler is better So I'm now going to drop those columns from my data frame um, And then I can try running the full model again, and I can see you know so reset RF samples Um, means I'm using my whole data frame uh, my whole uh, bootstrap sample uh, Use 40 estimators and I've got point nine oh seven. Okay, so I've, I've now got a, a model which is smaller and simpler uh, and I'm getting a, a good score for um, So at this point 
I've now got rid of as many columns as I feel I comfortably can, ones that either didn't have a good feature importance or were highly related to other variables and the model didn't get worse significantly when I, when I removed them. So now I'm at the point where I want to try and really understand my data better by taking advantage of the model. And we're going to use something called partial dependence. And again, this is something that you could like use in a Kaggle kernel, and lots of people are going to appreciate this because almost nobody knows about partial dependence. And it's a very, very powerful technique. What we're going to do is we're going to find out for the features that are important, how do they relate to the dependent variable? Right? So let's have a look, right? So let's again, since we're doing interpretation, we'll set set RF samples to 50,000 to run things quickly. Um, we'll take our data frame, um, we'll get our feature importance, and notice that we're using um, uh, max and cat because I'm actually pretty interested in terms of for, for interpretation and seeing the individual levels. Um, and so here's the top 10. And so let's try and learn more about those top 10. So year made is the second most important. So one obvious thing we could do would be to plot um, um, year made uh, against sale elapsed because as we've talked about already like it just seems to make sense they're both important But it seems very likely that they kind of combine together to find like how old was the The product when it was sold so we could try plotting year made against sale elapsed to see how they relate to each other and when we do we get this very ugly graph and it shows us that year made actually has a whole bunch that are a thousand Right, so clearly, you know, this is where I would tend to go back to the client or whatever and say, okay, I'm guessing that these bulldozers weren't actually made in the year 1000, and they would presumably say to me, oh yes, they're ones where we don't know when it was made. You know, uh, maybe before 1986 we didn't track that, or maybe um, the things that are sold in Illinois don't have that data provided, or or whatever. They would tell us some reason. So. Um, in order to uh, understand this plot better, I'm just going to remove them from this interpretation section of the analysis. So I'm just going to say, okay, let's just grab things where year made is greater than 1930. Okay. So let's now look at the relationship between year made and sale price. And there's a really great um, uh, package called ggplot. Um, ggplot originally was an R package. GG stands for the Grammar of Graphics. And the grammar of graphics is like this uh, very powerful way of thinking about um, how to produce charts in a very flexible way. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about it much in this class, there's lots of information available online, um, but I, I definitely recommend it uh, as, a, as a great package to use. ggplot, uh, which you can pip install, uh, it's part of the FastAI environment already. Um, uh, ggplot um, in Python has basically the same parameters and API as the R version. The R version is much better documented, so you should read its documentation to learn how to use it. Um, but basically you say, okay, I want to uh, create a plot um, of um, this data frame. Now when you create plots, um, most of the data sets you're using are going to be too big to plot. Uh, as in like if you do a scatter plot, it'll create so many dots that it's just a big mess um, It'll take forever and remember when you're plotting things You just you're you're looking at it, right? So there's no point plotting something with a hundred million samples when if you only used a hundred thousand samples It's going to be pixel identical Right, so that's why I call get sample first. So get sample just grabs a random sample. Okay, so I'm just going to grab 500 points um, for now. Okay, so I've got to grab 500 points um, from my data frame. I've got to plot uh, year made against sale price. AES stands for aesthetic. This is the basic way that you set up your columns in ggplot. Okay, so this says to plot these columns from this data frame, and then you, there's this weird thing in ggplot where plus means basically add chart elements. Okay, so I'm going to add a smoother. Um, so most of the very very often you'll find that a scatter plot is very hard to see what's going on because there's too much randomness Whereas a smoother basically creates a little linear regression for every little subset 
of the graph. And so it kind of joins it up and allows you to see a nice smooth curve. Okay, um, so this is like the main way that I tend to look at univariate relationships. And uh, by adding standard error equals true, it also shows me the confidence interval of this smoother, right? Um, so low S stands for locally weighted regression, which is this idea of like doing kind of like doing lots of little um, linear regressions. Um, so we can see here the relationship between year made and sale price is kind of all over the place, right? Which is like not really what I would expect. I would I would have expected that more recent um, stuff that sold more recently uh, would probably be like more expensive because of inflation and because they're like more current models and so forth. And the problem is that when you look at a univariate relationship like this, there's a whole lot of um, collinearity going on, a whole lot of interactions that are being lost. So for example, why did the price drop here? Is it actually because like things made between 1991 and 1997 are less valuable? Or is it actually because most of them were also sold during that time and actually there was like maybe a recession then? Or maybe it was like the product sold during that time, a lot more people were buying types of vehicle that were less expensive. Like there's all kinds of reasons for that. And so again, as data scientists, one of the things you're going to keep seeing is that um, at the companies that you join, people will come to you with, with these kind of univariate charts where they'll say like, oh my god, our sales in Chicago have, have disappeared, they've got really bad, or people aren't clicking on this ad anymore, and they'll show you a chart that looks like this, and they'll be like, what happened? And most of the time you'll find the answer to the question, what happened, is that there's something else going on, right? So actually, oh, in Chicago last week, actually, we were doing a new promotion, and that's why our you know revenue went down. It's not because people aren't buying stuff in Chicago anymore, it's because the prices were lower, for instance. So what we really want to be able to do is say, well, what's the relationship between sale price and year made, all other things being equal? So all other things being equal basically means if we sold something in 1990 versus 1980, and it was exactly the same thing to exactly the same person and exactly the same auction, so on and so forth, what would have been the difference in price? And so to do that, we do something called a partial dependence plot. And this is a partial dependence plot. There's a really nice library which nobody's heard of um, called PDP, um, which does these partial dependence plots. And what happens is this. We've got our sample of 500 data points, right? And we're going to do something really interesting. We're going to take each one of those hundred randomly chosen auctions, and we're going to make a little data set out of it, right? So, like, here's our here's our uh, come on, one more. Here's our data set of like 500 auctions, and here's our columns. One of which is the thing that we're interested in, which is year made. So here's year made. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're now going to try and create a chart where we're going to try and say all other things being equal, in 1960, uh, how much did uh, bulldozers cost? How much did things cost in auctions? And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to replace the year made column with 1960. We're going to copy in the value 1960 again and again and again all the way down. right? So now every row, the year made is 1960. And all of the other data is going to be exactly the same. And we're going to take our random forest, and we're going to pass all this through our random forest to predict the sale price. So that will tell us, for everything that was auctioned, how much do we think it would have been sold for if that thing was made in 1960. And that's what we're going to plot here. All right, that's the price we're going to plot here. And then we're going to do the same thing for 1961. All right, we're going to replace all these and do 1961. Yeah. So, no, well, to be clear, um, We've already fit the random forest. Yes. And then 
we're just passing a new year and seeing what it determines the price should be? Yeah. So this is a lot like the way we did feature importance. But rather than randomly shuffling the column, we're going to replace the column with a constant value. Right? So randomly shuffling the column tells us uh, how accurate it is when you don't use that column anymore. Uh, replacing the whole column with a constant tells us, or estimates for us, how much we would have sold that product for uh, in that auction, on that day, in that place, if that product had been made in 1961. Right? So we basically then take the average of all of the sale prices that we calculate from that random forest. And so we do it in 1961, and we get this value. right? So what the partial dependence plot here shows us is each of these light blue lines actually is showing us all 500 lines. So it says um, for row number one in our data set, um, if we sold it in 1960, we're going to index that to zero, right? So we'll call that zero, right? Um, if we sold it in 1970, that particular um, auction would have been here. If we sold it in 1980, it would have been here. If we sold it in 1990, it would have been here. So we actually plot all 500 um, predictions of how much every one of those 500 uh, auctions would have gone for if we replace it, if we replace the year made with each of these different values. And then, then this dark line here is the average. Right? So this tells us uh, how much would we have sold uh, on average all of those auctions for if all of those products were actually made in 1985, 1990, 1993, 1994, and so forth. And so you can see what's happened here is at least in the period where we have a reasonable amount of data, which is since 1990, this is basically a totally straight line. Which is what you would expect, right? Because if it was sold on the same date, and it was the same kind of tractor, and it was sold to the same person in the same auction house, then you would expect more recent vehicles to be more expensive because of inflation and because they're they're newer. Right? They're not they're not as second hand. And you would expect that relationship to be roughly linear. And that's exactly what we're finding. Okay? So by removing all of these externalities, it often allows us to see the truth much more clearly. Uh, there's a question at the back. Can you pass that back there? You're done. Okay. So um, um, this uh, this partial dependence plot concept is something which um, is using a random forest to get us a more clear interpretation of what's going on in our data. And so the steps were to first of all look at the feature importance. To tell us like which things do we think we care about, and then to use the partial dependence plot to tell us what's going on on average. Right? There's another cool thing we can do with PDP is we can use clusters. And what clusters does is it uses cluster analysis to look at all of these, each one of the 500 rows, and say, um, do some of those 500 rows kind of move in the same way? And like we can kind of see, it seems like there's a whole lot of rows that kind of go down and then up, and there seems to be a bunch of rows that kind of go up and then go flat. Like it does seem like there are some kind of different types of behaviors being hidden. And so here is the result of doing that cluster analysis, right? Is we still get the same average, but it says here are kind of the five most common shapes that we see. Uh, and this is where you could then go in and say, all right. It looks like some kinds of vehicle, um, actually, after 1990, their prices are pretty flat, and before that they were pretty li linear. Some kinds of vehicle are kind of exactly the opposite, and so like different kinds of vehicle have these different shapes, right? And so this is something you could dig into. I think there was one at the back. Oh, you could. Okay. So what are we going to do with this information? Well, the purpose of interpretation is to learn about a data set and so why do you want to learn about a data set it's because you it's because you want to do something with it right so in this case um, it's not so much something if you're trying to win a Kaggle competition I mean it can be a little bit like some of these insights might make you realize oh I could transform this variable or create this interaction or whatever um, obviously feature importance is super important for Kaggle competitions um, but this one's much more for like real life 
you know. So this is when you're talking to somebody and you say to them like, um, okay, those plots you've been showing me, which actually say that like there was this kind of dip in prices, you know, based on like things made between 1990 and 1997, there wasn't really. You know, actually, it was they were increasing. There was actually something else going on at that time. Um, you know, it's, it's basically the thing that allows you to say, like, for whatever this outcome I'm trying to drive in my business is, this is how something's driving it. Right. So, if it's like um, uh, I'm looking at, you know, kind of advertising technology, what's driving clicks, then I'm actually digging in to say, okay, this is actually how clicks are being driven, this is actually the variable that's driving it, this is how it's related, so therefore we should change our behavior in this way. So that's really the goal of any model. Uh, I guess there's two possible goals. One goal of a model is just to get the predictions, like if you're doing hedge fund trading, you probably just want to know what the price of that equity is going to be. If you're doing insurance, you probably just want to know how much claims that guy's going to have. But probably most of the time, you're actually trying to change something about how you do business, how you do marketing, how you do logistics. So the thing you actually care about is how the things are related to each other. All right, I'm sorry, can you explain again, when you scroll up and you were looking at the sale price year May, looking at the entire model, and you saw that dip, the graph right above, and you said something about that dip didn't signify what we thought it did. Can you explain why yeah. about that? So this is like a classic boring univariate plot, right? So this is basically just taking all of the dots, all of the auctions, plotting year made against sale price, and we're going to just fitting a rough average through them. And so um, it's true that products made between 1992 and 1997 on average in our data set are being sold for less. So, like very often in business, you'll hear somebody look at something like this, and they'll be like, "Oh, we should um, we should stop auctioning equipment that is made in that year in those years because like we're getting less money for, it, for example." But if the truth actually is that during those years, um, uh, it's just that people were making more um, small industrial equipment. Where you would expect it to be sold for less, and actually our profit on it is just as high, for instance. Or during those years, it's not that it's not things made during those years now would have um, would be cheaper. It's that during those years, when we were selling things in those years, they were cheaper because like there was a recession going on. So if you're trying to like actually take some action based on this. You probably don't just care about the fact that things made in those years are cheaper on average, but how does that impact today? You know, so so this this approach where we actually say let's try and remove all of these externalities. So if something is sold on the same day to the same person of the same kind of vehicle, then actually how does year made impact price? And so this basically says, for example, if I am Deciding what to buy at an auction, then this is kind of saying to me, okay, like getting a more recent vehicle on average really does, on average, give you more money, um, which is not what the kind of the the naive univariate plot said. Uh, can pass it to Tyler. Um, so. Uh... For like this bulldozer, uh, bulldozers made in 2010 probably are not close to the type of bulldozers that were made in 1960. Right. And if you're taking something that would be so very different, like a 2010 bulldozer, and then trying to just drop it to say, oh, if it was made in 1960, that may cause poor uh, prediction at the point because it's so yeah, far outside absolutely. of the training. Set. Absolutely. So, you know, I think that's a good point. It's, you know, it's a a limitation of a random forest is if you've got a kind of data point that's like of a kind, you know, which is kind of like in a part of the space that it's not seen before, like maybe people didn't put air conditioning really in bulldozers in 1960 and you're saying how much would this Bulldozer with air conditioning have gone for in 1960. You don't really have any information to know that. So, you know, you it's a uh, 
it's it's this is still the best technique I know of, but it's it's not perfect. Um, and you know, you kind of hope that the trees are still going to find some useful truth, even though it hasn't seen that combination of features before. Um, but yeah, it's something to be aware of. So you can um, also do uh, the same thing uh, in a PDP interaction plot. And a PDP interaction plot, which is really what I'm trying to get to here, is like how does sale elapsed and year made together impact price? And so if I do a PDP interaction plot, it shows me sale elapsed versus price, it shows me year made versus price, and it shows me the combination versus price. Remember this is always log of price, that's why these prices look weird, right? And so you can see that the combination of sale elapsed and year made is, as you would expect, um, uh, later dates, so more elapsed time, um, is giving me... Oh, sorry, it's the other way around, isn't it? So the highest prices are those where there's the least elapsed and the most recent year made. Um, so you can see here there's the univariate relationship between sale elapsed and price, um, and here is the univariate relationship between year made and price, um, and then here is the combination of the two. Um, it's enough to see like clearly that these two things are driving price together. Um, you can also see these are not like simple diagonal lines, so it's kind of some interesting interaction going on. Um, and so based on looking at these plots, um, it's enough to make me think, oh, we, we should maybe put in some kind of interaction term and see what happens. So let's come back to that in a moment, but let's just look at a couple more. Um, remember in this case I did one hot encoding, uh, way back at the top here, I said max n cat equals 7. So I've got like n closure erupts with AC. So uh, if you've got one hot encoded variables, um, you can pass an array of them uh, to pit plot PDP, and it'll treat them as uh, a category, right? And so in this case, I'm going to create um, a PDP plot of these three categories. I'm going to call it enclosure, uh, and I can see here that. Uh, Enclosure erupts with AC uh, on average are more expensive than enclosure erupts and enclosure erupts. It actually looks like enclosure erupts and enclosure erupts are pretty similar, whereas erupts with AC is higher. Um, so this is, you know, at this point, you know, I'd probably be inclined to hop into Google and like type erupts and erupts and find out what the hell these things are, uh, and here we go. So it turns out that erupts is enclosed rollover protective structure, uh, and so um, it turns out that if your um, um, your bulldozer is fully enclosed, then optionally you can also get air conditioning. So it turns out that actually this thing is telling us whether it's got air conditioning. If it's an open structure, then obviously you don't have air conditioning at all. So that's what these three levels are, and so we've now learnt. Um, all other things being equal, the same bulldozer, sold at the same time, built at the same time, sold to the same person, is going to be quite a bit more expensive if it has air conditioning than if it doesn't. Okay, so again, we're kind of getting this nice interpretation ability. And you know, now that I've spent some time with this data set, I've certainly noticed that this, you know, knowing this is the most important thing, you do notice that there's a lot more air-conditioned bulldozers nowadays than they used to be, and so there's definitely an interaction between kind of date and that. So based on that earlier interaction analysis, I've tried, um, first of all, setting everything before 1950 to 1950, because it seems to be some kind of missing value. Uh, I've then set age to be equal to uh, sale year minus year made, um, and so then I try running a random forest on that, and indeed, Age is now the single biggest thing. Uh, sale elapsed is way back down here. Uh, year made is back down here. So we've kind of used this to find uh, an interaction. Um, but remember, of course, that a random forest can create a, it can create an interaction through having multiple split points. So we shouldn't assume that this is actually going to be a better result. 
Um, and in practice, I actually found when I uh, looked at my score uh, and my RMSE, adding age was actually a little worse. Um, we'll see about that um, later, probably in the next lesson. Okay. Um, so one last thing is a tree interpreter. Um, so uh, this is also in the category of things that most people don't know exist, but it's super important. Uh, almost pointless for like Kaggle competitions, but super important for real life. And here's the idea. Um, let's say you're an insurance company and uh, somebody rings up and you give them a quote and they say, oh, that's $500 more than last year. Why? Okay, so in general, you've made a prediction from some model and somebody asks why. And so this is where we use this um, method called a uh, tree interpreter. And what tree interpreter does is it allows us to take um, a particular row. So in this case, we're going to pick row number zero, right? So here, uh, here is row zero, right? Uh, presumably this is like a year made. I don't know what all the codes stand for, but like here's is all of the columns in row zero. What I can do with a tree interpreter is I can go ti.predict, pass in my random forest, pass in my row, so this would be like this particular customer's insurance information, or this in this case this particular auction, right? And it'll give me back three things. The first is the prediction from the random forest. The second is the bias. The bias is basically the average sale price across the whole original data set, right? So like remember in a random forest, we started with single trees, oh, we haven't got the draw in there anymore, but remember we started with a single tree in our random forest, and we split it once, and then we split that once, and then we split that once, right? And we said like, oh, what's the average value for the whole data set? Then what's the average value for those where the first split was true? And then what's the average value where the next split was also true? Until eventually you get down to the leaf nodes where you've got the average value you predict, right? So you can kind of think of it this way. If this, for a single tree, if this is our final leaf node, Right? Maybe we're predicting like 9.1, right? and then maybe the average log sale price for the whole um, uh, the whole lot is like 10.2, right? That's the average for all the options. And so you could kind of like work your way down here. So in fact, let's go and create this. Uh, let's actually go and run this so we can see it. Okay, so um, let's go back and redraw this single tree. You'll find like in um, Jupyter Notebooks, often a lot of the things we create, like videos, progress bars and stuff, they don't know how to like save themselves to the file, so you'll see just like a little string here, and so you actually have to rerun it um, to create the string. Uh, let's... Um, so this was the single tree that we created. Um, so the whole data set had an average log sale price of 10.2. Uh, the data set for those with cut plus system equals true had an average of 10.3. Um, the data set for cut plus system equals true in closure less than, point, uh, less than 2 was 9.9, .9. and then eventually we get all the way up here, uh, and also model ID less than 4573, it's 10.2. So you could kind of like say, okay, why did this particular row, let's say we had a row that ended up over in this leaf node, why did we predict 10.2? Well, it's because we started with 10.19, and then because the coupler system was was tr was less than 0.5, so it was actually false, um, we added about 0.2 to that, so we went from 10.1 to 10.3, right, so 10.2 to 10.3, so we added a little bit because this one is true, and then to go from 10.3 to 9.9, .9, so because enclosure is less than 2, we subtracted uh, about 0.4, and then because model ID was less than 4500, we added about 
right? So you could see like with a single tree, you could like break down like why is it that we predicted 10.2, right? And it's like at each one of these decision points, we're adding or subtracting a little bit from the value. Um, so what we could then do is we could do that for all the trees, and then we could take the average. So every time we see enclosure, did we increase or decrease the value and how much by? Every time we see model ID, did we increase or decrease the value and how much by? And so we could take the average of all of those, and that's what ends up in this thing called contributions. So here is all of our predictors, and here is the value of each. And so this is telling us, and I've uh, sorted them here, that um, the fact that this thing was made in 1999 was the thing that m most negatively impacted our prediction. And the fact that the age of the vehicle was uh, 11 years was what most positively impacted. Um, I think you actually need to sort after you zip them together. They seem to be sorted. Negative point five. Well, no, the nine. values are sorted, but then they're just reassigned to the columns in the original order, which is why uh, an eleven-year-old tractor is what's most positive packing price. Thank you. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Yes, we need to do an index sort. Okay. Thank you. We will make sure we fix that by next week. So we need to sort columns by the index from contributions. So then there's this thing called bias, and so the bias is just the uh, the average with, before we start doing any splits, right? So if you basically start with the average um, log of value, and then we went down each tree, and each time we saw year made, we had some impact, coupler system, some impact, product size, some impact, and so forth. Right? Um, Mind. Okay, so I think what we might do is we might come back to because we're kind of out of time We might come back to tree interpreter um, next time, um, but the basic idea this is the last uh, This was the last of our key interpretation points and the basic idea is that um, we want some ability to um, Not only tell us about the model as a whole and how it works on average But to look at how the model makes predictions for an individual row um, And that's what we're doing here Okay, great. Thanks everybody. See you on Thursday. Okay, so welcome back. So we're going to start by uh, doing some review and we're going to talk about uh, test sets, training sets, validation sets, and OOB. Um, something we haven't covered yet, but uh, we will cover in more detail later is also cross-validation, but I'm going to talk about that as well. Right? So we have a data set with a bunch of rows in it, and we've got some dependent variable. And so what's the difference between like machine learning and kind of pretty much any other kind of work? The, the, the difference is that in machine learning, the thing we care about is the generalization accuracy or the generalization error, where else in like pretty much everything else, all we care about is is how well we kind of map to the observations full stop. And so this this thing about generalization is the key unique piece of, of machine learning. And so if we want to know whether we're good, doing a good job of machine learning, we need to do, know whether we're doing a good job of generalizing. If we don't know that, we know nothing. Right? Um, yeah. By generalizing, do you mean like scaling, being able to scale larger data sets? Or you no, I, I don't mean scaling at all. So sc scaling is an important thing in many, many areas. It's like, okay, we've got something that works uh, on on my computer with 10,000 items. I now need to work make it work on 10,000 items per second or something. So scaling is important, um, but not just for machine learning, for, for just about everything we put in production. Generalization is where I say, okay, here is a model that can predict cats from dogs. I've looked at five pictures of cats, five pictures of dogs, and I've built a model that is perfect. 
and then I look at a different set of five cats and dogs, and it gets them all wrong. So in that case, what it learnt was not the difference between a cat and a dog, but it learnt what those five exact cats look like and those five exact dogs look like. Or I've built a model of predicting uh, grocery sales for a particular product. So for toilet rolls uh, in New Jersey last month. Um, and then I go and put it into production, and it scales great. In other words, it, it has a great latency, I don't have a high CPU load, uh, but it fails to predict anything well other than uh, toilet rolls in New Jersey. And it also it turns out it only did it well for last month, not the next month. So these are all generalization failures. So um, the most common way that people check for the ability to generalize is to uh, create a random sample, so they'll grab a few rows at random and pull it out into a test set. And then they'll build all of their models on the rest of the rows, and then when they're finished, they'll check the, the accuracy they got on their, so the rest of the rows are called the training set, everything else. everything. Else, we could call the training set. And so, at the end of their modeling process on the training set, they got an accuracy of 99% at predicting cats and dogs. At the very end, they check it against a test set to make sure that the model really does generalize. Now, the problem is, what if it doesn't? Right. So, okay, well, I could go back and change some hyperparameters, do some data augmentation, whatever else, try to create a more generalizable model, and then I'll go back again after doing all that and check, and it's still no good. Right? And I'll keep doing this again and again until eventually, after 50 attempts, it does generalize. But does it really generalize? Because maybe all I've done is accidentally found this one which happens to work just for that test set, because I've tried 50 different things. Right, and so if I've got something which is like right coincidentally 0.05 percent of the time, then I'm very likely to accidentally get a good result. So what we generally do is we put aside a second data set. So I've got a couple more of these and put these aside into a validation set. Validation set. Right? And then everything that's not in the validation or the test is now training. And so what we do is we train a model, check it against the validation to see if it generalizes, do that a few times, and then when we finally got something where we're like, okay, we think this generalizes successfully based on the validation set, and then at the end of the project we check it against the test set. Uh, yeah. Uh, so basically, by making this two-layer test set validation set, if it gets one right, the other one wrong, you kind of double checking your errors, kind of like. It's checking that we have an overfit to the validation set. So if we're using the validation set again and again, then we could end up not coming up with a generalizable set of hyperparameters, but a set of hyperparameters that just so happen to work on the training set and the validation set. So, so if we try 50 different models um, against the validation set, and then at the end of all that we then check that against the test set, and it still generalizes well, then we're kind of going to say, okay, that's good, we've actually come up with a generalizable model. If it doesn't, then that's going to say, okay, we've actually now overfit to the validation set, at which point you're kind of in trouble, right, because you don't, you know, you don't have anything left behind, right? So the idea is to use effective techniques during the modeling so that, so that doesn't happen, right? But, but if it's going to happen, you want to find out about it. Like you need that test set to be there, because otherwise, when you put it in production, and then it turns out that it doesn't generalize, that would be a really bad outcome, right? You end up with less people clicking on your ads, or selling less of your products, or providing car insurance to very risky vehicles, or whatever. So uh, just to make sure, do you need to ever check if the validation set and the test set is, is coherent, or you just keep test set? So if you've done what I've just done here, which is to randomly sample, there's no particular reason to check as long as they're as long as they're big enough, right? But we're going to come back to your question uh, in a different context in just a moment. Um, 
Now, another trick we've learned for random forests is a way of um, not needing a validation set. Uh, and the way that we learnt was to use instead use the OOB error or the OOB score. And so this idea was to say, well, every time we train a tree in a random forest, there's a bunch of observations that are held out anyway, because that's how we get some of the randomness. And so let's calculate our score for each tree based on those held out samples, and therefore the forest by averaging the trees that that each row was not part of training. Okay. Um, and so the OOB score gives us something which is pretty similar to the validation score. Uh, but on average, it's a little less good. Can anybody either remember or figure out why on average it's a little less good? Quite a subtle one. Can I give it to Chen Shi? I'm not sure, but uh, is it because you are treating, like you are doing every kind of probe uh, pre-processing on your test tag, and so the OB score is reflecting the performance on testing set? No, so the OOB score is not using the test set at all. The OOB oh, no, score is using set. the held out rows in the training set yeah, yeah. for each tree. So I mean, the um, you are basically testing each tree on some data from the training set. Yes. So you are you have the potential of overfitting the training set. Uh, um, I sh it shouldn't cause overfitting because each one is looking at a held out sample, so it's not an overfitting issue. It's quite a subtle issue. Ernest, do you want to have a try? Sure. Uh, aren't the samples from OOB um, bootstrap samples? They are. And so then uh, you're never going to, I mean, on average, they only grab 63% of right. the chance. So on average, the OOB is 1 minus 63%. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so what's the issue? So then if you're not... So why would the score be lower? Than the validation score. And that average. implies that you're leaving sort of like a black hole in the data. That there's like data points you're never going to sample, and they're not going to be represented by the model. Ah, no, that's not true though, because each tree is looking at a different set, right? So the OLB, so like we've got like I don't know dozens of models, right? And in each one, there's a different set of rows, which which happen to be held out, right? And so when we calculate the OLB score. For like let's say row three, we say okay row three is in this tree, this tree, and that's it. And so we calculate the prediction on that tree and for that tree, and we'd average those two predictions. And so with enough trees, you know each one has a thirty or so percent chance, sorry forty or so percent chance that the row is in that tree. So if you have fifty trees, it's almost certain that every row is going to be mentioned somewhere. Did you have an idea, Karim? Uh, with validation set, we can use the whole forest to make the predictions, but here we cannot use the whole forest, so mm -hmm. we cannot exactly see. Exactly. So every best. row is going to be using a subset of the trees to make its prediction. And with less trees, we know we get a less accurate prediction. So that's, like, that's a subtle one, right? And if you didn't get it, have a think during the week. Until you understand why this is, because it's a really interesting test of your understanding of random forests. Of like, why is OOB score on average less good than your validation score? They're both using random sub, random held out subsets. Anyway, it's generally close enough, right? So, why have a validation set at all um, when you're using a random forest? Um, if it's a randomly chosen validation set, it's not strictly speaking necessary, but you know you've got like four levels of things to test, right? So you could like test on the OOB, when that's working well you can test on the validation set, you know, and hopefully by the time you check against the test set, um, there's going to be no surprises, so that would be one good reason. Then um, what Kaggle do, the way they do this is kind of clever, what Kaggle do is they split the test set into two pieces, a public and a private. And they don't tell you which is which. So you submit your predictions to Kaggle, and then a random 30% of those are used to tell you the leaderboard score. But then 
at the end of the competition that gets thrown away and they use the other 70% to calculate your real score. So what that's doing is that you're making sure that you're not like continually using that feedback from the leaderboard to figure out some set of hyperparameters that happens to do well on the public but actually doesn't generalize. Okay. So it's a great test. Like this is one of the reasons why it's good uh, practice to use Kaggle because At the end of a competition, at some point this will happen to you, and you'll drop a hundred places on the leaderboard the last day of the competition when they use the private test set, and it's like, oh, okay, that's what it feels like to overfit. And it's much better to practice and get that sense there than it is to do it in a company where there's hundreds of millions of dollars on the line. Um, okay, so this is like the easiest possible situation where you're able to use a random sample for your validation set. Why might I not be able to use a random sample for my validation set? I'll pass it to Taylor. Um, in the case of something where we're forecasting, we can't randomly sample because we need to maintain the uh, temporal ordering. Go on, why is that? Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So in, in the case of like an ARMA model, Um, I, I can't use, like, I can't pull out random rows because there's, I'm, I'm thinking that there's like a certain dependency or I'm, I'm, I'm trying to model a certain dependency that relies on like a specific lag term. And if I randomly sample those things, then that lag term isn't there for me to use. Okay, so it could be like a, a, a technical modeling issue that like I, I'm using a model that relies on like yesterday, the day before, and the day before that, and if I've randomly removed some things I don't have yesterday, and my model might just fail. Okay, that's true, but there's a more fundamental issue. Do you want to pass it to Tyler? Um, it's a really good point, um, although you know, in general we're going to try to build models that are, not, that are more resilient than that. Particularly with um, uh, yeah, t temporal order. Uh, we expect things that are close by in time to be related to things close to them. Mm -hmm. So we, ex so, uh, so if we destroy the order, set? like yeah. if if we destroy the order, we really aren't going to be able to use that. This time is close to this other time. Um, I don't think that's true because uh, we can pull out a random sample for our validation set and still keep everything nicely ordered. Well, so we would like to is, predict yeah, things in the future, which we would require uh, as much data close to the end of our. Okay, that's true. I mean, we we could be like limiting the amount of data that we have by taking some of it out. Um, but my claim is stronger. My claim is that by using a random validation set, we could get totally the wrong idea about our model. Karim, do you want to have a try? So if our data is imbalanced, for example, we can, if you are randomly sampling it, we can only have one class in our validation set. So our fitted model may be... That's true as well. Different. So maybe you're trying to predict in a medical situation who's going to die of lung cancer, and that's only one out of a hundred people, and we pick out a validation set that we accidentally have nobody that died of lung cancer. Uh, that's also true. These are all good niche examples. But none of them quite say like why could the validation set just be plain wrong? Like give you a totally inaccurate idea of whether this is going to generalize. Uh, and so let's talk about um, and the closest is 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 what Tyler was saying about time closeness in time. The important thing to remember is when you build a model, you're always you always have a systematic error which is that you're going to use the model at a later time than the time that you built it, right? Like you're going to put it into production, by which time the world is different to the world that you're in now. And even when you're building the model, you're using data which is older than today anyway, right? So there's some lag between the data that you're building it on and the data that it's going to be actually be used on in real life. And a lot of the time, if not most of the time, that matters. Right, so if we're doing stuff in like predicting who's going to buy toilet paper in New Jersey, and it takes us two weeks to put it in production, and we did it using data from the last couple of years, then by that time, you know things may look 
very different, right? And particularly our validation set, if we randomly sampled it, right, and it was like from a four-year period, then the vast majority of that data is going to be over a year old, right? And it may be that the toilet buying habits of folks in New Jersey may have dramatically shifted. Maybe they've got a terrible recession there now and they can't afford uh, high quality toilet paper anymore. Um, or maybe they, you know, their paper making industry has gone through the roof and suddenly you know, they, they're buying lots more toilet paper because it's so cheap, or whatever. Right? So the world changes, and therefore if you use a random sample for your validation set, then you're actually checking how good are you at predicting things that are totally obsolete now. Right? How good are you at predicting things that happened four years ago? That's not interesting. Okay, so what we want to do in practice, anytime there's some temporal piece, is to instead say, assuming that we've ordered it by time, right? So this is old and this is new. That's our validation set. Okay, or if we, you know, I suppose actually do it properly. That's our validation set. That's our test set. Make sense, right? So here's our training set, and we use that, and we try and build a model that still works on stuff that's later in time than anything the model was built on. And so we're not just testing generalization in some kind of abstract sense, but in a very specific time sense, which is it generalizes to the future. Could you pass it to Siraj, please? Uh, so when we are, as, as you said, Could you lift it up and as that? you said, there is some temporal ordering in the data. So in that case, is it wise to take the entire old data for training or only a few recent data set? For of validation, data? test or training? No, I'm talking about training. Training? Yeah, that's a whole other question. Right, so um, how do you, how do you get the validation set to be good? So I build a, a random forest on all the training data. It looks good on the training data. It looks good on the OOB, right? And this is actually a really good reason to have OOB. If it looks good on the OOB, then it means you're not overfitting in a statistical sense, right? Like it's 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 working well on a random sample. But then it looks bad on the validation set. So what happened? Well, what happened was that you you somehow failed to predict the future. You only predicted the past. And so Suraj had an idea about how we could fix that. Would be okay. Well, maybe we should just train. So like maybe we shouldn't use the whole training set. We should try a recent period only. And now you know on the downside, we're now using less data, so we can create less rich models. On the upside, it's it's more up to date data. Uh, and this is something you have to play around with. Most um, machine learning functions have the ability to provide a, a weight that is given to each row. So for example, with a random forest, rather than bootstrapping at random, you could have a weight on every row and randomly pick that row with some probability, right? And we could like say, here's our like probability. We could like pick a curve that looks like that. So the, the most recent rows, have a higher probability of being selected. Uh, that can work really well. Um, yeah, it's it, it's something that you have to try, and and if you don't have a validation set that represents the future compared to what you're training on, you have no way to know which of your techniques are, are working. How do you make the compromise between amount of data versus recency of data? Um, so what I tend to do is is when I have this kind of temporal issue, which is probably most of the time, um, once I have something that's working well on the validation set, I wouldn't then go and just use that model on the test set, because the thing that I've trained on is now like, uh, much, you know, the test set is much more in the future compared to the training set. So I would then replicate building that model again, but this time I would combine the training and validation sets together, okay, and, and retrain the model. And at that point, You've got no way to, to test against a validation set, so you have to make sure you have a reproducible 
script or notebook that does exactly the same steps in exactly the same ways um, Because if you get something wrong, then you're going to find on the test set that you've you've got a problem So So what what I do in practice is I need to know is my validation set a, a, a truly representative of the test set so what I do is I build five models on the training set I build five models on the training set and I try to have them kind of vary in how good I think they are right and then and then I score them my five models on the validation set right and then I also score them on the test set right so I'm not cheating so I'm not using any feedback from the test set to change my hyperparameters I'm only using it for this one thing which is to check my validation set so I get my five scores from the test set and then I check that they fall in a line okay and if they don't then you're not going to get good enough feedback from the validation set so keep doing that process until you're getting a line and that can be quite tricky right sometimes the the test set um, you know trying to create something that's as similar to the real world outcome as possible it's, it's, it's difficult right and when you're kind of in the real world the same is true of creating the test set like the test set has to be as close to production as possible so like What's the actual mix of customers that are going to be using this? How much time is there actually going to be between when you build the model and when you put it in production? How often are you going to be able to refresh the model? These are all the things to think about when you build that test set. Okay, uh, let's do that first. So you want to say that first, make five models on the training data, yeah. and then till you get a straight line relationship, change your validation and test set. You can't really change the test set generally. So this is assuming that the test set's given. The change change the validation set. So if you started with a random sample validation set and then it's all over the place and you realize, oh, I should have picked the last two months. Um, and then you pick the last two months, it's still all over the place and you realize, oh, I should have picked it so that's also from the first of the month to the fifteenth of the month. And it'll keep going until changing your validation set until you found a validation set which is indicative of your test set results. Uh, so the five models, like you would start maybe like just the random data, and then average, and like just make it better. Or yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a, a exactly, a maybe a kind of five like not terrible ones, but you want some variety, and you also particularly want some variety in like how well they might generalize through time. So one that was trained on the whole training set, one that was trained on the last two weeks, one that was trained on the last six weeks. One which used uh, you know lots and lots of columns and might overfit a bit more, yeah. So you kind of want to get a sense of like, oh, if my validation set fails to generalize temporally, I'd want to see that. If it fails to generalize statistically, I'd want to see that. Sorry, can you explain in a bit more detail what you mean by change your validation set so it indicates the test set? Like, what does that look like? Um, so, uh, so let's take the groceries competition where we're trying to predict. Um, the next two weeks of grocery sales. So possible validation sets that uh, Terence and I played with was um, a random sample um, The last month of data uh, The last two weeks of data uh, And the other one we tried was uh, same uh, day range One month Earlier, so the the test set in this competition was the first to the fifteenth of August. Sorry, the fifteenth, maybe the fifteenth to the thirtieth of August. So we tried like a random sample of four years. We tried um, uh, the fifteenth of July to the fifteenth of August. We tried the first of August to the fifteenth of August, and we tried the fifteenth of July to the thirtieth of July. And so there were four different validation sets we tried. And so with random, you know, our kind of results were all over the place. With last month, you know, they were like not bad but not great. The last two weeks there was a couple that didn't look good, but on the whole they were good. And same day range of the month earlier, they got a basically perfect line. So that's the part I'm talking about right there. What exactly are you comparing it to from the test set? 
I just kind of confused what you're creating that graph off of. So for each of those, uh, so for each of my, uh, so I build five models, mm -hmm. right? So there might be like, uh, just predict the average, do some kind of simple group mean of the whole data set, do some group mean of the last month of the data set, build a random forest of the whole thing, build a random forest in the last two weeks. On each of those I calculate the validation score, and then I retrain the model on the whole training set and calculate the same thing on the test set. And so each of these points now tells me how well did it go in the validation set, how well did it go in the test set. And so if the validation set is useful, we would say every time the validation set improves, the test set should also score should also improve. Yeah, so you just said retrain. Do you mean retrain the model on training and validation set? Yeah, that was a step I was talking about here. So once I've got the validation score based on just the training set, I would then retrain it on the train and validation and check against test. Right. Just to make sure. Somebody else? So just to clarify, uh, by test set you mean uh, submitting it to Kaggle and then checking the score? Or if it's Kaggle, then your test set is Kaggle's leaderboard. Okay. Uh, in the real world, the test set is this third data set that you put aside, and it's that third data set that having it reflect real world production differences is the most important step in a machine learning project. Why is it the most important step? Because if you screw up everything else, but you don't screw up that, you'll know you've screwed up. Right? Like if you've got a good test set, then you'll know you screwed up, because you screwed up something else and you tested it and it didn't work out, and it's like, okay, you're not going to destroy the company. Right? If you screwed up creating the test set, that would be awful, right? because then you don't know if you've made a mistake. Right? You, you try to build a model, you test it on the test set, it looks good, but the test set was not indicative of real-world uh, environment, so you don't actually know if you're going to destroy the company. Right? Now hopefully you've got ways to put things into production gradually, so you won't actually destroy the company, but you'll at least destroy your reputation at work, right? It's like, oh, Jeremy tried to put this thing into production, and in the first week, the cohort we tried it on, their sales halved, and we're never going to give Jeremy a machine learning job again. Right? But if Jeremy had used a proper test set, then like he would have known, uh-oh, this is like half as good as my validation set said it would be, I'll keep trying. Right? And now I'm not going to get in any trouble, I was actually like, oh, Jeremy's awesome, he identifies ahead of time when there's going to be a generalization problem. Uh, Okay, so this is like this is something that kind of everybody talks about a little bit in machine learning classes, but often it kind of stops at the point where you learn that there's a thing in SK Learn called make test train split, and it returns these things, and off you go, right? But the fact that like, or here's the cross validation function, right? So. The fact that these things always give you random samples tells you that like, much if not most of the time you shouldn't be using them. Uh, the fact that Random Forest gives you an OOB for free, it's useful, but it only tells you that this generalizes in a statistical sense, not in a practical sense. Right? So then finally, there's cross-validation, right? which Outside of class, you guys have been talking about a lot, which makes me feel somebody's been overemphasizing the value of this technique. So I'll explain what cross-validation is, uh, and then I'll explain why you probably shouldn't be using it most of the time. So cross-validation says, let's not just pull out one validation set, but let's pull out five, say. So let's assume that we're going to randomly shuffle the data first. Right? This is critical. Right? We first randomly shuffle the data, and then we're going to split it into five groups. And then for model number one, we'll call this the validation set, and we'll call this the training set. Okay? And we'll train, and we'll check against the validation, and we'll get some RMSE, R squared, whatever. And then we'll throw that away. 
and we'll call this the validation set, and we'll call this the training set, and we'll get another score. Okay? We'll do that five times, and then we'll take the average. Okay, so that's a cross-validation average accuracy. So who can tell me like a benefit of using cross-validation over a the kind of standard validation set I talked about before? Uh, could you pass it to Fun? Uh, if you have a small data set, then uh, course validation will make use of the data you have. Yeah, you can use all of the data. You don't have to put anything aside. And you kind of get a little benefit as well in that like you've now got five models that you could ensemble together, each one of used which used 80% of the data, so you know sometimes that ensembling can be helpful. Um, um, Fung, could you tell me like what, are, what could be some reasons that you wouldn't use cross-validation? Uh, we have enough data, so we do not want uh, the validation set to be included in the uh, model training uh, process uh, to to like to to pollute like like the, the model. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure that cross validation is necessarily polluting the model. What would be a key like downside of cross validation? But like for deep learning, if you have learned the pictures and. Uh, the neural network will know the pictures and it's more likely to predict it less than the right. So, I guess sure, but if we if we put aside some data each time in the cross validation, can you pass that to Suraj? I'm 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 not so worried about like I don't think there's like one of these validation sets is more statistically accurate. Uh, yes, Suraj. I'm not mistaken. Will we be all fitting the data? Like if you are. I think that's what Fung was worried about. I, I don't see why that would happen. Like each time we're fitting a model, just behind you. Each time we're fitting a model, we are absolutely holding out 20% of the sample, right? So yes, the five models between them have seen all of the data, but but it's kind of like a random forest. And in fact, it's a lot like a random forest. Each model has only been trained on a subset of the data. Yes, Nishan. Say if it is like a large data set, like it will take a lot of time. Oh yes, exactly. Right, so we have to fit five models rather than one. So here's a key downside. Number one uh, is time, and so if we're doing deep learning and it takes a day to run, suddenly it now takes five days, or we need five GPUs. Uh, okay, what about my earlier issues about validation sets? Do you want to pass it over there? What's your name, Jose? Jose, yes. Um, so if you had like temporal data, wouldn't you be like by shuffling, wouldn't you be breaking that relation? Uh, well, we could unshuffle it afterwards. We could reorder it. Like we could shuffle, get the training set out, and then sort it by time. Like and like, there's presumably there's a date column there. So I don't think I don't think it's going to stop us from building a model. Did you have uh, Ernest? Um, with cross-validation, you're building five even validation sets, and if there is some sort of structure that you're trying to capture in your validation set to mirror your test set, you're, you're essentially just throwing that a uh, chance to construct that uh, yourself. Right. I, I, I think you're going to say that, I think you said the same thing as I'm going to say, which is, which is that our earlier concerns about why random validation sets are a problem are entirely relevant here. All these validation sets are random. So if a random validation set is not appropriate for your problem, most likely because, for example, of temporal issues, then none of these four validation set, five validation sets are any good. They're all random, right? And so if you have temporal data, like we did here, there's no way to do cross-validation really, or like probably no good way to do cross-validation. I, I mean, you want to have a your validation set be as close to the test set as possible, and so you can't do that by randomly sampling different things. So, um, so as Fung said, you may well not need a, 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 to do cross-validation, because most of the time in the real world we, we don't really have that little data. 
right? Unless your data is based on some very very expensive labeling process or some experiments that take a cost a lot to run or whatever. But nowadays, that's data scientists are not very often doing that kind of work. Some are, in which case this is an issue, but most of us aren't. So we probably don't need to. As Nishan said, if we do do it, it's going to take a whole lot of time, right? And then as Ernest said, even if we did do it and we took up all that time, it might give us totally the wrong answer because random validation sets are inappropriate for our problem. Okay, so I'm not going to be spending much time on cross-validation because I just I think it's an interesting tool to have. Uh, it's easy to use. SK Learn has a cross-validation thing you can go ahead and use, um, but uh, it, it's 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 not that often that it's going to be an important part of your toolbox, in my opinion. It'll come up sometimes. Okay, so that is uh, validation sets. So then the other thing we uh, started talking about um, last week uh, and got a little bit stuck on because I screwed it up was uh, tree interpretation. Um, so I'm actually going to cover that again um, without the error. Um, and dig into it in a bit more detail. So, uh, can anybody tell me what tree interpreter does and how it does it? Anybody remember? It's a, it's a difficult one to explain. I don't think I did a good job of explaining it, so don't worry if you don't do a great job. But does anybody want to have a go at explaining it? No? Okay, that's fine. So. Um, <clears throat> Let's start with the output of tree interpreter. So if we look at a single model, a single tree, in other words, here is a single tree. Okay. And so to remind us, the top of a tree is before there's been any split at all. So 10.189 is the average log price. Of all of the options in our training set. So I'm going to go ahead and draw right here. 10.189 is the average of all. Okay. And then if I go a couple of system less than or equal to 0.5, then I get 10.345. Okay, so for this subset of 16,800. Coupler is less than or equal to 0.5, the average is 10.345. And then of the people with uh, a coupler system less than or equal to 0.5, we then take the subset where enclosure is less than or equal to 2, and the average there of log sale price is 9.955. So here's 9.955. Okay? And then final step in our tree is Model ID, just for this group, with no coupler system, with enclosure less than or equal to 2, then let's just take model ID less than or equal to 4573, and that gives us 10.226. Okay? So then we can say, alright, starting with 10.109, average for everybody in our training set, for this particular tree's subsample of 20,000. Adding in the coupler decision, for coupler less than or equal to 0.5, increased our prediction by 0.156. So if we predicted with a naive model of just the mean, it would have been 10.199, uh, adding in just the coupler decision would have changed it to 10.345, so this variable is responsible for a 0.156 increase in our prediction. From that, the enclosure decision was responsible for a minus 0.395 decrease. The model ID was responsible for a 0.276 increase until eventually that was our final decision. That was our prediction for this auction of this particular sale price. So we can draw that as what's called a waterfall plot. Right? And waterfall plots are one of the most useful plots I know about. And weirdly enough, there's nothing in Python to, to do them. And this is one of these things where there's this disconnect between like the world of like management consulting and business where everybody uses waterfall plots all the time, and like academia, uh, who have no idea what these things are. But like every time like you're looking at, say, um, here is last year's sales for Apple, 
and then there was a change in that iPhones increased by this amount, Macs decreased by that amount, and iPads increased by that amount. Every time you have a starting point in a number of changes and a finishing point, waterfall charts are pretty much always the best way to show it. So here, our prediction for price based on everything, 10.189. There was an increase, blue means increase, of 0.156 for coupler, decrease of 0.395 for enclosure, increase model ID of 0.276, so decrease, oh sorry, increase, decrease, increase to get to our final 10.266. So you see how a waterfall chart works? So with Excel 2016, you, it's built in, you just click insert waterfall chart and there it is. Um, if you want to be a hero, uh, create a waterfall chart um, a package for Matplotlib, put it on pip, and everybody will love you for it. Um, there are some like really crappy gists and manual notebooks and stuff around. These are actually super easy to build. Like you basically do a stacked column plot where the the bottom of this is like all white, right? Like you can kind of do it, but if you can wrap that up all and put the data. The points in the right spots and color them nicely. That would be totally awesome. I think you've all got the skills to do it, and would make you know be a terrific thing for your portfolio. Um, so there's an idea. Uh, could make an interesting cattle kernel even. Like here's how to build a waterfall plot from scratch. And by the way, I've put this up on PIP. You can all use it. Um, so in general, therefore, obviously going from the all and then going through each change then the sum of all of those is going to be equal to the final prediction. So that's how we could say if we were just doing a decision tree, then you know, you're coming along and saying like, how come this particular auction was this particular price, and it's like, well, or your prediction for it, and like, oh, it's because of these three things had these three impacts, right? So for a random forest, we could do that across all of the trees. Right? So every time we see coupler, we add up that change. Every time we see enclosure, we add up that change. Every time we see model, we add up that change. Okay, And so then we combine them all together, we get what Tree Interpreter does. Right? So you could go into the source code for Tree Interpreter, right? it's, it's not at all complex logic, or you could build it yourself. Right? And you can see uh, how it does exactly this. So when you go tree interpreter predict with a random forest model for some specific auction, so I've got a specific row here. This is my zero index row. Um, it tells you, okay, this is the prediction, the same as the random forest prediction. Bias. This is going to be always the same. It's the average sale price for for everybody uh, for each of the random samples in the tree. And then contributions. Is the average of, or sorry, the total of all the contributions for each time we see that specific column appear in a tree. Right? So um, last time I made the mistake of not sorting this correctly. So this time, uh, np.argsort is a super handy um, function. It sorts. It doesn't actually sort contribution zero. It just tells you where each item would move to if it were sorted. So now by passing IDXS to each one of um, the column, um, the, uh, the level, um, contribution, uh, I can then print out all those in the right order. So I can see here, here's my column, uh, here's the, uh, the level, uh, and the contribution. So the fact that it's a small version of this piece of industrial equipment meant that it was less expensive. Right? But the fact that it was made pretty recently meant that it was more expensive. The fact that it's pretty old, however, made that it was less expensive. Right? So this is not going to um, really help you much at all with like a Kaggle style situation where you just need predictions. But it's going to help you a lot in a production environment or even pre-production. Right? So like something which any good manager should you should do if you say here's a machine learning model I think we should use. Is they should go away and grab a few examples of actual customers or, or actual auctions or whatever and check whether your model looks intuitive, right? And if it says like, my prediction is that, um, you know, uh, uh, lots and lots of people are going to really enjoy um, 
this crappy movie, you know, and it's like, well, that was a really crappy movie, then they're going to come back to you and say, like, explain why your model's telling me um, that I'm going to like this movie because I hate that movie. And then you can go back and you say, well, it's because you like this movie and because you're this age range and you're this gender. On average, actually, people like you did like that movie. Okay, yeah. Uh, Uh, what's the second element of each tuple? I mean, no, um, this is saying for this particular row, uh -huh. it, it was a mini, and it uh -huh. was 11 years old, got it. and it was a hydraulic excavator track, three to four metric tons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Thank you. So it's just feeding back and telling you it's it because this is actually what it was. It was these numbers. So I just went back to uh, the original uh, data to actually pull out the. The descriptive versions of each one. Okay, so if we sum up all the contributions together and then add them to the bias, then that would be the same as adding up those three things, adding it to this, and as we know from our waterfall chart, that gives us our final prediction. Um, this is a almost totally unknown technique, and this um, particular uh, uh, library is almost totally unknown as well. Um, so, like, it's a great opportunity to, you know, show something that a lot of people like. It's, it's totally critical, in my opinion, um, but but rarely known. So that's um, That's kind of the end of the random forest interpretation piece, and hopefully you've now seen enough that when somebody says we can't use modern machine learning techniques because they're black boxes that aren't interpretable, you have enough information to say you're full of shit, right? Like they're extremely interpretable, and the stuff that we've just done, you know, trying to do that with a linear model, good luck to you. You know, even where you can do something similar with a linear model, trying to do it so that's not giving you totally the wrong answer, and you had no idea it was the wrong answer. Is going to be a real challenge. So, the last step we're going to do before we try and build our, our own random forest is deal with this tricky issue of extrapolation. So, in this case, um, if we look at our tree, um, let's look at the accuracy of our most recent trees. Um, we still have uh, you know, a big difference between our validation score and our training score. Um, the actually, in this case, it's not too bad. The the uh, the difference between the OOB and the validation is actually pretty close. Um, so, if there was a big difference between validation and OOB, like I'd be very worried about that we've dealt with the temporal side of things uh, correctly. Um, let's just have a look at I think our most recent model. Ah, uh, here it was. Yeah, so there's a tiny difference, right? And so on on Kaggle, at least you kind of need that last decimal place. Uh, in the real world, I'd probably stop here, um, but quite often you'll see there's a big difference between your validation score and your OOB score, and I want to show you how you would deal with that. Um, particularly because actually we know that the, the the OOB should be a little worse. Because it's using less, less trees, so it gives me a sense that we should be able to do a little bit better. And so the reason, we, the way we should be able to do a little bit better is by handling the time component a little bit better. Um, so ex here's the problem with random forests when it comes to extrapolation. Um, when you when you've got a data set that's like you know four, got four years of sales data in it. And you create your tree, right? And it says like, oh, if these, um, if it's in some particular store, and it's some particular item, and it is on special, you know, here's the average price, right? It actually tells us the average price, you know, over the whole training set, which could be pretty old, right? And so when you then um, want to step forward to like, well, what's going to be the price next month? It's never seen next month, and and where else with a kind of a linear model, 
it can find a relationship between time and price where even though we only had this much data, when you then go and predict something in the future, it can extrapolate that. But a random forest can't do that. There's no way, if you think about it, for a tree to be able to say, well, next month it would be higher still. So there's a few ways to deal with this, and we'll talk about it over the next couple of lessons. But one simple way is just to try to avoid using time variables as predictors if there's something else we could use that's going to give us a better, uh, you know, something of a, a kind of a, a stronger relationship that's actually going to work in the future. So in this case, what I wanted to do was to first of all figure out um, what's the difference between our validation set and our training set. Like if I understand the difference between our validation set and our training set, then that tells me what are the predictors which which have a strong temporal component, and therefore they may be irrelevant by the time I get to the future time period. So I do something really interesting, which is I create a random forest where my dependent variable is is it in the validation set. Right, so I've gone back and I've got my whole data frame with the training and validation all together, and I've created a new column called is valid, which I've set to one, and then for all of the stuff in the training set, I set it to zero. Right, so I've got a new column which is just is this in the validation set or not, and then I'm going to use that as my dependent variable and build a random forest. So this is a random forest, not to predict price. That predict is this in the validation set or not, and so if your variables were not time dependent, then it shouldn't be possible to figure out if something's in the validation set or not. This is a great trick in Kaggle, right? Because in Kaggle, um, they often won't tell you whether the test set is a random sample or not. So you could put the test set and the training set together, create a new column called is test, and see if you can predict it. If you can, you don't have a random sample, which means you have to come and figure out how to create a validation set from it, right? And so in this case, I can see I don't have a random sample because my validation set can be predicted with a 0.9999 R squared. And so then if I look at feature importance, the top thing is sales ID. And so this is really interesting. It tells us very clearly sales ID is not a random identifier, but probably it's something that's just set consecutively as time goes on, we just increase the sales ID. Sale elapsed, that was the number of days since the first date in our data set, so not surprisingly that also is a good predictor. Interestingly, machine ID, uh, clearly each machine is being labeled with some consecutive identifier as well. And then there's a big, don't just look at the order, look at the value. So 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.07, 0 0.002. Okay, stop. Right? These top three are hundreds of times more important than the rest. Right? So let's next grab those top three. Right? And we can then uh, have a look at their values, um, both in the training set and in the validation set. And so we can see, for example, sales ID on average is uh, divided by a thousand. On average is 1.8 million. Uh, in the training set and 5.8 million in the validation set, right? So you, like you can see Just confirm like okay, they're very different So let's drop them Okay, so after I drop them, let's now see if I can predict whether something's in the validation set. Oh, I still can with 0.98 R squared um, so once you remove some things then other things can like come to the front and it now turns out okay That's not surprisingly age You know things that are old are um, You know more likely I guess to be in the validation set because they've you know earlier on in the training set yet. They can't be old yet um, year made same reason uh, so then we can um, um, uh, try removing those as well um, And so once we let's see where do we go here? Yeah, so what we can try doing is we can then say all right Let's take the sales ID sell that's machine ID from the first one 
uh, the age, year made, sale, sale day of year from the second one, and say, okay, these are all uh, time-dependent features. Um, so I still want them in my random forest if they're important, right? But if they're not important, then taking them out, there are some other non-time-dependent variables that, that work just as well. That would be better, right? Because now I'm going to have a model that generalizes over time better. So here I'm just going to go ahead and go through each one of those features and drop each one one at a time. Okay, retrain a new random forest and print out the score. Okay, so before we do any of that, our score was 0.88 for our validation versus 0.89 OOB. And you can see here, when I remove sales ID, my score goes up. And this, this is like what we're hoping for. We've removed a time-dependent variable. There were other variables that could find similar relationships without the time dependency. So removing it caused our validation to go up. Our OOB didn't go up, right? Because this is genuinely, statistically, a useful predictor, right? But it's a time-dependent one, and we have a time-dependent validation set. So this is like really subtle, but it can be really important. Right? It's trying to find the things that give you a, a generalizable time across time prediction, and here's how you can see it. So, by, so it's like, okay, we should remove sales ID for sure. Right? But sale elapsed didn't get better. Okay, so we don't want that. Machine ID did get better, went from 888 to 893. Right? So it's actually quite a bit better. Um, age got a bit better. Year made got worse. Sale day of year got a bit better. Okay, so now we can say, all right, let's get rid of um, the three uh, where we know that getting rid of it actually made it better. Okay, and as a result, look at this, we're now up to 915. Okay, so we've got rid of three time dependent things, and now, as expected, our validation is better than our OOB. Okay, so that was a super successful approach there, right? And so now we can check the feature importance. And let's go ahead and say, all right, that was pretty damn good. Let's now leave it for a while. So give it 160 trees, uh, let it churn on it, and see how that goes. Okay, and so as you can see, like we did all of our interpretation, all of our fine tuning, basically with smaller model subsets, and at the end we run the whole thing. It actually still only took 16 seconds. Um, uh, and so we've now got an RMSE of 0.21. Okay, so now we can check that against Kaggle. Uh, again, we can't... We uh, Unfortunately, this um, older competition we're not allowed to enter anymore to see how we would have gone, so the best we can do is check uh, whether it looks like we could have done well based on our validation set, um, so it should be in the right area, and yeah, based on that, we would have come first. Okay, so, you know, I think this is an interesting series of steps, right? So you can go through the same series of steps in your Kaggle projects, uh, and more importantly, your real-world projects. So one of the challenges is once you leave this learning environment, Suddenly you're surrounded by people who they never have enough time. They always want you to be in a hurry They're always telling you, you know, do this and then do that. You need to find the time to step away Right and go back because this is a genuine real-world modeling process you can use And it gives When I say it gives world-class results, I, I, I mean it right like this guy who won this uh, Lustigos, sadly he's passed away, um, but he is the uh, top Kaggle uh, uh, competitor of all time, like he uh, he won, I believe, like dozens of competitions. So if we can get a score even within Kui of him, then we are doing really, really well. Um, okay, so let's take a five-minute break, and we're going to come back and build our own random forest. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something quickly. Uh, very good point during the break was um, uh, going back to the change in R squared between here and here. 
it's not just due to the fact that we uh, removed um, these three predictors, um, we also went reset RF samples. Right? So to actually see the impact of just removing, we need to compare it to um, the final step earlier, so it's actually compared to 907. So removing those three things took us from uh, 907 to Nine one five. Okay, so I mean, and you know, in the end, of course, what matters is our final model. But uh, yeah, just to clarify. Okay. So um, some of you have asked me about writing your own random forests from scratch. I don't know if any of you have given it a try yet. Um, my original plan here was to do it in real time, and then as I started to do it, I realized that that would have kind of been boring because for you, because I screw things up all the time, so instead we might do more of like a, a, a walk through the code together. Um, just as an aside, um, this reminds me, talking about the exam, actually somebody asked on the forum about like what, what can you expect from the exam. The basic plan is to make it a, uh, the exam be very similar to these notebooks, so it'll probably be a notebook that you have to, you know, get a data set, create a model, train it, feature importance, whatever, right? And the plan is that it'll be open book, open internet, you can use whatever resources you like. So basically if you're entering competitions, the exam should be very straightforward. Uh, I also expect that there will be some pieces about like, here's a partially completed random forest or something, you know, finish, finish writing this step here, or here's a random forest, uh, implement feature importance, or you know, implement one of the things we've talked about. So it'll be, you know, the, the exam will be much like what we do in class and what you're expected to be doing during the week. Uh, there won't be any uh, define this or tell me the difference between this word and that word or whatever. There's not going to be any rote learning. It'll be entirely like, are you an effective machine learning practitioner? I.e., can you use the algorithms? Uh, do you, you know, can you create an effective validation set? Uh, and can you can you create parts of the algorithm? implement them from scratch. So it'll be all about writing code, basically. So uh, if you're not comfortable writing code to practice machine learning, then you should be practicing that all the time. If you are comfortable, you should be practicing that all the time also. Whatever you're doing, write code to implement random, to do machine learning. Um, okay. So I, I kind of have a particular way of um, writing code, uh, and I'm not going to claim it's the only way of writing code, but it might be a little bit different to what you're used to, and hopefully you'll find it at least interesting. Um, creating, implementing random forest algorithms um, is actually quite tricky, not because the code's tricky, like generally speaking, most random forest algorithms are, pr are pretty conceptually easy. You know, they're, Generally speaking, uh, academic papers and books have a, a knack of making them look difficult, um, but they're not difficult conceptually. What's difficult is getting all the details right and knowing and knowing when you're right. And so in other words, we need a good way of doing testing. So uh, if we're going to re-implement something that already exists, so like say we wanted to create a random forest in some different uh, framework, different language, different operating system, you know, I would always start with something that does exist, right? So in this case, we're just going to do as a learning ex exercise, writing a random forest in Python. So for testing, I'm going to compare it to an existing random forest implementation. Okay, so that's like critical. Anytime you're doing anything involving like non-trivial amounts of code in machine learning, knowing whether you've got it right or wrong is kind of the hardest bit. Uh, I always assume that I've screwed everything up at every step, and so I'm thinking like, okay, assuming that I screwed it up, how do I figure out that I screwed it up, right? And then much to my surprise, from time to time, I actually get something right, and then I can move on. Okay? But most of the time I, I, I get it wrong. Uh, so unfortunately with machine learning, there's a lot of ways you can get things wrong that don't give you an error. They just make your result like slightly less good. Uh, and so that's that's what you want to pick up. So given that I want to kind of compare it to an existing implementation, I'm going to use our existing data set, 
our existing validation set, and then to simplify things, I'm just going to use uh, two columns um, to start with. So let's go ahead and start writing a random forest. So my way of writing nearly all code is top-down, just like my teaching. And so by top-down, I start by assuming that everything I want already exists. Right? So in other words, the first thing I want to do, I'm going to call this a tree ensemble. Right? So to create a random forest, the first question I have is, what do I need to pass in? Right? What do I need to initialize my random forest? So I'm going to need some independent variables, some dependent variable, pick how many trees I want. Uh, I'm going to use the sample size parameter from the start here, so how big do you want each sample to be? And then maybe some uh, optional parameter of what's the smallest leaf size. Okay. Um, for testing, it's nice to use a constant random seed, so we'll get the same result each time. So this is just how you set a random seed. Okay. Um, maybe it's worth mentioning this for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Random number generators on computers aren't random at all. They're actually called pseudo-random number generators. And what they do is, given some initial starting point, in this case 42, a pseudo-random number generator is a mathematical function that generates a deterministic, always the same, sequence of numbers, such that those numbers are designed to be as uncorrelated with the previous number as possible, okay? uh, and as unpredictable as possible, and as uncorrelated as possible with something with a different random seed. So the second number in, in the sequence starting with 42 should be very different to the second number starting with 41. And generally they involve kind of like taking, you know, uh, uh, you know, using big prime numbers and uh, taking mods and stuff like that. Um, it's kind of an interesting area of math. Um, if you want real random numbers, the only way to do that is you can actually buy hardware called a hardware random number generator that will have inside them like a little bit of some radioactive substance and and like something that detects how many things it's spitting out or you know there'll be some hardware thing getting current um system time is is it a valid random like random number generation in that sense so that would be for maybe for a random seed right so this thing of like what do we start the function with so one of the really interesting areas is like in your computer, if you don't set the random seed, what is it set to? And um, yeah, quite often people use the current time for security. Like obviously, we use a lot of random number stuff for security stuff. Like if you're generating an SSH key, you need some. It needs to be random. Um, it turns out like you know people can figure out roughly when you created a key. Like they could look at like oh IDRSA has a timestamp. And they could try, you know, all of the different nanoseconds starting points for a random number generator around that time step and figure out your key. So in practice, um, a lot of like really random, um, uh, high randomness requiring applications actually have a step that say, please move your mouse and type random stuff at the keyboard for a while. And so it like gets you to be a source. It's called entropy to be a source of entropy. Um, other approaches is they'll look at like. You know the hash of of some of your log files, or you know um, stuff like that. Uh, it's a really really fun area. Uh, so in our case, our purpose actually is to remove randomness. So we're saying, okay, generate a series of pseudo random numbers starting with forty two. So it always should be the same. Um, so uh, if you haven't done much stuff in Python OO, this is a basically standard idiom. At least I mean. I write it this way, most people don't, but uh, if you pass in like uh, one, two, three, four, five things that you're going to want to keep inside this object, uh, then you basically have to say self.x equals x, self.y equals y, self.sample equals sample. Right? And so we can uh, assign to a tuple uh, from a tuple. So, you know, again, this is like my way of coding. Most people think this is horrible, but I prefer to be able to see everything. At once, and so I know in my code. Anytime I see something that looks like this, it's always all of the um, stuff in the method being set. If I did it a different way, then half the codes now come off the bottom of the page, and you can't see it. So, all right. So, um, 
So that was the first thing I thought about was like okay to create a random forest What information do you need uh, then I'm going to need to store that information inside my object and so then I need to create some trees Right, a random forest is something that creates some, is something that has some trees. So I fi basically figured, okay, list comprehension to create a list of trees. How many trees do we have? Well, we've got n trees, trees. That's what we asked for. So a range n trees gives me the numbers from zero up to n trees at minus one. Okay. So if I create a list comprehension that loops through that range, calling create tree each time, I now have n trees, trees. And now, so I, I to write that I didn't have to think at all. Like that's all like obvious. And so I've kind of delayed the thinking to the point where it's like, well, wait, we don't have something to create a tree. Okay, no worries. But let's pretend we did. If we did, we've now created a random forest. Okay, we still need to like do a few things on top of that. Uh, for example, once we have it, we'd need a predict function. So okay, well let's write a predict function. How do you predict in a random forest? Can somebody tell me, uh, either based on their own understanding or based on this line of code, what would be like your one or two sentence answer? How do you make a prediction in a random forest? Uh, Pastor Spencer? Uh, you would want to, over every tree for your, like the row that you're trying to predict on, Average the values that your that each tree would produce for that. Uh, exactly. That row. Good. And so you know uh, that's a summary of what this says, right? So for a particular row, right, or maybe this is a number of rows, um, go through each tree, calculate its prediction. So here is a list comprehension that is calculating the prediction for every tree for x. I don't know if x is one row or multiple rows. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, uh, as long as as long as tree dot predict works on it, and then once you've got a list of things, uh, a cool trick to know is you can pass numpy dot mean a, a regular non numpy list, okay, uh, and it'll take the mean. Uh, you just need to tell it axis equals zero means uh, average it across the lists, okay. So this is going to return the average of dot predict for each tree, and so. I find list comprehensions allow me to write the code in the way that my brain works. Like you, you could take the words Spencer said and like translate them into this code, or you could take this code and translate them into words like the one Spencer said. Right? And so when I write code, I want it to be as much like that as possible. Right? I want it to be readable. And so hopefully you'll find like when you look at the fast AI code and you're trying to understand well how did Jeremy do X. I try to write things in a way that you can read it and like kind of turn it into English in your head. So if I say correctly, that predict method is recursive. It's called... no, it's calling tree dot predict, and we haven't written a tree yet. So self dot trees is going to contain a tree object. So this is tree ensemble dot predict. And inside the trees is a tree, not a tree ensemble. So this is calling tree dot predict, not tree ensemble dot predict. Good question. Okay, so we've nearly finished writing our random forest, haven't we? All we need to do now is write create tree, right? So um, based on this code here, or on your own understanding of how we create trees in a random forest, can somebody tell me? Um, let's take a few seconds, have a read, have a think, and then I'm going to try and come up with a way of saying how do you create a tree in a random forest? Okay, who wants to tell me? Anybody else? Uh, okay, let's. Tyler's got closer. Uh, you take your. Uh, you, you're essentially taking a random sample or of the original data, and then you're just Get just constructing a tree however that happens. So construct a decision tree like a non-random tree from a random sample of the data Okay, so again like we've delayed any actual thought process here We've basically said okay. We could pick some random IDs. This is a good trick to know um, if you call np.random.permutation passing in an int 
it'll give you back a randomly shuffled sequence from zero to that int, right? And so then if you grab the first colon n items of that, that's now a random subsample. So this is not doing bootstrapping, we're not doing sampling with replacement here, um, uh, which I think is fine, you know, for my random forest I'm deciding that it's going to be something where we do the subsampling, not bootstrapping. Okay, so here's a good line of code to know how to write, uh, because it, it comes up all the time, like I find in machine learning most algorithms I use are uh, somewhat random, and uh, so often I need some kind of random sample. Can you pass that, Tyler or Chen Shi? Uh, won't that give you one one extra? Because the you said it'll go from zero to length. Um, no. So this will give you if len self dot y is of size n. This will give you n. A sequence of length n, so zero to n minus one. Okay. And then from that, I'm picking out colon self dot sample size, so the first sample size IDs. Uh, I have a comment on bootstrapping. I think this method is better because we have chance of uh, giving more weights to each observation. Or am I thinking wrong? No, I mean I think you, for bootstrapping, we could also give weights. I mean, uh, weighing uh, single observations more than they are like without wanting that weight, because when bootstrapping with re replacement, we can have a single observation and duplicates of it in yeah. the same tree. Yeah. Which will give... It does feel weird, but I think mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the actual theory or empirical results backs up our intuition mm -hmm. that it's worse. Um, it would be in interesting to look. We'll look back at that actually. Um, personally, I prefer this because I feel like most of the time we have more data than we want to put in a tree at once. I feel like back when Bryman created Random Forests, it was 1999, it was kind of a very different world, you know, where we pretty much always wanted to use all the data we had. Um, but nowadays, I would say that's generally not what we want. Um, we normally have too much data. And so what people tend to do is they'll like fire up a Spark cluster and they'll run it on hundreds of machines, when it makes no sense because if they had just used a subsample each time, they could have done it on one machine. And like the the overhead of like Spark is a huge amount of I/O overhead. Like I know you guys are doing distributed computing now. If you if you've looked at some of the benchmarks, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, if you do something on a single machine, it can often be hundreds of times faster. Um, because you don't have all this this, this I/O overhead, it also tends to be easier to write the algorithms. Like you can use like sklearn, um, easier to visualize, uh, cheaper, so forth. So like I almost always avoid distributed computing, and I have my whole life. Like even 25 years ago, when I was starting in machine learning, I you know still didn't use clusters because I was, I always feel like whatever I could do with a cluster now, I could do with a single machine in five years time. So why don't us focus on always being as good as possible with a single machine, you know, and that's going to be more interactive and more iterative and um, work for me. So, uh, okay, so um, so again, we've like delayed thinking um, uh, to the point where we have to write decision tree, and so hopefully you get an idea that this top-down approach, the goal is going to be that we're going to keep delaying thinking so long that that we delay it forever. Like, like eventually we've somehow written the whole thing without actually having to think, right? And that's that's kind of what I need because I'm kind of slow, right? So this is why I write code this way. And notice, like, you never have to design anything. You know, you just say, hey, what if somebody already gave me the exact API I needed? How would I use it? Okay, and then and then okay to implement that next stage, what would be the exact API I would need to implement that? Right? And you keep going down until eventually you're like, oh, that already exists. Okay, so uh, this assumes we've got a class called decision tree, so we're going to have to create that. So a decision tree uh, is something. So we we already know what we're going to have to pass it because we just passed it, right? So we're passing in um, a random sample of x's, a random sample of y's, um, uh, 
index is, is actually um, so we know that down the track so I, 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 I've got to plan a tiny bit we know that a decision tree is going to contain decision trees which themselves contain decision trees and so as we go down the decision tree there's going to be some subset of the original data that we've kind of got and so I'm going to pass in the indexes of the data that we're actually going to use here okay so initially it's the entire random sample right so I've got the whole let's see, let's see. I've got the whole range uh, and I turn that into an array so that's zero the index is from zero to the size of the sample and then we'll just pass down the min leaf size so everything that we got for constructing the random forest we're going to pass down to the decision tree except of course num trees which is irrelevant for the decision tree so again now that we know that's the information we need we can go ahead and store it inside this object um, so I'm pretty likely to need to know uh, how many rows we have in this tree which I generally call n uh, how many columns do I have which I generally call C So the number of rows is just equal to the number of indexes we were given and the number of columns is just like however many columns there are in our independent variables. Um, so then we're going to need this value here. We need to know for this tree uh, what's its prediction, right? So The prediction for this tree is the mean of our dependent variable for those indexes which are inside this part of the tree. Right? So at the very top of the tree, it contains all the indexes. Right? I'm assuming that by the time we've got to this point, remember, we've already done the um, random sampling. Right? So when we're talking about indexes, we're not talking about the random sampling to create the tree. We're assuming this tree now has some random sample. Inside decision tree, this is, this is the, the, one of the nice things, right? Inside decision tree, the whole random sampling thing's gone. Right? That was done by the random forest. Right? So at this point, we're building something that's just a plain old decision tree. It's not in any way a random sampling anything. It's just a plain old decision tree. Right? So the indexes is literally like which subset of the data have we got to so far in this tree and so at the top of the decision tree it's all the data right so it's all of the indexes okay so all of the indexes uh, so this is therefore all of the dependent variable that are in this part of the tree and so this is the value mean of that does that make sense anybody got any questions about about that So, uh, yes, can you pass it to Chen Actually, just to let you know that a large portion of us don't have a OOP, I mean, OOP experience. Okay, yeah, sure. Just to so, um, so, a quick, so a quick OOP primer would be helpful? Great, yeah, okay. Um, who has done object-oriented programming in some programming language? Okay. Um, So you've all used actually lots of object-oriented programming in terms of using existing classes, right? So every time we've created a random forest, um, we've called the random forest's constructor, and it's returned an object, and then we've called methods and attributes on that object. So fit is a method. You can tell because it's got parentheses after it, right? Or else, um, yeah, OOB score is a, a, a property uh, or an attribute, doesn't have parentheses after it. Okay, so inside an object, there are kind of two kinds of things. There are the, the functions that you can call. Um, so you, you, you have object dot function parenthesis arguments, or there are the properties or attributes you can grab, which is object dot and then just the attribute name with no parentheses. So when, uh, and then the other thing that we do with objects is we create them. Okay. We pass in the name of the class and it returns us the object and you have to tell it all of the parameters necessary to, con to get constructed. So let's just copy this code. And 
and see how we're going to go ahead and build this. So the first step is we're not going to go m equals random forest regressor. We're going to go m equals tree ensemble. We're creating a class called tree ensemble, and we're going to pass in. Various bits of information, okay? Um, so maybe we'll have ten trees, a sample size of a thousand, and maybe a min leaf of three, right? And you can always like choose to name your arguments or not. So when you've got quite a few, it's kind of nice to name them so that just so we can see what each one means. It's always optional, right? Um, so we're going to try and create a class. That we can use like this, and then um, I'm not sure we're going to bother with dot fit um, because we've passed in the x and the y, right? Like in in Scikit-Learn, they use an approach where first of all you construct something without telling it what data to use, and then you pass in the data. Uh, we're doing these two steps at once. We're actually passing in the data, right? And so then after that, we're going to be going m dot So we're going to go preds equals m dot predict, passing in maybe some validation set. Okay, so we're, that's that's the API we're kind of creating here. So this thing here is called a constructor. Something that creates an, an object is called a constructor. Uh, and Python, um, there's a lot of ugly, hideous things about Python. One of which is they it uses these special magic. Method names underscore underscore in it underscore underscore is a special magic method that's called that's called when you try to construct a class. So when I call tree ensemble parenthesis, it actually calls tree ensemble dot. People say dunder in it. I kind of hate it, but anyway, dunder in it, double underscore in it, double underscore dunder dunder in it. Um, so that's why we've got this method called dunder in it. Okay, so when I call tree ensemble, it's going to call this method. Another hideously ugly thing about Python's OO is that there's this special thing where if you have a class and to create a class, you just write class in the name of the class. Um, all of its methods uh, automatically get sent one extra parameter, one extra argument, which is the first argument, and you can call it anything you like. If you call it anything other than self, everybody will hate you and you're a bad person. Okay, so call it anything you like, as long as it's self. Okay, so um, so that's why you always see this. And in fact, I can immediately see here I have a bug. Anybody see the bug in my predict function? I should have self, right? I I like I always do it right so any time you try and call a method on your own class and you get something saying you passed in two parameters and it was only expecting one you forgot self okay uh, so like this is a really dumb way to add oop to a programming language but the older languages like python often did this because they kind of needed to they started out not being oo and then they kind of added oo uh, in a way that was hideously ugly so Perl, um which predates python by a little bit kind of I think really came up with this approach, and unfortunately, other languages of that era stuck with it. Um, so you have to add in this magic self. So the magic self now, um, when you're inside this class, you can now pretend as if any property name you like exists. So I can now pretend there's something called self.x. I can read from it. I can write to it, right? But if I read from it and I haven't yet written to it, I'll get an error. So the stuff that's passed to the constructor gets thrown away by default. Like there's nothing that like says you need to this class needs to remember what these things are. But anything that we stick inside self is remembered for all time. You know, as long as this object exists, you can access it. It's remembered. So now that I've gone, um, in fact, let's do this, right? So let's let's create the tree ensemble class. And let's now instantiate it. Okay. Uh, of course, we haven't got x. Uh, we need to call x train y train. Okay. Decision tree is not defined, so let's 
create a really minimal decision tree. There we go. Okay, so here is enough to actually instantiate our tree ensemble. Okay, so we've defined the init for it. We've defined the init for decision tree. We need decision trees in it to be defined because inside our ensemble init it called self .create tree and then self.createTree called the decision tree constructor, and then decision tree constructor basically does nothing at all other than save some information. Right? So at this point, we can now go m dot. Oh, sorry. Okay, and if I press tab at this point, can anybody tell me what I would expect to see? Pass it to Taylor. Chen Shi, could you pass that to Taylor? Um, we would see like a we would see a drop down of all available methods for that class. Okay, which uh, would that, be uh, in this case. So if M is a tree ensemble, we would have create tree and predict. Okay. Anything else? Um, would it, what? Oh yeah, and as well as Ernest whispered the variables. As well, uh, yeah. So the the so, variable could mean a lot of things. We'll so say the attributes. Yes. So the things that we put inside self. So if I hit tab, right there they are. Right as Taylor said, there's create tree. There's predict, and then there's everything else we put inside self, right? So if I look at uh, m dot min leaf, if I hit shift enter, what will I see? Yeah, the number that I just put there, I put min leaf is three, so that went up here to min leaf. This here is a default argument, so it says if I don't pass anything, it'll be five, but I did pass something, right? So it's three. Self dot min leaf. Here is going to be equal to min leaf here. Okay. So something which, uh, like, because of this rather annoying way of doing OO, it does mean that it's very easy to accidentally forget to do that, right? So if I don't assign it to self dot min leaf, right, then I get an error. And so here, tree ensemble doesn't have a min leaf. Right? So how do I create that attribute? I just put something in it. Okay, so if you want to like, if you don't know what a value of it should be yet, but you kind of need to be able to refer to it, you can always go like self dot min leaf equals none, right? So at least there's, there's something you can read, check for nonness, and not have an error. Okay. Great. Now, interestingly. I was able to instantiate tree ensemble even though predict refers to a method of decision tree that doesn't exist. And this is actually something very nice about the dynamic nature of Python is that because it's not like compiling it, it's not checking anything unless you're using it. Right? So we can go ahead and, and create decision D dot predict later. And then our our instantiated object will magically start working, right? It doesn't actually look up that functions that methods details until you use it, and so it really helps with top-down programming. Um, okay, so when you're inside a class definition, in other words, you're at that indentation level, you know, indented one in. So these are all class definitions. Uh, any function that you create, unless you do some special things that we're not going to talk about yet, um, is automatically a method of that class. And so every method of that class magically gets a self passed to it. Uh, so we could call, since we've got a tree ensemble, we could call m.createTree, and we don't put anything inside those parentheses, because the magic self will be passed. And the magic self will be whatever m is. Okay, so m dot create tree returns a decision tree just like we asked it to, right? So m dot create tree dot idxs will give us the self dot idxs inside the decision tree, okay? Which is set to np dot arrange range self dot sample size. Right? Um, why as data scientists do we care about object oriented programming? Um, because a lot of the stuff you use is going to require you to implement stuff with OOP. For example, 
every single PyTorch model of any kind is created with OOP. It's the only way to create PyTorch models. Um, good news is, um, what you see here is the entirety of what you need to know. So you, this is all you need to know. You need to know to create something called init, to assign the things that are passed to init to something called self, and then to stick the word self after each of your methods. Okay, and so the nice thing is like now to think as an OOP programmer is to realize you don't now have to pass around x, y, sample size, and min leaf to every function that uses them. By assigning them to, to attributes of self, they're now available like magic. Right? So this is why OOP is super handy. If you're particularly, like I started trying to create a decision tree initially without using OOP and try to like keep track of like what that decision tree was meant to know about was very difficult, you know, or else with OOP you can just say inside the decision tree, you know, self.index is equals this and everything just works. Okay, okay, that's great. So we're out of time. I think that's um, that's great timing because there's an introduction to OOP, but this week, you know, next class I'm going to assume that you can use it, right? So you should create some classes, instantiate some classes, um, look at their methods and properties, uh, have them call each other and so forth until you feel comfortable with them. And maybe um, for those of you that haven't done OOP before you and find some other useful resources, you could pop them onto the wiki thread so that other people know what you find um, useful. Great, thanks everybody. So we've looked at um, a lot of different uh, random in uh, random forest interpretation techniques, and a question that's come up a little bit on the forums is like, what are these for, really? Like, like how do these help me get a better score on Kaggle? And my answer's kind of been like. They don't necessarily, and so I want to talk more about like why do we do machine learning? Like, what's the point? Um, and to answer this question, I'm going to put this PowerPoint in the GitHub repo so you can have a look. Um, I want to show you something really important, which is examples of how people have used machine learning, um, mainly in, in business, because um, that's where most of you are probably going to end up after this is working for some company. I'm going to show you applications of machine learning which are either based on things that I've been personally involved in myself or know of people who are doing them directly. So these are none of these are going to be like um, hypotheticals, these are all actual things that people are, are, are doing and I've got direct or secondhand knowledge of. I'm going to split them into two groups, horizontal and vertical. So in business, horizontal means um, something that you do like across different kinds of business, uh, whereas vertical means it's something that you do within, you know, within a business or within a supply chain or within a process. So in other words, an example of horizontal applications is um, everything involving marketing. So like every company pretty much has to try to sell more products to its customers, uh, and so therefore does marketing. And so each of these boxes are um, examples of some of the things that people are using machine learning for in marketing. So let's take an example, right? Let's take um, churn. Okay, so churn um, refers to a model which attempts to predict who's going to leave. Right, so I've done some churn modeling fairly recently in, uh, in telecommunications. And so we're trying to figure out for this big cell phone company which customers are going to leave. Um, that is not of itself that interesting. Like building a highly predictive predictive model that says Jeremy Howard is almost certainly going to leave next month. It's probably not that helpful because, like, if I'm almost certainly going to leave next month, there's probably nothing you can do about it. Right? It's it's too late. It's going to cost you too much to keep me. Right? So, in order to understand, like, well, why would we do churn modeling? Um, I've got a little 
framework that you might find helpful. So if you Google for Jeremy Howard data products, I think I've mentioned this thing before, um, there's a paper you can find, Designing Great Data Products, that uh, I wrote with a couple of colleagues a few years ago. And in it I describe um, my experience of actually turning machine learning models into like stuff that makes money. Right? And the basic uh, trick is uh, this thing I call the drivetrain approach, which is, uh, which is these four steps. The starting point to actually turn a machine learning project into something that's actually useful is to know what am I trying to achieve. And that doesn't mean like I'm trying to achieve a high area under the ROC curve, or I'm trying to achieve a high, large difference between classes. No. It would be, I'm trying to sell more books, or I'm trying to reduce the number of customers that leave next month, or I'm trying to detect lung cancer earlier. Right? These are things that these are objectives. So the objective is something that absolutely directly is the thing that the, the company or the organization actually wants. No company or organization lives in order to create a you know uh, uh, a more accurate predictive model. Right? There's some reason. Right? So that's your objective. Now that's obviously the most important thing. If you don't know the purpose of what you're modeling for, then you can't possibly do a good job of it. And hopefully people are starting to you know, pick that up in, 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 out there in the world of, of data science. But interestingly, what very few people are talking about, but it's just as important, is the next thing, which is levers. A lever is a thing that the organization can do to actually drive the objective. So let's take the example of churn modeling. Right? What is a lever that an organization could use to reduce the number of customers that are leaving? Uh, they could look, uh, take a closer look at the model and do some of this random forest interpretation and see some of the causes that are causing people to leave and potentially change those issues in the company. Okay, so that's a, that's a data scientist answer, but I want you to go to the next level. What are the things? The levers are the things they can do. Do you want to put it past it behind you? What are the things that they can do? Just outreach, like calling or sending emails. They could call someone and say, like, um, are you happy? Anything we could do? Okay. Uh, they can provide incentives to increase engagement with the product. Uh, yeah, so they could, like, give them a, a, a free pen or something um, if they, you know, buy 20 bucks worth of product next month. Yep. You are going to do that as well? Okay, so you guys, you guys are the giving out carrots rather than the handing out sticks. Do you want to send it over in a couple of guys? Actually, change the price of the product or the subscription, or yeah, you could you could give them a special. All right, so these are levers, right? And so whenever you're working as a data scientist, you know, keep coming back and thinking, what are we trying to achieve? We being the organization. And how are we trying to achieve it? Being like, what are the actual things we can do to make that objective happen? So, building a model is never ever a lever, okay? But it could help you with the lever. So then the next step is, what data does the organization have that could possibly help them to set that lever to achieve that objective, right? And so this is not what data did they give you when you started the project, right? But like think about it from a first principles point of view. Okay, I'm working for a telecommunications company, they gave me some certain set of data, but I'm sure they must know where their customers live, how many phone calls they made last month, how many times they called customer service, whatever. Like, and so have a think about like, okay, if we're trying to decide like, um, who should we reduce the, you know, give a special offer to proactively? Um, then we want to figure out like what information do we have that might help us to identify who's going to react well or badly to that. Um, perhaps more interestingly would be what if we were doing like a fraud algorithm, 
right? And so we're trying to figure out like who's going to like not pay for the phone that they that they take out of the store. You know, they're they're on some twelve month payment plan. We never see them again. Now in that case, the data we have available. It doesn't matter what's in the database. What matters is what's the data that we can get when the customer is in the shop, right? So there's often constraints around the data that we can actually use. So we need to know what am I trying to achieve? What can I actually? What can this organization actually do specifically to change that outcome? And at the point that that decision is being made, what data do they have or could they collect, right? And so then the way I put that all together is with a model, and this is not a model in the sense of a predictive model, but it's a model in the sense of a simulation model. So uh, one of the main examples I give in this paper is one I spent many years building, which is if an insurance company changes their prices, how does that impact their profitability? Right? And so generally your simulation model contains a number of predictive models. So I had, for example, a predictive model called an elasticity model that said for a specific customer, if we charge them a specific price for a specific product, what's the probability that they would say yes, both uh, when it's new business and then a year later, what's the probability that they would renew? And then there's another predictive model, which is what's the probability that they're going to make a claim and how much is that claim going to be? Right? And so like you can combine these models together then to say, all right, if we changed our pricing by reducing it by 10% for everybody, everybody between 18 and 25, and we can run it through these models that combine together into a simulation, then the overall impact on our market share in 10 years' time is X, and our cost is Y, and our profit is Z, and so forth. Right? So in practice, most of the time, you really are going to care more about kind of the results of that simulation than you do about the predictive model directly. Um, but most people are not doing this effectively at the moment. So for example, when I go to Amazon, right, I, I read all of Douglas Adams's books, right? And so having read all of Douglas Adams's books, the next time I went to Amazon, they said, would you like to buy the collected works of Douglas Adams? This is after I had bought every one of his books. So like from a machine learning point of view, some some data scientist had said, "Oh, people that buy one of Douglas Adams's books often go on to buy the collected works, right? But recommending to me that I buy the collected works of of Douglas Adams isn't smart." Right? And it's actually not smart at a number of levels. Like not only is it unlikely I'm going to buy a box set of something of which I have everyone individually, but furthermore, it's not going to change my buying behavior. Like, I already know about Douglas Adams, I already know I like him, so taking up your valuable web space to tell me, hey, maybe you should buy more of the author who you're already familiar with and have bought lots of times, isn't actually going to change my behavior. Right? So what if instead of creating a predictive model, Amazon had built an optimization model? That said, like that could simulate and said, if we show Jeremy this ad, how likely is he then to go on to buy this book? And if I don't show him this ad, how likely is he to go on to buy this book? And so that's the counterfactual, right? The counterfactual is what would have happened otherwise. And then you can take the difference and say, okay, what should we recommend him? That is going to maximally change his behavior, so maximally result in more books. And so you'd probably say like, oh, he's never bought any Terry Pratchett books. He probably doesn't know about Terry Pratchett, but like lots of people that liked Douglas Adams did turn out to like Terry Pratchett. So let's like introduce him to a new author, right? So it's the difference between a predictive model on the one hand versus an optimization model on the other hand. So the two tend to go. Hand in hand, right? The optimization model basically is saying, um, the, well, first of all, we have a simulation model, right? The simulation model is saying, in a world where we put Terry Pratchett's book on the front page of Amazon for Jeremy Howard, this is what would have happened. He would have bought it with a 94% probability, right? And so and that then tells us. With this lever of like, what do I put on the on my homepage for Jeremy today? 
we say, okay, of all the different settings of that lever, the put Terry Pratchett on the home page has the highest simulated outcome, right? And then that's the thing which maximizes our profit from Jeremy's visit to Amazon.com today, okay? So generally speaking, your predictive models kind of feed in to this simulation model, but you've kind of got to think about like how do they all work together. So for example, let's go back to churn, right? So I'd turn out that Jeremy Howard is very likely to leave his cell phone company next month. What are we going to do about it? Oh, let's call him. Right? And I can tell you, if my cell phone company calls me right now and says, just calling to say we love you, I'd be like, I'm cancelling right now. <laughs> like, like that would be a terrible idea. So again, you'd want a simulation model that says like, what's the probability that Jeremy is going to change his behavior as a result of calling him right now? Right? So a one of the levers I have is call him. On the other hand, if I like got a piece of mail tomorrow that said like, for each month you stay with us, we're going to give you $100,000, okay, then that's going to definitely change my behavior. Right? Um, so, but then, feeding that into the simulation model, it turns out that overall that would be an unprofitable choice to make. So do you see how all this fits in together? Right? So, so when we look at something like churn, we want to be thinking like what are the levers we can pull, right? And so what are the kind of models that we could build with what kinds of data to help us pull those levers better to achieve our objectives? And so when you think about it that way, you realize that the vast majority of these applications are not largely about a predictive model at all, they're about interpretation, they're about understanding what happens if. right? So if we kind of take the cross-product, uh, not the cross-product, sorry, the inter intersection between, on the one hand, here are all the levers that we could pull, like here are all the things we can do, and then here are all of the features from our random forest feature importance that turn out to be strong drivers of the outcome. And so then the intersection of those is, here are the levers we could pull that actually matter. right? Because if you can't change the thing, then it's not very interesting. And if it's not actually a significant driver, it's not very interesting. right? So we can actually use our random forest feature importance to tell us um, what can we actually do to make a difference. And then we can use the partial dependence to actually build this kind of simulation model to say like, okay, well if we did change that, what would happen? Right? Um, so you know there are examples, lots and lots of these vertical examples. And so what I want you to kind of think about as you think about the machine learning problems you're working on is like, why does somebody care about this, right? And like, what would a good answer to them? look like and how could you you know how could you actually positively impact this business so if you're creating like a Kaggle kernel you know try to think about from the point of view of the competition organizer like what would they want to know and how can you give them that information so something like um, fraud detection on the other hand you probably just basically want to know who's fraudulent Right? So you probably do just care about the predictive model, but then you do have to think carefully about the data availability here. So it's like, okay, but we need to know who's fraudulent at the point that we're about to deliver them a product. Right? So it's no point like looking at data that's available like a month later, for instance. So you've kind of got this, this key issue of thinking about you know, the actual operational constraints that you're working under. Um, you know, lots of interesting applications in human resources, but like employee churn, it's another kind of churn model, we're finding out that Jeremy Howard's sick of lecturing, he's going to leave tomorrow, um, what are you going to do about it? Well, knowing that wouldn't actually be helpful, it'd be too late, right? You would actually want a model that said, what kinds of people, you know, are leaving USF? And it turns out that like, oh, everybody that goes to the downstairs cafe leaves USF, you know, I guess their food is awful, or, you know, whatever, right? Or everybody that we're paying less than half a million dollars a year is leaving USF, you know, because they can't afford basic housing in San Francisco. Um, 
Uh, so like you could use your employee churn model not so much to say like which employees hate us, but why do employees leave, right? Um, and so again, it's really the interpretation there that, that matters. Um, now, lead prioritization is a really interesting one, right? Like this is one where a lot of companies. Um, yes, Dina, uh, can you pass that over there? Yeah, so I was just wondering. So, like for the churn thing, uh, you suggested so one way is like uh, pay an employee like one million a year or something. But then it sounds like there are two predictors that you need to predict for. I mean, one the churn and one you need to optimize for like your profit thing. So how does it work in that? Yeah, exactly. So this is what this like simulation model is all about. So it's a great question. So like you kind of figure out this objective we're trying to maximize, which is like company profitability. You can kind of create like a pretty simple like Excel model or something that says like here's the revenues and here's the costs and the cost is equal to the you know number of people we employ multiplied by their salaries, blah 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 blah, right? And so inside that kind of Excel model, there are certain cells, there are certain inputs where you're like, oh, that thing's kind of stochastic, you know, or that thing is kind of uncertain, but we could predict it with a model. And so that's kind of what I what I do then is I then say, okay, we need a predictive model for um, how likely somebody is to stay if we change their salary, how much how likely they are to leave, you know, with their current salary. Um, how likely they are to leave next year if they if I increase their salary now, blah blah blah. So you kind of build a bunch of these models, and then you can bind them together with simple business logic, and then you can optimize that. You can then say, okay, if I, you know, pay Jeremy Howard half a million dollars, that's probably a really good idea, you know. And if I pay him less, then you know it's probably not, or whatever. Like you can figure out the the overall impact. And so it's. It's really shocking to me how few people do this. Like most people in industry, measure their models using like AUC or RMSE or whatever, um, which is never actually what you want. Yes, can you pass it over here? In, I, I wanted to stress a point that you made before. Um, in my experience, a lot of um, the Problem was to define the problem, right? So you you are in a company, you are talking to somebody that doesn't have like this mentality that you have. They don't know that you have to have X and Y and so on. So you have to try to get that out of them. You know what exactly do you want, and try to go through a few iterations of understanding what they want, and then you know the data, you know where the data is, you know actually where you can measure, which is often know what they want, so you have to kind of get a proxy for what they want, and then so a, a lot of what you do is not that much of like. Well, some people do actually just work on really good models for, you know, but a lot of people also just work on this kind of how do you put this as a, you know, classification, regression, or some other type of modeling. That's actually kind of the most interesting, I think, and also kind of what's kind of what you have to do well. I think. Yeah, the best yeah. people do both. You know, yeah, the best yeah. People yeah. understand the technical model building deeply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but also, understand the kind of strategic context deeply. And so this is one way to think about it. And as I say, like, you know, uh, I actually think, you know, there aren't many articles I wrote in 2012 I'm still recommending, but this one I think is still equally valid today. Um, so yeah, so like another great example is, is lead prioritization, right? So like a lot of companies like every one of these boxes I'm showing, you can generally find a company or many companies whose sole job in life is to build models of that thing, right? So there are lots of companies that sell lead prioritization systems. Um, but again, like the question is, how would we use that information, right? So if it's like, oh, our best lead is Jeremy, you know, he's our highest probability of buying, does that mean I should send a salesperson out to Jeremy, or I shouldn't? Like if he's highly probable to buy, why waste my time with him? You know, 
Um, so like again, it's like you really want some kind of simulation that says like what's the chain the likely change in Jeremy's behavior if I send my best salesperson Yannette out to go and like Encourage him to sign. Okay, so Yeah, I think this this is like there are many many opportunities for data scientists in the world today to move beyond predictive modeling to actually bringing it all together um, You know with the kind of stuff that Dina was talking about uh, in her question, so As well as these horizontal applications that basically apply to like every company There's a whole bunch of applications that are specific to like every part of the world, right? So if, for those of you that end up in healthcare, some of you will become experts in one or more of these areas, like um, readmission risk. Okay, so what's the probability that this patient is going to come back to the hospital? And readmission is um, depending on the details of, of the, the jurisdiction and so forth. It can be a disaster. For hospitals when somebody is readmitted, right? So if you find out that this patient has a high probability of readmission What do you do about it? Well again, the predictive model is helpful of itself, right? It rather suggests like we just shouldn't send them home yet because they're going to come back But wouldn't it be nice if we had the tree interpreter and it said to us the reason that they're at high risk is because we don't have a recent EKG for them and without a recent EKG we can't have a high confidence about their you know cardiac health In which case it wouldn't be like well, let's keep them in the hospital for two weeks. It'll be like let's give them an EKG Okay, so this is this is interaction between interpretation and predictive accuracy Okay So correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but what I'm understanding you saying is that the predictive models are a really great starting point, but in order to actually like answer these questions, we really need to focus on the interpretability of these models. Yeah, I think so. And and more specifically, I'm saying like we just learned a whole raft of random forest interpretation techniques, and so I'm kind of just kind of trying to justify like well, why, right? And so. Um, The reason why is because actually maybe I'd say most of the time the interpretation is the thing we care about and like You can create a chart, you know or a table without machine learning and Indeed that's how most of the world works right most managers like build all kinds of tables and charts without any machine learning behind them But they often make terrible decisions because like, they don't know the feature importance of the objective they're interested in So the table they create is of things that actually are the least important things anyway Or they just do a univariate chart rather than a partial dependence plot So they don't actually realize that the relationship they thought they're looking at is due entirely to something else, right? Um, so You know, I'm kind of arguing for data scientists getting like much more deeply involved in in strategy and in trying to use machine learning to really help You know help a business with all of its objectives, right? Um, you know, there's like there are companies like Dunhumby is a huge company that does nothing but retail applications of machine learning and so like I believe there's like a Dunhumby product you can buy which will help you uh, Which will help you figure out like if I put my new store in this location versus that location How much you know how many people are going to shop there? Um, or if I put like you know my diapers in this part of the shop versus that part of the shop How's that going to impact you know purchasing behavior or whatever? Right? So it's I think it's also good to realize that like The subset of machine learning applications you tend to hear about, you know, um, in in the tech press or whatever, is this massively biased, tiny subset of stuff which kind of Google and Facebook do. Um, whereas the vast majority of stuff that actually makes the world go round is, you know, these kinds of applications that actually help people make things, buy things, sell things, build things, so forth. Um. Uh, so about 
tree interpretation, the way we looked at the tree was we manually checked which feature could cause uh, could was more important for for particular observation. But for businesses, they would have huge amount of data and they they want this interpretation for a lot of observations. So how do they automate it? I don't think the automation is at all difficult. Like you just you can run any of these algorithms, like looping through the rows or doing them in parallel. Um, it's all just code. Am I misunderstanding your question? Is it like uh, they set a threshold that if some feature is above, like for different different people will have different behavior? And oh, so so yeah. Okay, I, I get it. That's a, that's a good question. The, the important thing. This is a really important issue, actually. Is the vast majority of machine learning models don't automate anything. They're designed to provide information to humans, right? So, for example, um, if you're uh, a point of sales, you know, uh, customer service phone operator for an insurance company, and your customer asks you, "Why is my renewal five hundred dollars more expensive than last time?" Then, hopefully, you know, the insurance company has provides in your terminal a little screen that shows the result of the tree interpreter or whatever and tells so that you can jump there and tell the customer like okay well here's last year uh, you're in this different zip code which you know is less uh, has lower amounts of um, uh, car theft and this year um, also you've actually changed your vehicle to a more expensive one or whatever right so it's not so much about thresholds and automation but about you know, making these model outputs available to the decision makers in an organization, whether they be at the top strategic level of like, you know, are we going to shut down this whole product or not, all the way to the operational level of like a, that, that individual discussion with a customer. Um, so like another example is like um, aircraft scheduling and gate management, like there's lots of companies that do that. Right, and basically, what happens is that the the people, you know, there are there are people in a, a, at an airport whose job it is to basically tell each aircraft what gate to go to, um, to figure out when to close the doors, stuff like that. And so the idea is, you know, you're giving them software which has the information they need to make good decisions. So the the machine learning models end up embedded in that software to kind of say like. Okay, that plane that's currently coming in from Miami, um, there's a 48% chance that it's going to be over five minutes late. And if it does, then this is going to be the knock-on impact through the rest of the terminal, for instance. Okay, so that's kind of how these things tend to fit together. So there's so many of these, right? There's lots and lots. And so it's not like, I don't expect you to like, remember all these applications, but what I do want you to do is to like, spend some time, like, Thinking about them, like sit down with one of your friends and like talk about a few examples of like, okay, um, how would we go about like doing failure analysis and manufacturing? I don't know, like you know, who who would be doing that? Why would be they doing it? What kind of models might they use? What kind of data might they use? Like start to like kind of practice this and get a sense. So because then as you're like interviewing, and then when you're at the workplace and you you know you're you're talking to managers. You want to be like straight away able to kind of recognize that the person you're talking to, what do they try to achieve? What are the levers that they have to pull, right? What is the data they have available to pull those levers to achieve that thing? And therefore, how could we build models to help them do that? And what kind of predictions would they have to be making, right? And so then you can have this really thoughtful, empathetic conversation with those people, kind of saying, like, hey, you know, in order to reduce the number of customers that are leaving, you know, I guess you're trying to figure out like, you know, who should you be providing better pricing to or whatever and, and so forth. So what I'm noticing like from your beautiful little chart above is that like a lot of this, to me at least, still seems like the primary purpose is like at the at least base level, like is predictive power. And so I guess my thing is, is like, 
for explanatory problems, like a lot of the ones that are people are faced with, like in social sciences, is that something machine learning can be used for, or is used for, or is that not really the realm that it? Is yeah, it's um, that's a great question, and I've had um, a lot of conversations about this with people in social sciences, and currently, machine learning is not well applied in like economics or psychology or whatever on the whole. Um, but I'm, I'm convinced it can be, for the exact reasons we're talking about. So if you're trying to figure out, like, if you're going trying to do some kind of behavioral economics and you're trying to understand, like, why some people behave differently to other people, you know, a, a, a random forest with a feature importance plot would be a great way to start. Or, like, more interestingly, if you're trying to do some kind of um, sociology experiment or, or analysis based on a um, large social network data set, where you have an observational study, you really want to try and pull out all of the sources of kind of uh, uh, exogenous variables, you know, all the stuff that's going on outside. And so if you use a partial dependence plot with a random forest, that happens automatically. So I actually um, gave a talk at MIT a couple of years ago for the first uh, conference on digital experimentation, um, which was really talking about like how do we experiment in you know things like social networks and kind of these digital environments and um, yeah economists economists all do things with like you know classic statistical tests but um, the group of yeah yeah um, so but anyway in this case. Um, the, the economists I talked to were absolutely fascinated by this, and they actually asked me to give a um, a introduction to machine learning session at MIT to these various faculty and graduate folks in the economics department. And so, um, and some of those folks have gone on to be, you know, write some pretty famous books and stuff. And so, hopefully, it's been useful. So, it's like, it's definitely early days, but it's a it's it's a big big opportunity. But as Yannette uh, says, it's um, you know, there's plenty of skepticism uh, still out there. All right. Huh? Well, the skepticism comes from unfamiliarity, basically, with like this totally different approach. So, like, if you've if you've spent twenty years studying econometrics, and somebody comes along and says. You know, here's a totally different approach to all the econometric, all the stuff that econometricians do. You know, naturally, your first reaction will be like, "Prove it." You know, so that's fair enough. Um, uh, but I think it's, you know, uh, over time, the next generation of people who are growing up with machine learning, some of them will move into the social sciences. They'll make huge impacts that nobody's ever managed to make before. And people will start going, wow, you know, just like happened in computer vision, right? When you know, computer vision spent a long time of people saying, like, hey, maybe you should use deep learning for computer vision, and everybody in computer vision is like, prove it. You know, we have decades of work on amazing feature detectors for computer vision, and then finally in 2012, you know, uh, Hinton and Krajewski came along and said, okay. Our model's like twice as good as yours, and you know we've only just started on this. And everybody was like, "Oh, okay, I, I, that's pretty convincing." And nowadays, <laughs> nowadays every computer vision researcher basically uses deep deep learning. So I think that time will come in the in this area too. Okay, I think what we might do then is. Um, Take a break, and we're going to come back and talk about uh, these random forest interpretation techniques and do a do a bit of a review. Uh, so let's come back uh, at uh, two o'clock. So let's uh, have a go at um, talking about these different random forest interpretation methods. Having talked about like why they're important. Um, so let's now remind ourselves like what they are. So um, I'm going to let you folks have a go. Uh, so let's let's start uh, with um, confidence based on tree variance. So can one of you tell me uh, 
one or more of the following things about confidence based on tree variance. So, um, what does it tell us? Uh, why would we be interested in that? And how is it calculated? So this is going back a ways because it was the first one we looked at. Uh, even if you're not sure, or you only know a little piece of it, give us your piece and we'll build on it together. Yeah, I, think I, got, I think I got a piece of it. It's, um, it's getting the, uh, the variance of our predictions from uh, random forests. That's true. That's the how. Uh, can you be more specific? So what is it the variance of? Uh, I think it's, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it's just the overall prediction. The variance of the predictions of the trees, yes. So normally the prediction is just the average, this is the variance of the trees. Yep. And so it kind of just gives you an idea of how much your prediction is going to vary. So if maybe you want to minimize variance, maybe that's your goal for whatever reason that could be. That's not so much the reason. So I like your calculation description. Let's see if somebody else can tell us how you might use that. It's okay if you're not sure. Yeah, have a start. Um, so I remember that we talked about uh, kind of the independence of the trees. And so uh, maybe something about if the variance of the trees is higher or low than, you know. If no, not so much then. Um, that's, that's, that's an interesting question, but it's, it's not what we're going to see here. Um, do you want to pass it back behind you? So to remind you, just to fill in a detail here, what we generally do here is we take a, 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 just one row, like one observation, uh, often, and like find out how confident we are about that, like how much variance there are in the trees for that, or we can do it as we did here for different groups. Uh, so uh, according to me, the idea is like for each row, we calculate the standard deviation uh, that we uh, get from the random forest model, and then maybe group according to different uh, variables or predictors, and see for which particular predictor the standard deviation is high. Uh -huh. And then uh, go deep down as in why it is happening. Maybe it is because a particular category of that variable has very less number of observations. Yeah, that's great. So that that would be one approach. Is kind of what we've done here is to say like, is there any groups that have uh, that where we're very unconfident? Um, something that I think is even more important would be um, when you're using this like operationally. Right, let's say you're doing um, a credit decisioning algorithm. So we're trying to say like, okay, is Jeremy a good risk or a bad risk? Should we loan him a million dollars? And the random forest says, I think he's a good risk, but I'm not at all confident. In which case we might say, okay, maybe I shouldn't give him a million dollars. Whereas if, we, if, if the random forest said, I think he's a good risk, I am very sure of that then we're much more comfortable giving him a million dollars, right? And I'm a very good risk, so feel free <laughs> to give me a million dollars, right? Uh, I checked the random forest before, a different notebook, not in the repo. Um, so like this is like, it's quite hard for me to give you folks direct experience with this kind of like single observation interpretation stuff because it, it's really like the kind of stuff that that you actually need to be putting out to the front line. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not something which you can really use so much in a kind of Kaggle context, but it's more like, okay, if you're actually putting out some algorithm which is making like big decisions that could cost a lot of money, you probably don't so much care about the average prediction of the random forest, but maybe you actually care about like the average minus a couple of standard deviations. You know, like what's the kind of worst case prediction? Um, and so, um, as Shikar mentioned, it's like maybe there's a whole group that we're kind of unconfident about. Um, so yeah, so that's confidence based on tree variance. All right. Who wants to have a go at answering feature importance? What is it? Why is it interesting? How do we calculate it? 
or any subset thereof. Dana? I think it's like, um, so it's basically to find out which, which of those, which features are important for your model. Uh, so you take each feature and you like randomly sample all the values in the feature and you see how the predictions are. If it's very different, it means that that feature was actually important. Else, if it's fine to take any random values for that feature, it means that maybe probably it's not very important. Okay, that was terrific. Um, uh, uh, there was this, um, that was all exactly right. There were some details that maybe were skimmed over a little bit. Uh, I wonder if anybody else wants to jump into like a more detailed description of how it's calculated. Because I know this morning some people were not quite sure. Is there anybody who's like not quite sure maybe who wants to like have a go or yeah, want to just put it next to you there? Let's see. How exactly do we calculate feature importance for a particular feature? So I think after you're done building the random forest model, you take each column and randomly shuffle it mm -hmm. and generate a prediction and check the validation score. If it gets pretty bad for after shuffling one of the uh, columns, that means that column was important. So <clears throat> that has higher importance. I'm not exactly sure how we quantify the feature importance. Okay, great. Um, Dina, do you know how we quantify? The feature importance. Uh, that was a great description. I think we take the difference in the R square. Or score of some sort, exactly. Yeah, so let's say we've got our dependent variable, which is price, right? And there's a bunch of independent variables, including year made, right? And so we basically we, we use the whole lot to build a random forest, right? Uh, and then that gives us um, uh, our predictions. Right, and so then we can let's call this y, right? And so then we can compare that to get I don't know whatever r squared, r msc, whatever you're interested in, right? From the model. Now, um, the key thing here is I don't want to have to retrain my whole random forest. That's kind of slow and boring, right? So using the existing random forest, how can I figure out how important year made was, right? And so the suggestion was. Let's randomly shuffle the whole column, right? So now that column is totally useless. It's got the same mean, same distribution, everything about it is the same, but there's no connection at all between particular people, actual year made, and what's now in that column. I've randomly shuffled it, okay? And so now I put that new version through the same random forest, so there's no retraining done. Okay, to get some new y hat, I call it y hat ym, right? And then I can compare that to my actuals to get like an RMSC ym, right? And so now I can start to create a little table. So now I can create a little table where I've basically got like the original here, RMSC. And then I've got with year made scrambled. So this one had an RMSC of like three. This one had an RMSC of like two. Um, uh, enclosure, you know, scrambling that had a RMSC of like two point five, right? And so then I just take these differences. So I'd say year made, the importance is one, three minus two. The enclosure is zero point five, three minus two and a half. And so forth, right? So, how much worse did my model get after I shuffled that variable? Does anybody have any questions about that? Can you pass that to Danielle, please? Um, I assume you just chose those numbers randomly, but uh -huh. my question, I guess, is: Does it so do all of them theoretically not a perfect model to start out with? Like, are they will the, all the importances sum to one, or is that not? No, they're just. I don't. Honestly, I've never actually looked at what the units are, okay. so I'm not. I'm actually not quite sure. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we can check it out during the week if somebody's interested. Have a look and have a look at the uh, this SK Learn code and uh, see exactly what those units of measure are, because I've never bothered to check. Um, although I don't check like the units of measure specifically, what I do check is um, the relative importance. And so, like, here's an example. So rather than just saying, like, what are the top 10, yesterday um, one of the 
um, practicum students uh, asked me about uh, a feature importance where they said like, oh, I think these three are important. And I pointed out that the top one was a thousand times more important than the second one. Right? So like, look at the relative numbers here. And so in that case, it's like, no, don't look at the top three. Look at the one that's a thousand times more important and ignore all the rest. Right? And so this is where sometimes the kind of your natural tendency to want to be like precise and careful, you need to override that and be very practical. It's like, okay, this thing's a thousand times more important. Don't spend any time on anything else. Right? So then you can go and talk to the manager of your project and say like, okay, this thing's a thousand times more important. And then they might say, oh, um, that was a mistake. It shouldn't have been in there. We don't actually have that information at the decision time. Or, um, you know, for, what, for whatever reason, we can't actually use that variable, and so then you could remove it and, and have a look. Or they might say, gosh, I had no idea that like that was more by far more important than everything else put together. So let's forget this random forest thing and just focus on like understanding how we can better collect that one variable and better use that one variable. Um, so that's like something which comes up uh, quite a lot. And actually another place that came up just yesterday, again, another practicum student asked me, um, hey, I'm doing this uh, medical diagnostics um, project, and my R squared is 0.95 for a disease which I was told is very hard to diagnose. You know, is this random forest a genius or is something going wrong? And I said, like, remember, the second thing you do after you build a random forest is to do feature importance. So do feature importance, and what you'll probably find is that the top column is something that shouldn't be there. And so that's what happened. He came back to me half an hour later. He said, yeah, I did the feature importance. You were right. The top column was basically a something that's was another encoding of the dependent variable. I've removed it, and now my R squared is negative 0 0.1, so <laughs> that's an improvement. <laughs> okay. The other thing I like to look at is this chart, right? Is to basically say, like, you know, where, where do kind of things flatten off in terms of like which ones should I be really focusing on? Um, so that's the most important one. Right? And so when I did credit scoring in telecommunications, I found there were nine variables that basically predicted very accurately who was it going to end up paying for their phone and who wasn't. Um, and like, a apart from ending up with a model that saved them three billion dollars a year in um, in fraud and credit costs, it also let them basically rejig their their process so that they focused on collecting those nine variables um, much better. Um, all right. Who wants to do partial dependence? This is an interesting one. Very important, uh, but you know, in some ways, kind of tricky to think about. I'll go ahead and try. Yeah, please um, do. So, from my understanding of what partial dependence is, is that there's not always necessarily like a relationship between the strictly the dependent variable and this independent variable that necessarily like is showing importance, it, but rather an interaction between two variables that are working together. So something like this, right? Yeah. Where we were like, oh, that's weird, like you'd expect this to be kind of flat and there's a weird pokey bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for a, and a, this example, what we found was that it's not necessarily year made or when the sale was elapsed, but it's actually the age of the model. And so it's, that is easier to just like to tell a like company, well, obviously your younger models are going to sell for more, and it's less about when the year was made. Yeah, um, exactly. So let's come back to how we calculate this in a moment. But um, the first thing to realize is that the vast majority of the time, you know, post your course here, when somebody shows you a chart, it'll be like a univariate chart. They'll just like grab the data from the database and they'll plot X against Y, and then managers have a tendency to want to like make a decision. Right, so it'd be like, oh, there's this like drop off here, so we should like stop dealing in equipment made between 1990 and 1995 or whatever. Right, and this is like a, a big problem because like real world data has lots of these interactions going on. So like you know maybe there was a recession going on around the time that those things are being sold, or maybe around that time people were buying more of a different type of equipment or 
whatever, right? So generally what we actually want to know is all other things being equal What's the relationship between year made and sale price, right? Because like if you think about the drivetrain approach idea of like the levers, you really want a model that says if I change this lever, how will it change my objective? Okay, and so it's by pulling them apart using partial dependence that you can say, okay, actually, this is the relationship between year made and sale price. All other things being equal, right? So how do we calculate that? So for the variable you may, for example, you're gonna train. You keep every other con uh, variable constants, and then you're gonna pass every single value of the year made, and then train the model after that. So for every model, you're gonna have the light blue for the values of it, and the median is gonna be the yellow line. Up good, there. good. Okay, so let's try and draw that. So by leave everything else constant, what she means is leave them at whatever they are in the data set. So just like when we did feature importance, right, we're going to leave the rest of the data set as it is, and we're going to do partial dependence plot for year made. All right, so we've got all of these other rows of data that we'll just leave as they are. And so instead of randomly shuffling year made, instead what we're going to do is replace every single value with exactly the same thing, 1960. Okay? And just like before, we now pass that through our existing random forest, which we have not retrained or changed in any way, to get back out a set of predictions. Why? 1960. Okay, and so then we can plot that on a chart. Year made against partial dependence, 1960. Here. Okay, then we can do it for 1961, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth. Right, and so we can do that for, for um, on average, for all of them. Or we could do it just for one of them, right? And so when we do it for just one of them, and we change its year made and pass that single thing through our model, that gives us one of these blue lines. Right? So each one of these blue lines is a single row as we change its year made from 1960 up till 2008. And so then we can just take the median of all of those blue lines to say, you know, on average, What's the relationship between year made and price, all other things being equal? So why is it that why is it that this works? Why is it that this process tells us the relationship between year made and price, all other things being equal? Well, maybe it's good to think about like a really simplified approach. A really simplified approach would say, what's the average auction? You know, what's the average sale date? What's the most common type of machine we sell? Which location do we mainly mostly sell things? And like we could come up with a single row that represents the the average auction, and then we could say, okay, let's run that row through the random forest, but replace its year made with 1960, and then do it again with 1961, and then do it again with 1962, and we could like plot, you know, those on our little chart, right? And that would give us a a version of the relationship between year made and sale price, all other things being equal, right? But what if, like, uh, tractors looked like that, and uh, backhoe loaders looked like that, right? Then taking the average one would hide the fact that there are these totally different relationships. Right? So instead, we basically say, okay, our data tells us what kinds of things we tend to sell and who we tend to sell them to and when we tend to sell them, so let's use that. Right? So then we actually find out, like, for every blue line, like, here are actual examples of these relationships. Right? And so then what we can do is, as well as plotting the median, is we can do a cluster analysis to find out, like, 
a few different shapes, right? And so we may find, um, in this case, they all look like pretty much this different versions of the same thing with different slopes. Um, um, so my main takeaway from this would be that the relationship between sale price and year is basically a straight line, right? And remember, this was log of sale price, right? So this is actually showing us an exponential. And so this is where I would then like bring in the domain expertise, which is like, okay, um, things depreciate over time by a constant ratio, so therefore I would expect older stuff year made to have this exponential shape. So this is where like I, I kind of mentioned like at the very start of my machine learning project, I generally try to avoid as using as much domain expertise as I can and let the data do the talking, right? So like one of the questions I got this morning was like, oh, if there's like a sale ID, a model ID, I should throw those away, right? Because they're just IDs. It's like, no. Right? Don't assume anything about your data, right? Leave them in, and if they turn out to be super important predictors, you, you want to find out, you know, why, why is that? Okay? But then, now I'm at the other end of my project, right? I've done my feature importance, I've pulled out the stuff which is like, you know, um, from that dendrogram, you know, the kind of redundant features, I'm looking at the partial dependence, and now I'm thinking like, okay, is this shape what I expected? Okay? So even better, before you plot this, first of all think, what shape would I expect this to be? Because it's always easy to justify to yourself after the fact, oh, I knew it would look like this. Right? So what shape do you expect, and then is it that shape? So in this case I'd be like, yeah, this is, this is what I would expect. Okay? Uh, where else? This is definitely not what I'd expect. So the partial dependence plot has really pulled out the underlying truth. Okay. So does anybody have any questions about like why we use partial dependence or how we calculate it? Uh, who's got the? Oh, you've got it. <laughs> so say you have a few thousand, say twenty features that you think are important. Are you gonna? measure the partial dependence for every single one of them. So is there a limit on that? Um, if there are 20 features that are important, then I will do the partial dependence for all of them. Where important means like it's a lever I can actually pull. Um, it's like the magnitude of its size is like not much smaller than the other 19. Like you know, based on all of these things, it's like yeah, it's a feature I ought to care about. Then I will want to know how it's related. Um, it's pretty unusual to have that many features that are important, both operationally and from a modeling point of view. In my experience. Sorry, one follow-up. Sure. How do you define important? Actually, now I think about it. Um, so important means um, it's it's a lever. So it's something I can change, um, and it's like um, you know, kind of at the spiky end of this tail, um, or you know, it, maybe it's not a lever directly. Like maybe it's like zip code, and I can't actually tell my customers where to live, but I could like focus my new marketing attention on a different zip code, you know. Uh, would it make sense to do pairwise shuffling for every combination of two features um, and hold everything else constant, like in feature importance, to see interactions and compare scores? Um, so you wouldn't do that so much for partial dependence. Um, I think your question is really getting to the question of um, could we do that for feature importance? Right. So uh, I think interaction feature importance is a very important and interesting question. Uh, but doing doing it by randomly shuffling every pair of columns, um, you know, if you've got a hundred columns, sounds computationally intensive, possibly infeasible. So what I'm going to do is after we talk about tree interpreter, 
I'll talk about an uh, interesting but largely unexplored approach that will probably work. Okay, who wants to do tree interpreter? All right, over here, Prince. Can you pass that over here to Prince? Uh, I was thinking this to be more like feature importance. But feature importance is for complete random forest model, and this tree interpreter is for feature importance for particular observation. So, if that, let's say, it's about hospital readmission. So, if a patient A1 is get uh, is going to be readmitted to a hospital, which feature for that particular patient is going to impact, and uh, how can we change that? And it is calculated starting from the prediction of mean then seeing how each feature is changing the behavior of that particular patient. Okay. Uh, I'm smiling because that was one of the best examples of technical communication I've heard in a long time. So um, it's really good to think about like why, why was that effective, right? So what Prince did there was he used um, as specific an example as possible. Right? So it's, it, humans are much less good at understanding abstractions, right? So if you kind of say, oh, it takes some kind of feature and then there's an observation in that feature where, you know, where it's like, no, it's, it's a hospital readmission. Okay, and so we take a specific example. Um, the other thing he did which was very effective was to kind of take an analogy to something we already understand. So we already understand the idea of feature importance across all of the rows in a data set. Um, so now we're going to do it for a single row. Okay, so like um, you know, one of the things I was really hoping we would learn from from this experience is how to become effective technical communicators. Uh, so you know, that was a really great role model from Prince of like using all of the tricks we have at our disposal for effective technical communication. So hopefully you found that um, a useful explanation. I don't have a hell of a lot to add to that other than to show you um, you know. What that looks like. So, with the tree interpreter, we picked out a row. Okay, and so remember when we talked about the um, the confidence intervals um, at the very start, the confidence based on tree variance. We mainly said like you'd probably mainly use that for a row. So this would also be for a row. So it's like okay, why is this patient likely to be readmitted? Okay, so here is all of the information we have about that patient, or in this case, this auction. Right? Why is this auction so expensive? So then we call treeinterpreter.predict and we get back the prediction of the price, right? the bias, which is the root of the tree. So this is just the average price for everybody, so this is always going to be the same. And then the contributions, which is how important is each of these, each of these things, right? And so the way we calculated that So the way we calculated that was to say, okay, at the very start, the average um, price was 10, right? And then we split on enclosure, right? Um, and for those with this enclosure, um, the average was 9.5, um, and then we split on year made, I don't know, less than 1990, and for those with that year made, the average price was uh, 9.7, right? And then we split on um, the number of hours on the meter, and for you know what this branch we got uh, 9.4, right? And so. We then have a particular auction, which we we pass it through the tree, and it just so happens that it takes this path. Right, so one row can only have one path through the tree. Right, and so we ended up at this point. Okay, so then we can create a little table. Right, and so as we go through, we start at the top, and we start with ten. Right, that's our bias, and when we said enclosure resulted in a change from ten to nine and a half minus 0 0.5. Year made changed it from nine point five to nine point seven, 
so plus 0.2, right? And then meter changed it from 9.7 down to 9.4, which is minus 0.3. And then if we add all that together, 10 minus a half is nine and a half, plus 0.2 is 9.7, minus 0.3 is 9.4. Lo and behold, that's that number. Which takes us to our Excel spreadsheet. Where's Chris, who did our waterfall? There you are. All right, so last week we had to use Excel for this because there isn't a good Python library for doing waterfall charts. And so we saw we got our starting point, this is the bias, and then we had each of our contributions and we ended up with our total. Um, the world is now a better place because Chris has created a Python waterfall chart module for us and put it on PIP, so never again will we have to use Excel for this. And I wanted to point out that like waterfall charts have been very important in business communications at least as long as I've been in business, so that's about 25 years. Um, Python is you know what, a couple of decades old, a little bit less, uh, yeah, maybe a couple of decades old. But you know, despite that, no one in the Python world ever got to the point where they actually thought, you know, I'm going to make a waterfall chart. So they didn't exist until two days ago. Which is to say, like, the world is full of stuff which ought to exist and doesn't, and doesn't necessarily take a lot of time to build. Chris, how long did it take you to build the first Python waterfall chart? So, so I just that the code existed. Well, there was a you know a gist of it, yeah. Um, which, but it wasn't in a function. Yeah. And I had to yeah. So, okay. About eight hours. Okay, so you know a, a hefty time amount, but not unreasonable. And now, forevermore, people when they want the Python waterfall chart will end up at Chris's mm -hmm. GitHub repo. And hopefully find lots of other USF contributors who have made it uh, even better. Um, so for, in order for you to help improve Chris's Python waterfall, you need to know how to do that. right? And so you're going to need to submit a pull request. Um, life becomes very easy for submitting pull requests if you use something called hub. So if you go to github slash hub, uh, that will send you over here. Um, and what they suggest you do is that you alias git to hub, because it turns out that hub actually is a strict superset of git. Um, but what it lets you do is you can go git fork, git push, git pull request, and you've now sent Chris a pull request. Um, without hub, this is actually a pain and requires like going to the website and filling in forms and stuff. Right? So this gives you no reason not to do pull requests. And I mention this because like, when you're interviewing for a job or whatever, I can promise you that the person you're talking to will check your GitHub, and if they see you have a history of submitting thoughtful pull requests that are accepted to interesting libraries, that looks great. Right? It looks great because it shows you're somebody who actually contributes. It also shows that if they're being accepted, that you know how to create code that fits with people's coding standards, has appropriate documentation, passes their tests and coverage, and so forth. Right? So when people look at you and they say, oh, here's a somebody with a um, history of successfully contributing accepted pull requests to open source libraries, um, that's a great part of your portfolio. Okay? And you can specifically refer to it. Right? So either um, I'm the person who built Python waterfall, here is my repo, or you know, I'm the person who contributed um, currency number formatting to Python waterfall, here's my pull request. Um, you know, the, anytime you see something that doesn't work right in any open source software you use is not a problem, it's a great opportunity, because right? you can fix it and send in the pull request. Um, so yeah, give it a go. It, it actually feels great the first time you have a pull request accepted. And of course, um, one big opportunity is the Fast AI library. Uh, and uh, thank you. Uh, who was the person here? The person who added all the docs to Fast AI structured? 
in the other class. Okay, so um, thanks to one of our students, we now have doc strings for most of the fastai.structured library, and that again came via a pull request. So thank you. Okay, does anybody have any questions about um, how to calculate any of these random forest interpretation methods or why we might want to use any of these random forest interpretation methods? Because um, towards the end of the week, you're going to need to be able to build all of these yourself from scratch. One over there. Um, Can you pass that, please? That's right. Just looking at the tree interpreter, I noticed that some of the uh, the values are in ANs. How I got I get why you keep them in the tree, but how can an NAN have a feature importance? Um, okay, let me pass it back to you. Um, why not? So, in other words, how is NAN handled in pandas and therefore in the tree? Set to some default value. Does anybody remember how pandas? These are notice these are all in categorical variables. How does pandas handle NANs in categorical variables, and how does FastAI deal with them? Can somebody pass it to the person who's talking? <laughs> negative one for pandas. Yeah, pandas sets them to negative one category code. Yeah. And do you have to remember what we then do? No. Doesn't matter really. We add one. To all of the category codes, so it ends up being zero. So in other words, we have a category with, remember by the time it hits the random forest it's just a number, and it's just a, it's just the number zero, right? And we map it back to the descriptions back here, so the question really is, why shouldn't the random forest be able to split on zero? It's just, it's just another number. So it could be NAN, high, medium, or low, zero, one, two, three, four. And so, um, you know, missing values are one of these things that are generally taught really badly. Like often people get taught like, here are some ways to remove columns with missing values, or remove rows with missing values, or to replace missing values. Um, that's like never what we want, because missingness is very, very, very often interesting. And so we actually learnt that uh, from our feature importance that coupler system NAN is like one of the most important features. And so, for some reason, uh, well, I, I could I could guess, right? Coupler system NAN presumably means this is a kind of industrial equipment that doesn't have a coupler system. Now I don't know what kind that is, but apparently it's more it's a more expensive kind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I did this competition um, for um, university grant uh, research success where. Um, by far the most important predictors were whether or not some of the fields were null, um, and it turned out that this was data leakage, that these fields only got filled in most of the time after a research grant was accepted. Right? So you know, it allowed me to win that Kaggle competition, uh, but didn't actually help the university very much. Um, okay, great. Um, so let's talk about um, Extrapolation, um, and I am going to do something risky and dangerous, which is we're going to do some live coding. Um, and the reason we're going to do some live coding is I want to explore extrapolation together with you, and I kind of also want to get kind of help give you a feel of, you know, like how you might go about like writing. Writing code quickly in this notebook environment, right? Um, and this is the kind of stuff that you're going to need to be able to do, you know, in the real world and in the exam. Is kind of quickly create the kind of code that we're going to talk about. So um, I really like creating synthetic data sets uh, anytime I'm trying to like investigate the behavior of something because if I have a synthetic data set, I know how it should behave. Which reminds me, uh, before we do this. Um, I promised that we would talk about interaction importance, and I just about forgot. Um, tree interpreter tells us the contributions for a particular row based on the difference in the tree. 
we could calculate that for every row in our data set and add them up, right? And that would tell us that would tell us feature importance. It would tell us feature importance in a different way, right? One way of doing feature importance is by shuffling the columns one at a time. Another way is by doing tree interpreter for every row and adding them up. Neither is right more right than the others. They're actually both quite widely used. So this is kind of type one and type two feature importance. So we could try to expand this a little bit to do not just single variable feature importance, but interaction feature importance. Now here's the thing. What I'm going to describe is very easy to describe. It was described by Bryman right back when random forests were first invented, and it is part of the commercial software product from Salford Systems who have the trademark on random forests. But it is not part of any open source library I'm aware of, uh, and I've never seen an academic paper that actually studies it closely. So what I'm going to describe here is a huge opportunity. Um, but it's also like there's lots and lots of details that kind of need to be fleshed out. But here's the basic idea. This particular this particular difference here, right, is not just because of year made, but because of a combination of year made and enclosure. Right? The fact that this is 9.7 is because enclosure was in this branch and year made was in this branch. So in other words, we could say the contribution of enclosure interacted with year made is minus 0.3. Yeah? And so what about that difference. Well, that's an interaction of year made and hours on the meter. So year made interacted with. I'm using star here not to mean times, but to mean interacted with. It's a it's a kind of a common way of doing things. Like R's formulas do it this way as well. Year made by interacted with meter has a import has a importance. Sorry, a, a contribution of minus 0.1. Um, perhaps we could also say from here to here that this also shows an interaction between meter and enclosure, like with one thing in between them. So maybe we could say meter by enclosure equals. And then what should it be? You know, should it be 0 0.6? Uh, sorry, minus 0 0.6. I mean, in some ways, that kind of seems unfair because we're also including like the impact of of year made, right? So maybe it should be maybe it should be minus zero point six. You know, maybe we should add back this point two, right? And these are like details that I actually don't know the answer to, right? Like, how, well, how should we best kind of assign a contribution? To each pair of variables in this path, right? But but clearly conceptually, we can, right? The pairs of variables in that path all represent interactions, right? Yes, Chris, can you uh, could you pass that to Chris, please? Why don't you force them to be next to each other in the tree? I I mean, I'm not going to say it's the wrong approach. I I'm. I don't think it's the right approach, though, because it feels like this path here, meter and enclosure are interacting. So it seems like not recognizing that contribution is throwing away information. Um, but but I'm not sure, you know. Uh, I had one of my staff at Kaggle actually do some R and D on this a few years ago, and. They actually found, you know, and I, I wasn't close enough to know how they dealt with these details, but they got it working pretty well. Um, but unfortunately, it never saw the light of day as a software product. Um, 
but like this is something which you know maybe a group of you could get together and build you know i mean d d do some googling to check but I, I really don't think that there are any interaction feature importance parts of any open source library can you pass that back wouldn't this exclude interactions though between variables that don't matter until they interact so say your row never chooses to split down that path but that variable interacting with another one becomes your most important split i don't think that happens right because if there's if there's an interaction that's important only because it's an interaction and not on a univariate basis it will appear sometimes because, assuming that you set max features to less than one and so therefore it will appear in in some part. Okay. Uh, what is meant by interaction here? Is it multiplication, ratio, addition? Interaction means um, appears, uh, uh, branches, appears on the same uh, path through a tree. Like an interaction, in this case the tree, there's an interaction between enclosure and EMA because we branch on enclosure and then we branch on EMA. So to get to here, we have to have some specific value of enclosure and some specific value of here made. Sorry, I just my brain's kind of working on this right now. What if, what if you went down the middle leaves between the two things you were trying to observe, and you could just sort of norm, and you you would also take into account what the final measure is. So I mean, if we extend the tree downwards, you'd have many measures, both of like the two things you're trying to um, look at, and also the in between steps. There, there seems to be a way to like average information out in between them. But there could be. So I think what we should do is talk about this on the forum. I think this is fascinating, and I hope we build something great. Um, um, but I need to do my live coding. So let's. Yeah, that was a great discussion. Keep thinking about it, and uh, yeah, do some experiments. And so to to experiment with that. You, you almost certainly want to create a synthetic data set first, right? It's like y equals x1 plus x2 plus x1 times x2 or something, you know? Like something where you know that there's this interaction effect and there isn't that interaction effect, and then you want to make sure that the feature importance you get at the end is what you expected, right? And so probably the first step would be to do single variable feature importance using the tree interpreter style approach. Um, and one nice thing about this is like it's um, it doesn't really matter how much data you have, like all you have to do to calculate feature importance is just like slide through the tree, right? So you should be able to write in a way that's actually pretty fast. And so even writing it in pure Python might be fast enough, depending on your tree size. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to talk about um, extrapolation, and so the first thing I want to do is create a synthetic data set that has a simple linear relationship. Uh, we're going to pretend it's like a time series, right? So um, we need to basically create some x values. So the easiest way to kind of create some synthetic data of this type is to use linspace, um, which just creates some evenly spaced, some evenly spaced data, right, between start and stop. Um, with by default 50 observations. So if we just do that, right, there it is. Okay. Um, and so then we're going to uh, create a dependent variable. And so let's assume there's just a, a linear relationship um, between x and y, and let's add a little bit of randomness to it, right? Um, so uniform random. Uh, between low and high, so we could like add um, somewhere between like minus 0.2 and 0.2, say, okay? Um, and so the next thing we need is um, is a shape, right? Which is basically how what dimensions do you want this this random num this these random numbers to be? And obviously we want them to be the same shape as x's shape. So we can just say x dot shape. Okay? So in other words, that's x dot shape. Remember, when you see something in parentheses with a comma, that's a tuple with just one thing in it. Okay, so this is of shape 
50, and so we've added 50 random numbers, and so now we could plot those. Okay, so shift tab, x comma y. All right, so there's our data. Okay, so like, for when you're both working as a data scientist or for doing your exams in this course, you need to be able to like quickly whip up a data set like that, throw it up on a plot without thinking too much. Okay? And like as you can see, you don't have to really remember much, if anything. You just have to know how to like hit shift tab to check the names of the parameters. Um, and uh, you know, everything in the exam will be open open book, open internet, so you can always like Google for something to try and find lin space if you forgot what it's called. Um, all right, so let's assume that's our data, right? And so we're now going to um, build a random forest model, and what I want to do is build a random forest model that kind of acts as if this is a time series. So I'm going to take this as a training set, right? I'm going to take this as our validation or test set. Just like we did in, you know, groceries or bulldozers or whatever. Okay. Um, so we can use exactly the same kind of code that we used in split bells, right? So we can basically say um, x train comma x bell equals uh, x up to forty comma x. From 40. Okay, so that just splits it into the first 40 versus the last 10, right? And so we can do the same thing for y. And there we go. Okay, so the next thing to do is we want to create a random forest. Okay, uh, and fit it. And that's going to require x's and y's. All right. Now that's actually going to give an error, and the reason why is that it expects x to be a matrix, not a vector, because it expects x to have a number of columns of data. All right. So it's important to know that a matrix with one column is not the same thing as a vector. All right. So if I try to run this, right. Expect a 2D array got 1D array instead. So we need to convert our 2D array into a 1D array. So remember I said x dot shape is 50 comma, right? So x has one axis. So here's the important nomenclature. X's rank is 1. The rank of a variable is equal to the length of its shape. How many axes does it have? So a vector we can think of as an array of rank 1. A matrix is an array of rank 2. I very rarely use words like vector and matrix because like, they're kind of meaningless specific examples of something more general, which is they're all n-dimensional tensors, right? Or n-dimensional arrays. Okay? So an n-dimensional array, we can say it's a tensor of rank n. They basically mean kind of the same thing. Physicists get crazy when you say that, because to a physicist a tensor has quite a specific meaning, but in machine learning we generally use it in the same way. Okay. So how do we turn an array uh, an, a one-dimensional array into a two-dimensional array. Um, there's a couple of ways we can do it, um, but basically we slice it. Right? So colon means give me everything in that axis. Right? Colon comma none means give me everything in the first axis, which is the only axis we have, and then none is a special indexer, which means add a unit axis here. So let me show you. That is of, of shape 50, 1. So it's of rank 2. Right? It has two axes. 
One of them is a very boring axis, right? It's a length one axis. So let's move this over here. There's one comma fifty. Okay, and then to remind you, the original is just fifty, right? So you can see I can put none as a special indexer to introduce a new unit axis there. Okay, so this thing has one row and 50 columns. This thing has 50 rows and one column. So that's what we want, right? We want 50 rows and one column. This kind of playing around with ranks and dimensions is going to become increasingly important in this course and in the deep learning course, right? So spend a lot of time slicing with none, slicing with other things, try to create three-dimensional, four-dimensional tensors, and so forth. I'll show you a trick. I'll show you two tricks. The first is you never ever need to write comma colon. It's always assumed. So if I delete that, this is exactly the same thing. Okay? Um, and you'll see that in code all the time, so you need to recognize it. The second trick is this is adding an axis in the second dimension, right? Or I guess the index one dimension. What if I always want to put it in the last dimension, right? And like often our tensors change dimensions without us looking because like you went from a one-channel image to a three-channel image, or you went from a single image to a mini batch of images. Like suddenly you get new dimensions appearing. So to make things general, I would say this dot 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 means as many dimensions as you need to fill this up. Okay, and so in this case, it's exactly the same thing, but I would always try to write it that way because it means it's going to continue to work as I get, you know, higher dimensional tensors. All right. So in this case, I want 50 rows in one column. So I'll call that say x1. Okay. So let's now use that here. And so this is now a 2D array, and so I can create my. Random forest. Okay, so then I could plot that, and this is where you're going to have to turn your brains on because the folks this morning got this very quickly, which was super impressive. I'm going to plot y train against m dot predict x train. Okay, before I hit go, what is this going to look like? Yeah, it should basically be the same, right? Our predictions hopefully are the same as the actuals, so this should fall on a line. But there's some randomness, so it won't quite. Uh, I should have used scatterplot. Okay, right. So that's cool. Right, that was the easy one. Let's now do the hard one. The fun one. What's that going to look like? Okay. So I'm going to say no, but nice try. You know, it's like, hey, we're extrapolating to the to the validation. That's what I'd like it to look like. But that's not what it is going to look like. Think about what trees do, and think about think about the fact that we have a validation set here and a training set here. <coughs> so think about a forest is just a bunch of trees. So the first tree is going to. Okay, Melissa's going to have a go. Can you pass that to Melissa? Um, will it start grouping the dots? Yeah, that's what it, I mean. That's what it does. Okay, but you know, let's think about how it groups the dots. So, yeah, Tim. Um, I'm guessing since all the new data is actually outside of the original scope, it's all going to be basically the same. It's like one huge group. One. Yeah. Group. Right. So, like, we make it like forget the forest. Let's create one tree. Right. So we're probably going to split somewhere around here first, and then we're going to probably split somewhere around here. 
and then we're going to split somewhere around here and somewhere around here, right? And so our final split is here, right? So our prediction when we say, okay, let's take this one, and so it's going to put that through the forest, right, and end up predicting this average. It can't predict anything higher than that, because there is nothing higher than that to average, right? So this is really important to realize is a random forest is not magic, right? It's just returning the average of nearby observations where nearby is kind of in this like tree space. So let's run it. Let's see if Tim's right. But holy shit, that's awful. Right? And like if you don't know how random forests work, then this is going to totally screw you, right? If you think that it's actually going to be able to extrapolate to any kind of data it hasn't seen before, like particularly like future time periods, it's just not. Like it just can't. It's just averaging stuff it's already seen. That's all it can do. Okay? So we're going to be talking about like how to avoid this problem. We talked a little bit in the last lesson about trying to avoid it by just like in avoiding unnecessary time dependent uh, variables where we can. Right? But in the end, if you really have a time series that looks like this, we actually have to deal with the problem. Right? So one way we could deal with the problem would be use like a neural net. Right? Use something that actually has a function or shape that can actually like fit something that actually fits something like this, right? And so then it'll extrapolate nicely. Another approach would be to use all the time series techniques you guys are learning about in the morning class to fit some kind of time series, right? And then detrend it. Right? And so then you'll end up with detrended dots and then use the random forest to predict those. Right? And that's particularly cool, right? Because if you're like imagine that your random forest was actually trying to predict data that like I don't know, maybe it was two different states. And so the blue ones, you know, are down here and the red ones are up here, right? Now if you tried to use a random forest, it's going to do a pretty crappy job because like time is going to seem much more important. So it's basically still going to like split like this, and then it's going to split like this, and then finally, once it kind of gets down to this piece, it'll be like, oh, okay, now I can see the difference between the states. right? So in other words, like when you've got this big time piece going on, you're not going to see the other relationships in the random forest until you've dealt, until every tree deals with time. So one way to fix this would be with a gradient boosting machine, GBM. Right? And what a GBM does is it creates a little tree, right? And runs everything through that first little tree, which could be like the time tree, and then it calculates the residuals. And then the next little tree just predicts the residuals. So it'd be kind of like detrending it, right? So GBMs handle this. GBMs still can't extrapolate to the future, but at least they can deal with time dependent data more conveniently, right? So we're going to be talking about this quite a lot more over the next couple of weeks, right? And in the end, the solution is going to be just use neural nets, right? But for now, you know, using a, some kind of time series analysis, detrend it, and then use a random forest on that isn't a bad technique at all. And if you're playing around with something like the Ecuador groceries competition, uh, that would be a really good thing to to fiddle around with. All right. See you next time. Welcome back. We're going to be talking um, today about random forests. We're going to finish building our own random forest from scratch. Um, uh, but before we do, I uh, wanted to tackle a few things that have come up uh, during the week, a few questions that I've had. Um, and I want to start with kind of the position of random forests in general. So we spent uh, about half of this course doing random forests, and then after today the second half of this course will be um, neural networks, broadly defined. Um, uh, this is because these, these two represent like the, t the, the two key classes of techniques which cover 
nearly everything that you're likely to need to do. Um, random forests belong to the class of techniques of decision tree ensembles, um, along with gradient boosting machines being the other key type, and some variants like extremely randomized trees. They uh, have the benefit that they're highly interpretable, uh, scalable, flexible, work well for most kinds of data. Um, they have the downside that they don't extrapolate at all to like data that's outside the range that you've seen, as we looked at at the end of last week's session. Um, um, but you know they're 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 a great starting point, and so uh, I think. You know, there's a huge catalog of machine learning tools out there, and so, and like a lot of courses and books don't attempt to kind of curate that down and say like for these kinds of problems use this, for these kinds of problems use that. Uh, finished, you know. But they're rather like here's a description of a hundred different algorithms, and you just don't need them, you know. Like I don't see why you would ever use a support vector machine today, for instance. Like uh, not, no no reason at all I could think of doing that. Uh, people loved studying them in the 90s because they are like very theoretically elegant and like you can really write a lot of math about support vector machines and people did. But you know in practice I don't see them as having any place. Um, so there's like a lot of techniques that you could include in an exhaustive list of every way that people have looked at machine learning problems. But I would rather tell you like how to actually solve machine learning problems in practice. I think they, you know we've we're about to finish today the first class, which is you know one type of decision tree ensembles. Um, in in part two, Yannette will tell you about the other key type there being gradient boosting, and we're about to launch next lesson into neural nets, uh, which includes all kinds of GLM, uh, ridge regression, elastic net, lasso, logistic regression, etc. Are all Variants of neural nets. Um, you know, interestingly, uh, Leo Breiman, who created Random Forests, did so very late in his life, and unfortunately passed away not many years later. Um, uh, so partly because of that, very little has been written about them in the academic literature. Um, partly because SVMs were just had taken over at that point, you know, other people didn't look at them, um, and also like just because they're like quite hard to grasp at a theoretical level, like analyze them theoretically, it's quite a hard to write conference papers about them or academic papers about them. So there hasn't been that much written about them, um, but there's been a real resurgence, or well, not resurgence, a, a new wave in recent years of empirical machine learning, like what actually works. Um, Kaggle's been part of that, um, but also just part of it has just been like companies using machine learning to make shitloads of money, like Amazon and Google. Um, and so nowadays, a lot of people are writing about decision tree ensembles and creating better software for decision tree ensembles like like GBM and XGBoost and uh, Ranger for R and Scikit-Learn and so forth. Um, but a lot of this is being done in industry rather than academia. Um, but you know, it, it, it's it's encouraging to see. Um, there's certainly more work being done in deep learning than in decision tree ensembles, uh, particularly in, in academia, but, but there's a lot of progress being made in both. You know, if you look at like, of the packages being used today for decision tree ensembles, like all the best ones, the top five or six, I don't know that any of them really existed five years ago, you know, maybe other than like sklearn or even three years ago. So. Yeah, so that's that's been good, um, but I think there's a lot of work still to be done. Uh, we talked about, for example, uh, figuring out what interactions are the most important last week, and uh, some of you pointed out in the forums that actually there there is such a project already for gradient boosting machines, uh, which is great. Uh, but it doesn't seem that there's anything like that yet for random forests, and you know, random forests uh, do have a nice benefit over GBMs that they're kind of harder to screw up. You know, and uh, easier to scale. Um, uh, so hopefully, that's something that you know this community might help fix. 
Uh, another question I had during the week was about the size of your validation set. Um, uh, how big should it be? So like to answer this question about how big does your validation set need to be, you first need to answer the question, how, how accurate do I need, how, how precisely do I need to know the accuracy of this algorithm, right? So like if the validation set that you have is saying like this is 70% accurate, and if somebody said, well, is it 75% or 65% or 70%, and the answer was, I don't know, anything in that range is close enough, like that would be one answer. Or else if it's like, is it 70% or 70.01% or 69.99%, like, then that's something else again, right? So you need to kind of start out by saying like, how, how accurate do I need this? Um, so like, for example, in the deep learning course we've been looking at dogs versus cats, Images and um, the models that we're looking at had about a 99.4-99.5 percent accuracy on the validation set. Okay, and our validation set size was uh, 2,000. Okay, uh, in fact, let's do this in Excel. That'll be a bit easier. Um, uh, so our validation set size was. 2000 and our accuracy was 99.4%. Right? So the number of incorrect is something around 1 minus accuracy times n. So we were getting about 12 wrong. Right. Um, and the number of cats we had is half, and so the number of wrong cats is about six. Okay, so then, like we we run a new model, and we find instead that the accuracy has gone to ninety nine point two percent. Right, and then it's like, okay, is this less good at finding cats? And it's like, well, it got two more cats wrong. So it's like probably not, right? So, but then it's like, well, does this matter? Does 99.4 versus 99.2 matter? And if this was like, it wasn't about cats and dogs, but it was about finding fraud, right? Then the difference between a 0.6% error rate and a 0.8% error rate is like 25% of your cost of fraud. So like that can be huge. Um, like it was really interesting like when ImageNet came out earlier this year, the new competition results came out, and the accuracy had gone down from 3% to, sorry, the error went down from 3% to 2%. And I saw a lot of people on the internet, like famous machine learning researchers being like, meh, some Chinese guys got it better from like 97% to 98%, it's like statistically not even significant, who cares, kind of a thing. But actually I thought like, holy crap! This Chinese team just blew away the state-of-the-art in image recognition. Like the old one was 50% less accurate than the new one. Like that's that's actually the right way to think about it, isn't it? Because it's like, you know, we were trying to recognize, you know, like which tomatoes were ripe and which ones weren't, and like our new approach, you know, the old approach, like 50% of the time more was like letting in the unripe tomatoes. Or you know, 50% more of the time we were like accepting fraudulent customers. Like that's a really big difference. So just because like this particular validation set we can't really see six versus eight doesn't mean the 0.2% different isn't important. It could be. So my kind of rule of thumb is that this like this number of like how many observations are you actually looking at, I want that generally to be somewhere higher than 22. Why 22? Because 22 is the magic number where the t-distribution roughly turns into the normal distribution. Right? So as you may have learnt, the t-distribution is, is the normal distribution for small data sets. Right? And so in other words, once we have 22 of something or more, it kind of starts to behave kind of normally 
in both sense of the words. Like it's kind of more stable and you can kind of understand it better. So that's my magic number. When somebody says, do I have enough of something, I kind of start out by saying like, do you have 22 observations of the thing of interest? Um, so if you were looking at like lung cancer, you know, and you had a data set that had like a thousand people without lung cancer and 20 people with lung cancer, I'd be like, I very much doubt we're going to make much progress, you know, because we haven't even got 20 of the thing you want. Um, so ditto with the validation set. If you don't have 20 of the thing you want, then it's very unlikely to be useful. Or if like the at the level of accuracy we need, it's not plus or minus 20. It's just it's that that's the point where I'm thinking like, be a bit careful. So just to be clear, you want 22 to be the number of uh, samples in each set, like in the validation, the test, and the train, or so. What I'm saying is, like, if there's if there's less than 22 of a class in any of the sets, then it's it's going to get it's getting pretty unstable at that point, right? Um, and so, like, that's just like the first rule of thumb. Um, but then, what I would actually do is like start practicing what we learned about the binomial distribution, or actually Bernoulli distribution. So um, what's the, um, what is the mean of the binomial distribution of uh, n samples and probability p? n times p, okay, thank you. n times p is our mean, right? So if you've got a 50% chance of getting ahead and you toss it 100 times, on average, you get 50 heads. Okay, and then what's the standard deviation? And p1 minus p. Okay, so these are like two numbers. Well, the first number you don't really have to remember; it's intuitively obvious. The second one is one that try to remember forevermore, because not only does it come up all the time, the people that you work with will all have forgotten it. So you'll be like the one person in the conversation who can immediately go, we don't have to run this a hundred times, I can tell you straight away, it's binomial, it's going to be n, p, q, uh, n, p, 1 minus p. Um, then there's the standard error. The standard error is if you run a bunch of trials, each time getting a mean, what is the standard deviation of the mean? I don't think you guys have covered this yet, is that right? So this is really important because this means like if you train a hundred models, right, each time the validation set accuracy is like the mean of a distribution, and so for, therefore the standard deviation of that validation set accuracy it can be uh, calculated with the standard error. And this is equal to the standard deviation divided by square root n. Right? So this tells you, so like one approach to figuring out like is my validation set big enough is train your model five times with exactly the same hyperparameters each time and look at the validation set accuracy each time and you, give, you know there's like a, a mean and a standard deviation of five numbers you could use or a maximum and a minimum you can use. Um, but to save yourself some time, uh, you can figure out straight away that like, uh, okay, well, um, uh, I I have a 0.99 uh, accuracy uh, as to you know whether I get the cat correct or not correct. Uh, so therefore, the standard deviation is equal to 0.99 times 0.01. Okay, and then I can get the um, standard error of that. Right. So so basically, the size of the validation set you need is like however big it has to be such that your insights about its accuracy are good enough for your particular business problem. And so like I say, like the simple way to do it is to pick a validation set of like a size of thousand, train five models, and see how much the validation set accuracy varies, and if it's like if they're if it's a, they're all close enough for what you need, then you're fine. If it's not, maybe you should make it bigger. Or maybe you should consider using cross validation instead. Okay, um, so like as you can see, it really depends on what it is you're trying to do. 
uh, how common your less common class is and how accurate your model is. Could you pass that back to Melissa, please? Thank you. Um, I have a question about the less common classes. If you have less than 22, let's say you have one sample of something, um, let's say it's a face, and I only have one representation from that particular country, do I toss that into the training set and it adds variety? Do I pull it out completely out of the data set? Or do I put it in a test set instead of the validation set? So you certainly couldn't put it in the test or the validation set because you're asking, can, I mean in general, because you're asking can I recognize something I've never seen before. Um, but actually this, this question of like can I recognize something I've not seen before, there's actually a whole class of models specifically for that purpose. It's called either one-shot learning, which is you get to see something once and then you have to recognize it again, or zero-shot learning, which is where you have to recognize something you've never seen before. Uh, we're not going to cover them in this course. Um, uh, but that can be useful for things like um, face recognition, you know, like is this the same person I've seen before? And so generally speaking, obviously for something like that to work, it's not that you've never seen a face before, it's that you've never seen Melissa's face before, you know, and so you see Melissa's face once and you have to recognize it again. Um, yeah, so in general, you know, your validation set and test set need to have the same mix or frequency of observations that you're going to see in production in the real world. Um, and then your training set should have um, an equal number in each class. And if you don't, just replicate the less common one until it is equal. So this is, I think we've mentioned this paper before, very recent paper that came out that tried lots of different approaches to training with unbalanced data sets and found consistently that oversampling the less common class until it is the same size as the more common class is always the right thing to do. Um, so you could literally copy, you know, so like I've only got a thousand, uh, you know, ten examples of people with cancer and a hundred without, so I could just copy those ten another, you know, ninety times. Um, that's kind of a little memory inefficient, uh, so a lot of um, things, including I think SK Learns, Random Forests have a class weights parameter that says each time you're bootstrapping or resampling, I want you to sample the less common class with a higher probability. Um, or ditto if you're doing deep learning, you know, make sure in your mini batch it's not randomly sampled, but it's a stratified sample, so the less common class is picked more often. Okay, so let's get back to finishing off our random forests. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to finish off writing our random forest, and then after today your, your, after today your homework will be to take this class and to add to it all of the random forest interpretation algorithms that we've learned. Okay? So um, obviously to be able to do that, you're going to need to totally understand how this class works, so please, you know, ask lots of questions as necessary as we go along. Um, so just to remind you, um, we, we're doing the, the bulldozers Kaggle competition data set again. Um, we split it as before into 12,000 validation, the last 12,000 uh, records. And then um, just to make it easier for us to keep track of what we're doing, we're going to just pick two columns out to start with, year made and machine hours on the meter. Okay. And so what we did last time was we started out by creating a, a tree ensemble, and the tree ensemble had a bunch of trees, which was literally a list of n trees trees, where each time we just called create tree. Okay. And create tree contained a sample size number of random indexes, okay. and this one was drawn without replacement. So remember, bootstrapping means sampling with replacement. So normally with scikit-learn, if you've got n rows, we grab n rows with replacement, which means many of them will appear more than once, so each time we get a different sample, but it's always the same size as the original data set. And then we have our setRF samples uh, function that we can use 
which does uh, width replacement sampling of less than n rows. This is doing something again, which is it's sampling without replacement sample size rows, okay? Because we're permuting the numbers from naught to self dot y minus one, and then grabbing the first self dot sample size of them. Actually, there's a faster way to do this. You can just use np dot random dot choice, which is a slightly more direct way, um, but this way works as well. All right. So this is our random sample for this one of our n trees trees. And so then we're going to create a decision tree. And our decision tree, we don't pass it all of x, we pass it these specific indexes. And remember, x is a pandas data frame, so if we want to index into it with a bunch of integers, we have to use iloc, integer locations. Okay, and that makes it behave indexing-wise just like NumPy. Uh, our y vector is NumPy, so we can just index into it directly. Right? And then we're going to keep track of our minimum leaf size. Um, so then the only other thing we really need in Ensemble is some way to make a prediction, and so we were just going to do the mean of the tree prediction for each tree. All right, so that was that. And so then in order to be able to run that, um, we need a decision tree class, because it's being called here. Um, and so there we go. Okay, so that's the starting point. So the next thing we need to do um, is to flesh out our decision tree. So the important thing to remember is all of our randomness happened back here in the tree ensemble. The decision tree class we're going to create doesn't have randomness in it. Um, uh, okay, so uh, right now we are building a random tree regressor, right? So that's why we are taking the mean of the tree, uh, the outputs. If we were to work with classification, do we take the max? Like the classifier will give you either zeros or ones. No, I would still take the mean. So the so each tree is going to tell you what percentage of that leaf node contains cats and what percentage take, contains dogs. So then I would average all those percentages and say across the trees, on average, there is 19% cats and 81% dogs. Good question. So, you know, um, random tree classifiers are almost identical, or can be almost identical to random tree regressors. Um, the technique we're going to use to build this today will basically exactly work. For classification, it's certainly for binary classification, you can do with exactly the same code. Uh, for multi-class classification, you just need to change your data structure uh, so that, like, you have like a, a one hot encoded matrix or a, a, a list of integers that you treat as a one hot encoded matrix. Okay, so our decision tree. Um, so remember, our idea here is that we're going to like try to avoid thinking. So we're going to basically write it as if everything we need already exists. Okay. So we know um, from when we created the decision tree, we're going to pass in the x, the y, and the minimum leaf size. So here we need to make sure we've got the x and the y and the minimum leaf size. Okay. So then there's one other thing, which is as we split our tree into subtrees, we're going to need to keep track of which of the row indexes went into the left-hand side of the tree, which went into the right-hand side of the tree. Okay, so we're going to have this thing called indexes as well. Right? So at, at first we just didn't bother passing in indexes at all. So if indexes is not passed in, if it's none, then we're just going to set it to every, the entire length of y. Right? So np.a range is the same as just range in Python, but it returns an, a numpy array. Right? So the, the root of a decision tree contains all the rows. That's the definition, really, of the root of a decision tree. So all the rows is row naught, row 1, row 2, etc., up to row y minus 1. Okay. And then we're just going to store away all that information that we were given. We're going to keep track of how many um, rows are there and how many columns are there. Okay. So then the uh, every leaf and every node in a tree 
has a value. It has a prediction. And that prediction is just equal to the average of the dependent variable. Okay, so um, every node in the tree y indexed with the indexes is the values of the dependent variable that are in this branch of the tree, and so here is the mean. Okay? Some um, nodes in a tree also have a score, which is like how effective was the split here, right? Um, but that's only going to be true if it's not a leaf node, right? A leaf node has no further splits. And at this point when we create a tree, we haven't done any splits yet, so its score starts out as being infinity. Okay? So having built the, the, the root of the tree, our next job is to find out which variable should we split on, and what level of that variable should we split on. So let's pretend that there's something that does that. Find bar split. Um, so then we're done. Okay. So how do we find a variable to split on? So well, we could just go through each potential variable. So C contains the number of columns we have, so go through each one and see if we can find a better split than we have so far on that column. Okay? Um, now notice this is like not the full random forest definition. This is assuming that max features is set to all, right? Remember we could set max features to like 0.5, in which case we wouldn't check all the numbers from naught to C, we would check half the numbers at random from naught to C. So if you want to turn this into like a random forest that has the max features uh, support, you could easily like add one line of code to, to do that. Um, but we're not going to do it in our implementation today. So then we just need to find better split. And since we're not interested in thinking at the moment, for now we're just going to leave that empty. All right. So um, the one other thing I like to do with my kind of when I start writing a class is I like to have some way to print out what's in that class, right? And so if you type print followed by an object, or if at Jupyter Notebook you just type the name of the object, um, at the moment it's just printing out underscore underscore main underscore underscore dot decision tree at blah blah blah, which is not very helpful. Right? So if we want to replace this with something helpful, we have to define the special Python method name dunder repra to get a representation of this object. So when we, when we basically just write the name like this, behind the scenes it calls that function, and the default implementation of that method is just to print out this unhelpful stuff. So we can replace it by instead saying Let's create a format string uh, where we're going to print out n and then show n and then print val and then show val. Okay, so how many how many rows are in this node and what's the average of the dependent variable? Okay. Then, if it's not a leaf node, so if it has a split, then we should also be able to print out the score, the value we split out, and the variable that we split on. Now you'll notice here, self dot is leaf. Is leaf is defined as a method, but I don't have any parentheses after it. This is a special kind of method called a property, and so a property is something that kind of looks like a regular variable, but it's actually calculated on the fly. So when I call is leaf, it actually calls this function, right? But I've got this special decorator property. Okay? And what this says is basically you don't have to include the parentheses when you call it. Okay, And so it's going to say, all right, is this a leaf or not? So a leaf is something that we don't split on. If we haven't split on it, then its score is still set to infinity. So that's my logic. Does that make sense? So this, uh, this at notation is called a decorator. It's basically a way of telling Python more information about your method. Does anybody here remember where you have seen decorators before? Can you pass it over here? 
Yeah, where have you seen de- where have you seen decorators Flask. before? Tell us more about Flask and how it uses decorators. <laughs> it was the at app route. Yeah. Uh, what does that do? That I forgot. Okay. <laughs> I so, don't know how to describe it. No worries. So Flask. So anybody who's done any web programming before with something like Flask or a similar framework um, would have had to have said like this method is going to respond to this bit of the URL and either to post or to get, and you put it in a special decorator. Um, so behind the scenes, that's telling Python to treat this method in a special way. So here's another decorator, okay? Um, and so you know, if you get more advanced with Python, you can actually learn how to write your own decorators, which, as was mentioned, you know, basically insert some additional code. Um, but for now, just know there's a bunch of predefined decorators we can use to change how our methods behave. And one of them is at property, which basically means you don't have to put parentheses anymore, which of course means you can't add any more parameters beyond self. Why, if it's not a leaf, why is the square infinity? Because doesn't infinity mean you're at the root? Why? If no, infinity at means root? that you're not at the root. It means you're at a leaf. So the root will have a split, assuming okay. we find one. Yeah. Right. Everything will have a split till we get all the way to the bottom, yeah. the leaf. And so the leaves will have a score of infinity because they won't okay. split. Great. All right. So that's our decision tree. It doesn't do very much, but at least we can like create an ensemble, right? Ten trees, sample size a thousand, right? And we can like print out. So now when I go m trees zero, it doesn't say blah 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 blah. It says what we asked it to say: n colon a thousand, val colon ten point eight. Oh wait, okay. And this um, is a leaf because we haven't spit on it yet, so we've got nothing more to say. Okay, so then the indexes are all the numbers from 0 to 1000, okay? Because the base of the tree has everything. This is like everything in the random sample that was passed to it. Because remember, by the time we get to the point where it's a decision tree, we're, we don't have to worry about any of the randomness in the random forest anymore. Okay. All right, so let's try to write the thing which finds a split. Okay, so we need to implement find better split. Okay, and so it's going to take the index of a variable, variable number one, variable number three, whatever, and it's going to figure out what's the best split point. Is that better than any split we have so far? And for the first variable, the answer will always be yes, because the best one so far is none at all, which is infinity bad. Okay. So let's start by making sure we've got something to compare to. So the thing we're going to compare to will be um, scikit-learns random forest. And so we need to make sure that scikit-learns random forest gets exactly the same data that we have. So we start out by creating ensemble, grab a tree out of it, and then find out which particular random sample of x and y did this tree use. Okay, and we're going to store them away so that we can pass them to scikit-learn, so we have exactly the same information. So let's go ahead and now create our random forest using scikit-learn. So one tree, one decision, no bootstrapping, so a, the whole the whole data set. Right? So this should be exactly the same as the thing that we're going to create, this tree. Okay? So let's try. So we need to define find better split. Okay. So find better split takes a variable. Okay, so let's define our x independent variables and say, okay, well it's everything inside our tree, but only those indexes that are in this node, right? Which at the top of the tree is everything, right? And just this one variable, okay? And then for our y's, it's just whatever our dependent variable is at the indexes in this node. Okay, so there's our x and y. So let's now go through every single value in our independent variable. And so I'll show you what's going to happen. So let's say our independent variable is year made. Um, 
and it's not going to be in order. Right? And so uh, we're going to go to the very first row and we're going to say, okay, year made here is three. Right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and calculate the score if we decided to branch on the number three. Right? So I need to know which rows are greater than three, which rows are less than or equal to three, and they're going to become my left-hand side and my right-hand side. Right? And then we need a score. Right? So there's lots of scores we could use. So in, in Random Forest we call this the information gain. Right? The information gain is like how much better does our score get because we split it into these two groups of data. Uh, there's lots of ways we could calculate it, Gini, cross entropy, root mean squared error, whatever. Um, if you think about it, there is an alternative formulation of root mean squared error which is mathematically the same to, to within a constant scale, but it's a little bit easier to deal with, which is we're going to try and find a split which the causes the two groups to each have as low a standard deviation as possible. Right? So like I want to find a split that puts all the cats over here and all the dogs over here. Right? So if these are all cats and these are all dogs, then this has a standard deviation of zero and this has a standard deviation of zero. Or else this is like a totally random mix of cats and dogs, this is a totally random mix of cats and dogs, they're going to have a much higher standard deviation. That makes sense? And so it turns out if you find a split that minimizes those group standard deviations, or specifically the weighted average of the two standard deviations, it's mathematically the same as minimizing the root mean squared error. That's something you can prove to yourself after class if you want to. All right, so we're going to need to find, um, first of all, split this into two groups. So where's all the stuff that is greater than three? Uh, so greater than three is this one, this one, and this one. So we need the standard deviation of that. So let's go ahead and say standard deviation of greater than three. That one, that one, and that one. Okay. And then the next will be the standard deviation of less than or equal to three. So that would be that one, that one, that one. And then we just take the weighted average of those two. And that's our score. So that would be our score if we split on three. Does that make sense? And so then the next step would be try to split on four, try splitting on one, try splitting on six. Redundantly try splitting on four again. Redundantly try splitting on one again, and find out which one works best. So that's our code here. Is we're going to go through every row, and so let's say okay, left hand side is any values in X that are less than or equal to this particular value. Our right hand side is every value in X that are greater than this particular value. Okay, so what's the data type that's going to be in LHS and RHS? What are they actually going to contain? They're going to be arrays. Arrays of what? Arrays of, arrays of booleans, yeah, which we can treat as 0 and 1. Okay, so LHS will be an array of false every time it's not less than or equal to and true otherwise, and RHS will be a boolean array of the opposite. Okay, and now we can't take a standard deviation of an empty set, right? So if there's nothing that's greater than this number, then these will all be false, which means the sum will be zero. Okay, and in that case, let's not go any further with this step because there's nothing to take the standard deviation of, and it's obviously not a useful split. Okay, so assuming we've got this far, we can now calculate the standard deviation of the left hand side. And of the right hand side, and take the weighted average, or the sum, it's the same thing, um, to, a, to a scalar, right? And so there's our score. And so we can then check is this better than our best score so far? And our best score so far, we initially initialized it to infinity, right? So initially this is, this is better. So if it's better, let's store away all of the information we need. Which variable? has found this better split, what was the score we found, and what was the value that we split on.
Okay, so there it is. So if we run that, uh, and I'm using time it, so what time it does is it sees how long this command takes to run, and it tries to give you a kind of statistically valid measure of that. So you can see here it's run, run it 10 times to get an average, and then it's done that seven times to get a mean and standard deviation across runs, and so it's taking me 75 milliseconds plus or minus 10. Okay. So let's check that this works. Um, find bladder split tree 0, so 0 is year made, 1 is machine hours current meter. So with 1 we got back machine hours current meter 3744 with this score, and then we ran it again with 0, that's year made, and we got a better score, 658, and split 1974. And so 1974, let's compare. Yep, that was what this tree did as well. Okay, so we've got we've confirmed that this method is doing is giving the same result that SK Learns Random Forest did. Okay, and you can also see here the value uh, 10.08, and again matching here the value 10.08. Okay, so we've got something that can find one split. Uh, could you pass that to your net, please? So Jeremy, why don't we put a unique on the X there? Um, uh, um, because I'm not trying to optimize the performance yet. But but you see that no, like he's doing more. Yeah. So it's like in, you can see in the Excel, I like checked this one twice. I checked this four twice unnecessarily. Yeah. Okay. So um, and so Yannette's already thinking about performance, which is good. Um, so tell me, what is the computational complexity of this section of the code? And, and like, have a think about it, but also like, feel free to talk us through it if you want to kind of think and talk at the same time. So what's the computational complexity of this piece of code? Can I pass it over there? Yes. All right, Jade, take us through your thought process. Um, I think you have to take um, each different values through the column to calculate it um, once to see the splits. Mm -hmm. So and then compare um, all the com like all the possible combinations between these different values. So that can be expensive, like because you're. Uh huh. Can you? Or does somebody else want to tell us the actual computational complexity? So like yeah, quite high. Jade's thinking, how high? Uh, I think it's n squared. Okay, so tell me why is it n squared? Because uh, for the for loop, it uh, is n. Yes. And I think I guess the standard deviation will take n, so it's n squared. Okay. Or um, this one maybe is even easier to know. Like this is like which ones are less than xi. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to check every value to see if it's less than xi. Okay. And so, so it's useful to know like. How do I quickly calculate computational complexity? I can guarantee most of the interviews you do are going to ask you to calculate computational complexity on the fly. And it's also like when you're coding, you want it to be second nature. So the technique is basically, is there a loop? Okay, we're, then we're obviously doing this n times. Okay, so there's an n involved. Is there a loop inside the loop? If there is, then you need to multiply those two together. In this case, there's not. Is there anything inside the loop that's not a constant time thing. So you might see a sort in there, and you just need to know that sort is n log n, like that should be second nature. If you see a matrix multiply, you need to know what that is. In this case, there are some things that are doing element-wise array operations, right? So keep an eye out for anything where NumPy is doing something to every value of an array. In this case, it's checking every value of x against a constant. So it's going to have to do that n times. So to flash this out into a computational complexity, you just take the number of things in the loop and you multiply it by the highest computational complexity inside the loop, n times n is n squared. Can you pass that? Um, in this case, couldn't we just pre-sort the list and then do like one n log n computation? Uh, there's lots of things we can do to speed this up. So at this stage, it's just like, what is the computational complexity we have? Um, and, but absolutely, it's certainly not as good as it can be. Okay, so and that's where we're going to go next. It's like, all right, n squared is not uh, is not great, so let's try and make it better. Um, 
So here's my attempt at making it better. Um, and the idea is this. Um, okay, who wants to first of all tell me um, what's the equation for a standard deviation? Masha, can you grab the box? Uh, so for the standard deviation, it's um, uh, the difference between the value and its mean. Um, it's uh, we take a square root of that. Uh, uh, sorry, we take the uh, um, uh, the power of two. Yep. Uh, then we sum up all of these observations, and we take the square root out of all this sum. Uh, yeah, you have to divide divide by n. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. yep, yep, yeah, great. Good. Okay. Now, um, in practice, we don't normally use that formulation because it kind of requires us calculating, you know, x minus the mean lots of times. Um, does anybody know the formulation that just requires x and x squared? Anybody happen to know that one? Yes, at the back. Do you want to pass that back there? Square root of a mean of squares minus uh, square of mean. Yeah, great. Mean of squares minus the square of the means. All right. So that's a really good one uh, uh, divided by n. Um, that's a really good one to know because, like, you can now calculate variances. Or standard deviations of anything, you just have to first of all grab the column as it is, the column squared, right? And as long as you've got those stored away somewhere, you can immediately calculate the standard deviation. So the reason this is handy for us is that if we first of all sort our data, right? So let's go ahead and sort our data. Then if you think about it, as we kind of start going down one step at a time, Right, then each group is exactly the same as the previous group on the left-hand side with one more thing in it, and on the right-hand side with one less thing in it. And so given that we just have to keep track of sum of x and sum of x squared, we can just add one more thing to x, one more thing to x squared on the left, and remove one thing on the right. Okay? So we don't have to go through the whole lot each time, and so <clears throat> we can turn this into a order n algorithm. So that's all I do here is I sort the data, right? And I'm going to keep track of the count of things on the right, the sum of things on the right, and the sum of squares on the right. And initially, everything's in the right-hand side. Okay? So initially n is the count, y sum is the sum on the right, and y squared sum is the sum of squares on the right. And then nothing is initially on the left, so it's zeros. Okay, and then we just have to loop through uh, each observation, right, and add one to the left-hand count, subtract one from the left right-hand count. Add the value to the left-hand count, subtract it from the right-hand count. Add the value squared to the left-hand, subtract it from the right-hand. Okay. Now we do need to be careful though, because if we're saying less than or equal to one, say we're not stopping here. We're stopping here, like we have to have everything in that group. So the other thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that the next value is not the same as this value. If it is, I'm going to skip over it, right? So I'm just going to double check that this value and the next one aren't the same. Okay. So as long as um, they're not the same, I can keep going ahead and calculate my standard deviation now, passing in the count, the sum, and the sum squared, right? And there's that formula. Okay, the sum of squared divided by the square of the sum. Sorry, minus the square of the sum. Uh, do that for the right hand side, and so now we can calculate the weighted average score, just like before, and all of these lines are now the same. Okay, so we've turned our order n squared algorithm into an order n algorithm, and in general, stuff like this is going to get you a lot more value than like pushing something onto a Spark cluster, or ordering faster RAM, or using more cores in your CPU, or whatever, right? Um, uh, this is the way you want to be, you know, uh, improving your code. And specifically, write your code, right, without thinking too much about performance. Run it. Is it fast enough for what you need? Then you're done. If not, profile it, right? So in um, uh, Jupyter, instead of saying percent time it, you say percent p run, and it will tell you 
exactly where the time was spent in your algorithm. And then you can go to the bit that's actually taking the time and think about like, okay, is this is this algorithmically as, as efficient as it can be? Okay, so in this case we run it and we've gone down from 76 milliseconds to less than 2 milliseconds. And now some people that are new to programming think like, oh great, I've saved 60-something milliseconds. But the point is, this is going to get run like tens of millions of times. Okay, so the 76 millisecond version is so slow that it's going to be Im impractical for any random forest you use in, in practice, right? Whereas the 1 millisecond version I found is actually quite quite acceptable. And then check, the numbers should be exactly the same as before. And they are. Okay. So now that we have a function, find better split, that does what we want, I want to insert it into my decision tree class. And this is a really cool Python trick. Python does everything dynamically, right? So we can actually say the method called find better split in decision tree is that function I just created. And that like sticks it inside that class. Right? Now, um, I'll tell you what's slightly confusing about this is that this thing, this word here, and this word here, they actually have no relationship to each other. They just happen to have the same letters in the same order, right? So like I could call this find better split underscore foo, right? And then I could like call that, right? And call that. Right, so now my function is actually called find better split underscore foo, but my method I'm expecting to call something called decision tree dot find better split. Right, so here I could say decision tree dot find better split equals find better split underscore foo. Okay, you see that's the same thing. Right? So like it's important to understand how namespaces work. Like in, in every language that you use, one of the most important things is kind of understanding how how it figures out what a name refers to. So this here means find better split as defined inside this class, right? And no nowhere else, right? Well, I mean a sub a, a parent class, but never mind about that. This one here means find better split foo in the global namespace. A lot of languages don't have a global namespace, but Python does. Okay, and so the two are like even if they happen to have the same letters in the same order, they're not referring in any way to the same thing. Does that make sense? It's like this family over here may have somebody called Jeremy, and my family has somebody called Jeremy, and our names happen to be the same, but we're not the same person. Okay. Great. So now that we've stuck the decision tree, sorry, the find better split method inside the decision tree with this new definition, when I now call the tree ensemble constructor, right, the tree ensemble constructor called create tree, create tree instantiated decision tree, decision tree called find var split, which went through every column to see if it could find a better split, and we've now defined find better split, and therefore tree ensemble when we create it has gone ahead and done a split. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions or uncertainties about that? Like we're only creating one single split so far. All right, so this is pretty pretty neat, right? We kind of just do a little bit at a time, testing everything as we go, um, and so as, 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 as you all implement the random forest interpretation techniques, you may want to try programming this way to like every step check that you know what you're doing matches up with what scikit learn does or with a test that you've built or whatever. So at this point we should try to go deeper. Very inception, right? So let's go now max depth is two. And so here is what scikit learn did. After breaking at year made 74, it then broke at machine hours meter 2956. 
So we had this thing called find var split, right? We just went through every column and tried to see if there was a better split there, right? But actually, we need to go a bit further than that. Not only do we have to go through every column and see if there's a better split in this node, but then we also have to see whether there's a better split in the left and the right sides that we just created, right? Or in other words, the left right side and the right hand side should become decision trees themselves, right? So there's no difference at all between what we do here to create this tree and what we do here to create this tree, other than this one contains 159 samples and this one contains a thousand. So this row of code is exactly the same as we had before, right? And then we check. Actually, we could do this a little bit easier. We could say if self dot is leaf, right? Would be the same thing. Okay, but I'll just leave it here for now. So is self dot score. So if the score is infinite, still. In fact, let's write it properly. Is leaf. So let's go back up and just remind ourselves. Is leaf is self dot score equals inf. Okay. So since it's there, we might as well use it. So if it's a leaf node, then we have nothing further to do, right? So that means we're right at the bottom. There's no split that's been made. Okay, so we don't have to do anything further. On the other hand, if it's not a leaf node, so it's somewhere back earlier on, then we need to split it into the left hand side and the right hand side. Now earlier on, we created a left hand side and a right hand side array of booleans, right? Now. Um, better would be to have here would be have an array of indexes, and that's because we don't want to have a full array of all the booleans in every single node, right? Because remember, although it doesn't look like there are many nodes when you see a tree of this size, when it's fully expanded, the bottom level, if there's a minimum leaf size of one, contains the same number of nodes as the entire data set. And so if every one of those contained a full boolean array of size of the whole data set, you've got squared memory requirements, which would be bad. Right? On the other hand, if we just store the indexes of the things in this node, then that's going to get smaller and smaller. Okay? So np.non0 is exactly the same as just this thing which gets the boolean array, but it turns it into the indexes of the trues. Okay? So this is now a list of indexes for the left-hand side and indexes for the right-hand side. Right? So now that we have the indexes to the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we can now just go ahead and create a decision tree. Okay? So there's a decision tree for the left, and there's our decision tree for the right. Okay? And we don't have to do anything else, we've already written these. We already have a, function, a, a constructor that can create a decision tree. So like, when you really think about what this is doing, it kind of hurts your head, right? Because the reason, the whole reason that find var split got called, is because find var split is called by the decision tree constructor. But then the decision tree, the, but then find var split itself then calls the decision tree constructor. So we actually have circular recursion, and I'm not nearly smart enough to be able to think through recursion. So I just choose not to, right? Like I just write what I mean, and then I don't think about it anymore, right? Like what do I want? Well, to find a variable split, I'm going to go through every column, see if there's something better. If it managed to do a split, figure out the left hand side and the right hand side, and make them into decision trees. Okay. But now trying to think through how these two methods call each other would just drive me crazy, but I don't need to, right? I know I have a decision tree constructor that works, right? I know I have a fine vast bit that works, so that's it, right? That's how I do recursive programming, is by f pretending I don't. Right? Just, just ignore it. That's my advice. Right? A lot of you are probably smart enough to be able to think through it better than I can, so that's fine if you can. Right. So now that I've written that again, I can patch it into the decision tree class. <coughs> and as soon as I do, the tree ensemble constructor will now use that, right? Because Python's dynamic, right? That's just happens automatically. So now I can check 
um, my left hand side should have 159 samples right and a value of 9.66 there it is 159 samples 9.66 the right hand side 841 10.15 the left hand side of the left hand side 150 samples 9.62 150 samples 9.62 okay so you can see it like I'm because I'm not nearly clever enough to write machine learning algorithms like not only can I not write them correctly the first time often like every single line I write will be wrong right so I always start from the assumption that the the line of code I just typed is almost certainly wrong and I just have to see why and how Right, and so like I just make sure, and so eventually I get to the point where like much to my surprise, it's not broken anymore. You know, so here I can feel like okay, this it would be surprising if all of these things accidentally happen to be exactly the same as Scikit-Learn. So this is looking pretty good. Okay. So now that we have something that can build a whole tree, we want to have something that can calculate predictions. Right? And so to remind you, we already have something that calculates predictions for a tree ensemble by calling tree.predict, but there is nothing called tree.predict, so we're going to have to write that. Okay? Um, to make this more interesting, let's start bringing up the number of columns that we use. Um, let's create our tree ensemble again, and this time let's go to a maximum depth of 3. Okay, so now our tree is getting more interesting. Um, and let's now define how do we create a set of predictions for a tree. And so a set of predictions for a tree is simply the prediction for a row for every row. That's it. Right? That's our predictions. So the predictions for a tree are every row's predictions in an array. Okay. So again, we're like skipping thinking. Thinking's hard, you know. So let's just like keep pushing it back. Um, this is kind of handy, right? Notice that you can do four la in array with a numpy array, regardless of the rank of the array, regardless of the number of axes. In the array, and what it does is it will loop through the leading axis, right? And these these concepts are going to be very very important as we get into more and more neural networks because we're going to be all doing tensor computations all the time. So the leading axis of a vector is the vector itself. The leading axis of a matrix are the rows. The leading axis axis of a three dimensional tensor are the matrices that represent the slices. And so forth, right? So in this case, because X is a matrix, this is going to loop through the rows. And if you write your kind of tensor code this way, then it'll kind of uh, tend to generalize nicely to higher dimensions. Like it doesn't really matter how many dimensions are in X. This is going to loop through each of the leading axes, right? Um, okay, so we can now call that decision tree dot predict. Right. So all I need to do is write predict row, right? And I've delayed thinking so much, which is great, that the actual point where I actually have to do the work, it's now basically trivial. So if we're at a leaf node, then the prediction is just equal to whatever that value was, which we calculated right back in the original tree constructor. It's just, it's just the average of the y's, right? If it's not a leaf node, then we have to figure out whether to go down the left-hand path or the right-hand path to get the prediction. Right? So if this variable in this row is less than or equal to the thing we decided, the amount we decided to split on, then we go down the left path. Otherwise, we go down the right path. Okay? And then having figured out what path we want, which tree we want, then we can just call predict row on that. Right? And again, we've accidentally created something recursive. And again, I don't want to think about how that works control flow wise or whatever, but I don't need to because like I, I just 
it just does like I just told it what I wanted so I trust it to work right if it's a leaf return the value Otherwise return the prediction for the left hand side or the right hand side as appropriate okay. um, Notice this here this if has nothing to do with this if All right, this if is a control flow statement That tells Python to go down that path or that path to do some calculation this if is an operator that returns a value So those of you that have done C or C++ will recognize it as being identical to that. It's called the ternary operator right? uh, If you haven't that's fine. Basically what we're doing is we're going to get a value where we're going to say it's this value if this thing is true and that value otherwise and so you could write it this way, right? but that would require writing four lines of code to do one thing. It would also require you to have code that if you read it to yourself or to somebody else is not at all naturally the way you would express it. Right? I want to say, the tree I'm going to go down is the left-hand side if the variable is less than the split, or the right-hand side otherwise. Right? So I want to write my code the way I would think about or the way I would say my code. Okay, so this kind of uh, ternary operator can be quite helpful for that. All right. So now that I've got a prediction for row, I can dump that into my class, and now I can create calculate predictions. Uh, and I can now plot my actuals against my predictions. When you do a scatter plot. Um, you'll often have a lot of dots sitting on top of each other So a good trick is to use alpha alpha means how transparent the things not just in matplotlib But like in every graphics package in the world pretty much and so if you set alpha to less than one Then this is saying you would need 20 dots on top of each other for it to be fully blue and so this is a good way to kind of see How much things are sitting on top of each other? So it's a good trick good trick for scatter plots. Uh, there's my R squared, not bad. Um, and so let's now go ahead and do a random forest um, with no max amount of splitting uh, and our um, tree ensemble had no max amount of splitting. We can compare our R squared to their R squared. And so they're not the same, but actually ours is a little better. So I don't know what we did differently, but we'll take it. Okay, so we have now something which for a forest with a single tree in is giving as good uh, accuracy um, on a validation set using an actual real-world data set, you know, bull books for blue doses um, compared to scikit-learn. So let's go ahead and round this out. So what I would want to do now is to create a package that has this code in and I created it by like creating a method here a method here a method here and patching them together So what I did with now is I went back through my notebook and collected up all the cells that implemented methods and pasted them all together Right and I've just pasted them down here. So here's this is my original tree ensemble and Here is all the cells in the decision tree. I just dumped them all into one place without any change um, so that was it. That was the code we wrote together. Uh, so now I can go ahead and I can create a tree ensemble. I can calculate my predictions. I can do my scatter plot. I can get my R squared, right? And this is now with uh, five trees, right? Uh, and here we are. We have a model of Blue Duck for Bulldozers with a 71% R squared. Uh, with a random forest we wrote entirely from scratch. So that's pretty cool. Uh, any questions about that? And I know there's like quite a lot to get through, so like during the week feel free to ask on the forum about any bits of code you come across. Can somebody pass the box to Masha? Oh, there it is. Uh, can we get back to the um, probably to the top or maybe um, 
at the decision tree when we set the score equal to infinity, right? Yes. Uh, do we calculate this co uh, this score further? I mean, like I lost track of that, and specifically, I wonder um, when we implement when we implement uh, find var split. Hmm. We check for self score equal to uh, whether it's equal to infinity or not. It seems to me it seems like unclear whether we uh, fall out of this. Um, I mean, like if we ever implement uh, the method, if uh, if our initial value is infinity. Uh, so okay, let's talk through the logic. So, um, so the decision tree starts out with a score of infinity. So in other words, at this point when we've created the node, there is no split, so it's infinitely bad. Okay? So that's why the score is infinity. And then we try to find a variable and a split that is better. And to do that, we loop through each column and say, hey, column, do you have a split which is better than the best one we have so far. And so then we implement that. Let's do the slow way, since it's a bit simpler. Find better split. We do that by looping through each row and finding out this is the current score if we split here. Is it better than the current score? The current score is infinitely bad, so yes it is. And so now we set the new score equal to what we just calculated, and we keep track of which variable we chose and the split we split on. Okay. No worries. Okay, great. Let's take a five-minute break, and I'll see you back here at 22. So when I tried comparing the performance of this um, against scikit-learn, um, this is quite a lot slower. Um, and the reason why is that although like a lot of the work's been done by NumPy, which is nicely optimized C code, think about like the very bottom level of a tree. If we've got a million data points, then the bottom level of the tree has something like 500,000 decision points with a million leaves underneath, right? And so that's like 500,000 split methods being called, each one of contain which contains multiple calls to NumPy, which only have like one item that's actually being calculated on. And so it's like that's like very inefficient. And it's the kind of thing that Python is particularly not good at performance-wise, right? Like calling lots of functions lots of times. I mean, we can see it's it's not bad, right? You know, for a kind of a random forest which 15 years ago would have been considered pretty big, this would be considered pretty good performance, right? But nowadays this is some hundreds of times at least slower than, than it should be. So um, what the scikit-learn folks did to uh, avoid this problem was that they wrote um, their implementation in something called Cython. And Cython is a superset of Python. So any Python you've written, pretty much, you can use as Cython. Right? But then what happens is Cython runs it in a very different way. Rather than passing it to the kind of the, the Python interpreter, it instead converts it to C, compiles that, and then runs that C code, right? Which means the first time you run it, it takes a little longer because it has to go through the uh, the kind of translation and compilation. But then after that, it can be quite a bit faster. And so I wanted just to quickly show you what that looks like because. Um, you are absolutely going to be in a position where Cython is going to help you with your work, and most of the people you're working with will have never used it, may not even know it exists, and so this is like a great superpower to have. So to use Cython in a notebook, you say load ext, load extension, Cython. Right? And so here's a Python function, pip1. 
here is the same as a siphon function. It's exactly the same thing with percent percent siphon at the top. This actually runs about twice as fast as this, right? Just because it does the compilation. Here is the same version again, where I've used a special Cython extension called cdef, which defines the C data type of the return value and of each variable. Right? And so basically that's the trick that you can use to start making things run quickly. Right? And at that point, now it knows it's not just some Python object called T. In fact, I probably should put one here as well. Let's try that. So we've got fib2, we'll call that fib3. So um, for fib3, um, yeah, so it's exactly the same as before, but we say what the data type of the thing we passed to it was is, and then define the data types of each of the variables. And so then if we call that, Okay, we've now got something that's ten times faster, right? So um, yeah, it doesn't really take that much extra, and it's just it's just Python with a few little bits of markup. Um, so that's like it's it's good to know that that exists because um, if there's something custom you're trying to do, uh, it's actually I find it kind of painful having to go out and you know go into C and compile it and link it back and all that. Whereas doing it here is pretty easy. Can you pass that just to your right, please, Masha? So when you're doing like for the Cython version of it, so in the case of an array, or an MP array, uh, does is there like a specific C type of? Yeah. So there's uh, like there's a lot that. of um, specific stuff for integrating Cython with NumPy, um, and there's a whole page about it. Uh, yeah. So we won't worry about going over it, but you can read that, and you can basically see. The basic ideas. There's this C import, which basically imports a certain types of Python library into the kind of the C bit of the code, uh, and you can then use it uh, in your Cython. So, yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. Oh, cool. good question. Thank you. Um, all right. So your your mission now. Is to implement confidence based on tree variance, feature importance, partial dependence, and tree interpreter for that random forest. Removing redundant features doesn't use a random forest at all, so you don't have to worry about that. Extrapolation is not an interpretation technique, so you don't have to worry about that. So it's just the other ones. So confidence based on tree variance. We've already written that code, so I suspect that the exact same code we have in the notebook should continue to work. So you can try and make sure it get that working. Feature importance is with the variable shuffling technique, and once you have that working, partial dependence will just be a couple of lines of code away because rather than you know rather than shuffling a column, you're just replacing it with a constant value. Right? But it's nearly the same code. And then tree interpreter. Uh, it's going to require you writing some code and thinking about that. But once you've written tree interpreter, you're very close, if you want to, to creating the second approach to um, uh, feature importance, the one where you add up the importance across uh, all of the rows, which means you would then be very close to doing interaction importance. Um, so it turns out that, that there are actually there's actually a very good library for interaction importance for XGBoost. Um, but uh, there doesn't seem to be one for random forest. So you could like start by getting it working on our version, and if you want to do interaction importance, and then you could like get it working on the original uh, SK Learn version, and that would be a cool contribution. Right? Like sometimes writing it against your own implementation is kind of nicer because you can see exactly what's going on. All right. So that's uh, that's your job. Uh, you don't have to rewrite the random forest. Feel free to if you want to, you know, practice. Um, so if you uh, get stuck at any point, you know, ask on the forum, right? Um, there is 
a whole page here on wiki.fast.ai about how to ask for help. Um, so when you uh, ask your co-workers on Slack for help, when you ask people in a technical community on GitHub or Discourse for help or whatever, asking for help the right way will go a long way towards you know, having people want to help you and be able to help you, right? So, so like search for your answer, like search for the error you're getting, see if somebody's already asked about it. Um, um, you know, how have you tried to fix it already? What do you think's going wrong? What kind of computer are you on? How is it set up? What are the software versions? Exactly what did you type and exactly what happened, right? Now, you could uh, do that by uh, taking a screenshot. So, you know, make sure you've got some screenshot software that's really easy to use. So, if I were to take a screenshot, I just hit a button, select the area, copy to clipboard, go to my forum, paste it in, and there we go, right? Um, that looks a little bit too big, so let's make it a little smaller. Right, and so now I've got a screenshot, people can see exactly what happened. Um, better still, um, if there's a few lines of code and error messages to look at, um, create a, a gist. Um, a gist is a, a handy little um, GitHub thing which basically lets you share code. So if I wanted to uh, create a gist of this, um, I actually have a extension. Um, there we are, that little extension. So if I click on here, give it a name, say make public, right? and that takes my Jupyter Notebook, shares it publicly, I can then grab that URL, copy link location, right? and paste it into my forum post, right? and then when people click on it, then they'll immediately see my notebook when it renders. Okay, so that's a really good way. Now um, that particular button is an extension. So on Jupyter, you need to click NV extensions and click on gist it. Right. While you're there, you should also click on collapsible headings. That's this really handy thing I use that lets me collapse things and open them up. Um, if you go to your Jupyter and don't see this NV Extensions button, then just Google for Jupyter NV Extensions. It'll show you how to pip install it and um, and get it set up. Right? Uh, but those two extensions are super duper handy. All right. So um, other than that assignment, um, we're we're done with random forests. And until the next course, when you look at GBMs, we're done with decision tree ensembles. Um, um, and so we're going to move on to neural networks broadly defined. And so neural networks are going to allow us to to go beyond just you know the kind of nearest neighbors approach of random forests. You know, all a random forest can do is to average data that it's already seen. Um, it can't extrapolate. It can't it can't calculate. Right. Um, linear regression can calculate and can extrapolate, but only in very limited ways. Neural nets give us the best of both worlds. Um, we're going to start by applying them to unstructured data. Right? So unstructured data means like pixels or the amplitudes of sound waves or words, you know, uh, data where everything in all the columns are all of the same type, you know, as opposed to like a database table where you've got like a revenue and a cost and a zip code and a state. It should be structured data. Okay. Um, we're going to use it for structured data as well, but we're going to do that a little bit later. So unstructured data is a little easier, and it's also the area which more people have been applying deep learning to for longer. Um, The if you're doing the deep learning course as well, you know you'll see that we're going to be approaching kind of the same conclusion from two different directions. So the deep learning course is starting out with um, 
big complicated convolutional neural networks being solved with you know sophisticated optimization schemes and we're going to kind of gradually drill down into like exactly how they work um, where else with the machine learning course we're going to be starting out more with like how does stochastic gradient descent actually work what do we do what can we do with like one single layer which would allow us to create things like logistic regression when we add um, regularization to that how does that give us things like uh, ridge regression, elastic net, lasso, and then as we add additional layers to that, how does that let us so, uh, handle more complex problems? And so we're not going to, um, we're only going to be looking at fully connected layers in this machine learning course. Um, and then I think next semester with your net, you're probably going to be looking at some more sophisticated approaches. And so yeah, so in this machine learning we're going to be looking much more at like what's actually happening with the matrices and how are they actually calculated and the deep learning it's much more like what are the best practices for actually solving you know at a world class level real world deep learning problems. Right? So next week we're going to um, be looking at like the classic um, MNIST problem which is like how do we recognize digits. Now, if you're interested, you can like skip ahead and like try and do this with a random forest, and you'll find it's not bad. Like, if, given that a random forest is basically a type of nearest neighbors, right, it's finding like what are the nearest neighbors in, in tree space, then a random forest could absolutely recognize that this nine, those pixels, you know, are similar to pixels we've seen in these other ones, and on average they were nines as well. Right? And so like we can absolutely solve these kinds of problems to an extent um, using random forests. Uh, but we end up being rather data limited because every time we put in another decision point, you know we're, we're halving our data roughly. And so there's this, just this limitation in the amount of calculation that we can do. Um, where else with neural nets, um, we're going to be able to use lots and lots and lots of parameters. Um, using these uh, tricks we're going to learn about with regularization. Um, so we're going to be able to do lots of computation, and there's going to be very little limitation on really what we can actually end up calculating as a result. Great. Good luck with your random forest interpretation, and I will see you next time.